Chapter Six, Part Two of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter Six, Part Two, The City of the Equator. Whatever his origin, the Indian of the Andes is a distinct reality, distinct indeed to all the five senses, and he varies little throughout the length of the continent. In build he is stocky and short, very muscular, with the strength of a mule for carrying loads on his back, indefatigable on foot, but weak for other labor. His color is between a tarnished copper and a more or less intense bronze. His head is large, his neck is thick and long, his eyes small, black, and penetrating, yet at times strangely suggesting those of a dead fish. His nose is bulky and somewhat flattened and spread, his teeth are white, even, and always in splendid condition, his long hair worn, sometimes flying loose, sometimes in a single braid wound with red tape, is jet black, without luster, abundant, perfectly straight, strong and coarse as that of a horse's mane, without even a tendency to baldness. His lips are thick and heavy, the lower one somewhat hanging, giving him a suggestion of sulkiness. His forehead is low, his mouth large, and his prominent cheekbones and large ears give his face an appearance of great width. He is broad-shouldered, with a chest like a barrel, but slender of leg and small of foot. He grows no beard and has almost no hair on the body. Men and women alike, except a rare male, with a sole of home-tanned leather secured by thongs, are bare-legged at least halfway to the knees, their feet like calloused hoofs marked by stony trails and years of barnyard wallowing. The male wears a broad, round, light gray hat of thick felt, a kind of pajama shirt or blouse of fancy-colored calico or lienzo, a very roomy pair of panties of thinnest white cotton that reach anywhere from his knees to halfway to his undomesticated feet. Besides these garments, he is never seen without a zuana, or poncho, which serves him as a cloak and carry-all by day, and as a bed and covering by night. This is always of some startling crude color, deep red predominating, with such screaming combinations as magenta and purple, carmine and yellow, though when sufficiently soiled and sun-bleached, the old rose and velvety brown, the brick red or the turquoise blue, take on all the richness of oriental rugs. It is this commonly homespun garment and the corresponding one of the women that make Quito such a color-splashed city. The woman, too, copies the dress of her ancestors to remote generations, she wears the same hat as the male, hat pins are unknown to her, all down the Andes, a beltless waist of coarse cloth, either open or thin and ragged, several strips of colored baeta, a woolish shoddy wrapped tightly around her draft horse hips from waist to calves, in guise of skirt, always slid open on one side, showing an inner petticoat, once white, though sometimes in striking solid colors in marked contrast to the outer skirt, and a blanket, smaller, but as audible in hue as the poncho of the male, thrown round her shoulders like a shawl. She is fond of gaudy earrings of colored glass, or similar rubbish, ranging in size from large to colossal, from one to a dozen strings of cheap red beads, Often the bean of a wild plant indigenous to the region hang around her neck. Generally, brass rings adorn every finger, and often many beads are wound round and round her bare arms. She is completely devoid of feminine charm. She needs none, for she is amply worth her keep as a beast of burden. As far as I know, there is no law in Quito requiring an Indian woman not to be seen without a babe in arms, or rather in shawl, but if one exists it is seldom violated. In an hour I have seen by actual count more than three hundred female aborigines pass my window 
in the calle Flores, and not a score of them but bore on her back a child of from two weeks to two years of age, to say nothing of several other bundles and her whirling spindle. When the infant is tiny, it is carried lengthwise at the bottom of the blanket shawl knotted across the mother's chest. When it is older, it is tossed or climbs astride her broad back, lying face down with legs spread while she throws her outer garment about it, ties the knot on her chest or on her forehead if the child is heavy, and trots along at her work the day through without the least apparent notice of the offspring. The babe falls asleep or gazes with curious yet rather dull eyes at the world as it speeds by, peering over the mother's shoulder like an engineer from his cab, eats such food or refuse as falls into its hands or plays with the mother's tape-wound braid. The Indian woman never carries her offspring in any other manner unless, in her role as a common carrier, she picks up a load too bulky or heavy to place the infant atop, such as a bedstead, a bureau, or two full-sized sacks of wheat. These are not exaggerations, but frequent cargoes. When she hangs the child in front, in the concave of her figure, like a baby kangaroo, in the maternal pouch, knotting the supporting garment across her shoulders. The youngest baby is already inconceivably dirty, yet almost always robustly healthy in appearance, though the infant mortality of the class is appalling. It is an unusual experience to hear an Indian baby cry. From its earliest years, it seems to adopt that uncomplaining attitude toward life that is so marked a characteristic of the adults. Though she treats her offspring with no active unkindness in all the years I spent in South America, I have never seen an Indian mother strike a child. The aboriginal woman seems to endure it passively, like any other burden thrust upon her from which there is no escape, carrying it where it will be the least troublesome and never, at least openly, showing any caressing fondness for it. The child old enough to toddle about the streets often remains on the mother's back, as if to hold the place for the next comer. It is a common experience to hear an Indian child ask, in a perfectly fluent tongue, for a serving at the maternal source of supply. There is scant difference in appearance between the two sexes, and none whatever in their labor, except that if there is only one load, the woman carries it and the baby in addition. In both the half-breed and Indian classes, the women are more uncleanly than the men. Like the latter, they work at all the coarser, unskilled tasks, shoveling earth, mixing and carrying mortar, cobbling streets, while in the matters of loads there is nothing under two hundred pounds in weight which, once on their backs, they cannot jog along under a kind of limping gait that seems tireless. Almost any day the furniture and entire possessions of some moving household is displayed to the public gaze as it jogs through the town on the back of an Indian family. The chief water supply of Quito is a constant string of Indians from the fountain opposite the governmental palace with huge red earthen jars sitting on their hips and supported by a thong across the forehead. It is commonplace to meet an Indian carrying the gaudy image of some saint larger than herself. Cheap coffins of half-rotten boards, painted sky-blue or pink, and decorated with strips of gilded paper frequently minced past, secured by the brilliant poncho of the carrier, knotted across his chest. I had occasion one day to transport a typewriter a few blocks. The Indian prepared to sling it on his back with a rope. When I objected to this method, I found that the fellow not only could not carry it in his hands, but that he could not lift it to his head. When I placed it there, however, he ambled away as if he had nothing on his mind but his hat. Frequently an entire family takes a large job, such as carrying a building from one end of town to another, adobe brick by brick. Such a one passed my window for weeks. 
All day long they dog trotted back and forth in single file along the line of smooth, worn flagstones in the middle of the street, their bare feet making absolutely no sound, never a word or a sign of complaint finding outward expression. The man and the woman each bore the same number of mud bricks piled on their backs, and the latter always carried a baby in her pouch, though they made a hundred trips a day. Why the infant could not have been left at one end or the other of the journey, it was hard to guess. Two children, one a little fellow of five with one brick on his back, his brother of seven or eight with two, toiled all day long between father and mother, as if they were being systematically trained for the only life before them. The Andean Indian is even less like the tall and haughty redskin of our country in manner than in appearance. Compared with him, the Mexican Indian is self-assertive, bold, and ferocious. Silent and abstracted, he takes no apparent heed of what goes on about him. A phlegmatic temperament, a truly wooden equanimity of temper, melancholy, taciturn, and reserve, he is noted above all for a distrust that is perhaps natural, but is more likely the result of centuries of privations since the coming of the Spaniards. He has a blind submission to authority, great attachments to the house in which he lives, and is so cowardly that he lets himself be dominated by the most despicable members of other races. A complete outsider in government and public affairs, he is treated by the rest of the population like a domestic animal. The merchant of Quito who requires a carrier to deliver some bundle does not wait for one to offer himself. He steps into the street and snatches the first Indian who passes, though he be on his way to a dying parent or preparing his child's funeral, and the Indian performs the task as uncomplainingly as some mechanical device and returns to wait perhaps an hour or two for the few cents the merchant chooses to give him. Only when he is drunk does the aboriginal's manner change. Then he is garrulous and mildly disorderly. But even on a Saturday afternoon when the highways are lined with Indians of both sexes reeling homeward, the gringo passes unnoticed in marked contrast with the gauntlet of insolence, if not, indeed, of actual danger, which he must run under like circumstances in the highlands of Mexico. The newcomer's sympathy for the Indian of Quito gradually evaporates with the discovery that he is utterly devoid of ambition, as completely indifferent to his own betterment as any four-footed animal. Pat out this fact with all its details and ramifications, discarding entirely the American's ingrown tendency to imbue every human being with a striving character, and the hopelessness of the Indian's condition will be more clearly realized. The government of Ecuador gives scant attention to the education of the aboriginals, even if it is provided schools and forced attendance. There would still remain the problem of arousing in these people any interest in or effort for self-improvement. A simple episode will go far toward visualizing the temperament of the Indian of Quito, and perhaps make a bit clearer the ease with which Pizarro and his handful of tramps overthrew the empire of the Incas. I had gone out for a stroll one afternoon along the road to Guayabamba. Some three miles from town a light rain turned me back. There were no houses near, but numbers of Indians were going and coming. A short distance ahead was a group engaged in noisy contention. Suddenly a handsome, muscular young Indian broke away and ran toward me his long black hair streaming out behind him. At his heels, cursing, came three cholos, in the dark hats, more sober blankets and trousers of their caste, with shorn hair and straggling suggestions of mustaches. I was not armed. One does not trouble to carry weapons about Quito, and in my bespattered road garb I certainly had no appearance of protective authority. When he reached me, however, the frightened Indian instead of running on, turned as sharply as about a corner and pattered along, close at my heels, breathing quickly. 
I continued my stroll, while the drunken half-breeds, far more muscular than I, hovered about ten steps in the rear, crying, Ah, cord, you run to the senor for protection. Yet not a step nearer did they approach during the furlong or more that the procession lasted. Then, as we passed the entrance to a hacienda, the Indian suddenly sprinted away up its avenue of eucalyptus trees faster than the cholos could follow. When they overtook me again, one protested in plaintive tones, Ah, senor, ese sin vergüenza, the indio did not deserve your protection. Then they fell behind while I, who had been an entirely passive actor in the scene, strolled on into the city. It would be hard to imagine a similar incident in Mexico. This Indian's older daughter knocked at my door one day to say that, as it was Don Panchito's birthday, the celebration in the sala next to my own room would probably keep me awake all night anyway, and, had I not, better join the party. By eight, the beating of the piano had begun. When I appeared, Don Panchito took me on a tour of the guests, seated in solemn quadrangle around the four walls of the room the sexes segregated. The South American has a custom which might well be imported into our own land to the relief of frequent embarrassment. As he was introduced, each man rose, bowed profoundly, and announced his own name in clear-cut tones. Enrique Borjos de Perez y Silva, servidor de usted. The women remained seated, but made their names similarly known. A professional pianist, a patched and disheveled and hungry-looking young man of some Indian blood, had already begun a very nearly continuous performance at fast time with barely two-minute intervals between the half-hour dances. In a corner sat motionless all the evening two professional chaperones, for Don Panchito was a widow, sour-faced, sleeping old women of none too immaculate habits wrapped in black mantos, from which only nose and eyes protruded. There were no dance cards. Each pair started in, or stopped, when they saw fit, quite irrespective of the others. A man stepped across the room, held out his gloved right hand to a girl, without a word, and she rose to accept an invitation that apparently could not be refused, at least not one failed to accept it, though some of the more attractive were let out upon the floor at least fifty times in the course of the evening. Evidently it was bad form to carry on a conversation out of hearing of the chaperone. Neither dancer visibly spoke a word until the girl wished to stop, when she murmured, Gracias, and was at once returned in silence to her seat. As the evening wore on, several young fops dropped in, alleging conflicting engagements as an excuse for their tardiness, and joined the celebration without removing their lavender gloves, which, indeed, the chilliness of the room pardoned. One of the newcomers, in particular, stirred up the ladies to almost human expressions of interest. He was the son of the Minister of the Interior, just back from Paris, and lost no opportunity to display the wisdom he had gleaned in the capital of the world. A rather sharp-cornered French and an authoritative knowledge of new and more complicated manners of hopping about the Florida music. At frequent intervals are eight-year-old Indian slavey Mercedes, familiarly known as Meech, arrived with fiery drinks in which we toasted Don Panchito, even the young girls tossing it off without a tear. At midnight the festival raged at its height. At one o'clock we sat down to dinner in a temperature far from agreeable to those of us who did not dance. Then the celebration broke out anew, though the chaperones and pianist and even Don Panchito had disappeared. The young fops removed their gloves and took turns at the stool. The clock was striking four when I retired and little Meech was still serving liquid gladness as uncomplainingly and expressionlessly as ever. When I awoke at eight, she had just finished tidying up the sala and was beginning her regular daily labors. 
Gradually we made the acquaintance of various celebrities. There was Chispa, for instance, the little Spanish bullfighter who gave a benefit and last final performance in the Plaza de Toros each Sunday. The royal sport of Spain is, at best, a gloomy pastime in Spanish America. Even when skilled toreadors from across the Atlantic are to be had, the bulls raised in the Andean highlands are so manso that the game degenerates into little more than public butchery. The killing of horses is forbidden in the bullring of Quito, both by law and because of the high price of those rare animals, and the toreador is not permitted to stir up a sluggish bull by exploding bandieros de fuego on his flanks. Chispa, however, who was just such a spark as his apodo suggested, would have enlivened the most dreary entertainment, though his companions were local amateurs, so clumsy that he was called upon to save the life of each a dozen times during each corrida. Each succeeding despedida had some new feature to draw recreation-hungry Quito within the circular mud walls. One Sunday the program announced the engagement of hombres de hierba and hombres gordos, men of hay and fat men, and the inventive Spaniard was all but forced to lock the gates against the tail end of the throng. One of his amateurs was bound round and round with green alfalfa and set in the center of the ring. The bull, however, either was not hungry or in no mood for jests, and tossed the helpless fellow scornfully from his path. The hombres gordos were made up with clown faces topped by silk hats, their bodies padded to enormous size with excelsior. Still, the protection was not sufficient. One was thrown so savagely that the audience agreed he had been killed until the evening paper announced he had merely broken a leg and several ribs. The fat man is no more beloved in Quito than elsewhere, and the merriment went on unabated. It is Quiteño custom for the matador to brindar, dedicate the death of each bull, to some celebrity or person of means in the audience, tossing the favored one his cap to hold during the killing and expecting it to be thrown at with a roll of bills in proportion to the skill of the coup de grace. Toward the end of the last final performances, the supply of local personages grew so low that the eye of Chispa roving around the circle fell upon Hayes. But even as he opened his mouth for the speech of dedication, the ex-corporal faded from public view. Then there was Umberto Peronel, our first really and truly flesh and blood andarin. Derived from the Spanish word andar, to walk, the term is used in the Andes to designate a foreigner who travels on foot without any particular excuse for traveling at all, a peculiarly Latin type of tramp, loving to attract attention and making his living by so doing. We ourselves had often been styled andarins on the journey from Bogota, though this genuine article scornfully rated us as excursionistas. The distinction seems to be not whether a man andars on foot, but whether he makes his way without using his own money, if such he possesses. We saw Umberto first at a Sunday night concert, where he was inconspicuously amusing himself by running races with several hundred newsboys and bootblacks around the Plaza Mayor. A stocky fellow, tall as Hayes, of middle age, he was modestly dressed in a suit of sky-blue corduroy, leather leggings, and a velvet cap of the Dutch fisherman or quarter Latin style. Across his chest hung a row of large medals, a flaring wax-ended mustache, all but touched his ears, and his luxurious black hair hung loose almost to his waist. When he called on us next morning, his coiffure was done up in a simple maidenly knot at the back of his head. On closer examination, the gleaming brass medals seemed to be glorified tobacco tags. He announced himself the son of Italian parents born in the Argentine, of a sect corresponding to the Huguenots of France, known as the 
martyrs of Piedmont. Leaving home three years before, he had walked across his native land to Chile, thence to Quito, where he was preparing to push on to Bogota. To the people along the way, and even to us, until he caught the gleam in our eyes, he announced that two great dailies of Buenos Aires and New York had offered him a prize of a hundred thousand dollars to make the journey on foot from the door of one to that of the other. On the road he was accompanied by a dog, wore silver-plated spurs as a sign of his rank as caballero, and carried, in addition, a revolver and rifle, some forty pounds of baggage, most of which consisted of bulky ledgers filled with handwritten statements of his arrival and departure on foot, signed by every corregidor, alcalde, or native official of whatever species, by merchants, lawyers, and editors of every place, large or small, he had visited, each adorned with its official seal. This collecting of signatures was no mere whim. It was the customary excuse of his fellows for surreptitiously appealing to charity. At every hamlet he opened the ledgers, ostensibly to give the residents the pleasure of adding their names to the roll of honor and at the psychological moment slipped into their hands a printed card bearing a subtle plea for assistance in winning his great prize. All genuine andarines, Umberto assured us, did the same, and he berated us soundly for not having adopted the custom. How can you prove to the public that you have made the journey on foot if you do not have the testimonials of distinguished persons along the way? he cried scornfully. The public has its choice of believing it or jumping off the end of the dock, Hayes answered for both of us. In plain English, Perinel was a beggar, though he would have been shocked beyond words to hear us say so. He called himself a champion of God, a bitter enemy of the priesthood, and in each town of importance gave a lecture on his journey, and later on, if the population showed enough intelligence, a sermon. The religious fanatic so often proves sooner or later to be in a sexually neurotic state that we were not surprised when, several days later, Peronel burst out apropos of nothing. Why do girls always become enamored of strange travelers? No sooner do I enter a town than several maidens fall desperately in love with me. I can't be expected to satisfy them all, can I? One has one's work to do. Wooden-headed ass that I am, growled Hayes, if I'd only thought to grow curls. Between you and me, as men of the same profession, went on the collector of signatures, I don't mind telling you that I ride now and then by train to a bad piece of country. What's the use of walking hundreds of hot desert miles? when people will never know the difference. For instance, here, under the seal of blank, it says that I walked all the four hundred miles from blank. Well, I did. On a steamer most of the way. In short, the Argentino's mental equipment was somewhat out of repair. One could not exactly put one's finger on the loose screw, but it could frequently be heard rattling. The following Sunday we attended his first lecture on the dismal daytime stage of Quito's hitherto lifeless Teatro Sucre sat Peronel, utterly alone but for the faithful dog at his feet, thrown into silhouette by an uncurtained window at the back, his sky-blue uniform looking more absurd than ever, his hair hanging in long, wet, careful curls about his broad shoulders. Quito has so few entertainments that it will endure almost anything, particularly if no admission is charged, and some three hundred men were scattered about in the painfully upright seats when the Andarin rose. He first read some incomprehensible rodomontande on the power of the will, then drew forth a manuscript purporting to give an account of his journey in reality strictly confined to a list of the towns he had visited, with the height of each above sea level. The lecture was doubly unsuccessful, for when the speaker ended with an appeal for funds to continue 
his statistical journey, the gathering stampeded so effectively that all but a few had escaped when he reached the door, and the reward of his labors was a bare six dollars. Next Sunday, he announced, when we met him in the plaza that evening, I am going to give the public of Quito the benefit of my conclusions on suicide. Suicide, I shall prove, is always a prompting of the devil. Therefore, it cannot be the prompting of God. Ergo, a man should not commit suicide because he should never lead to the promptings of the devil. Truly, a Solomon of pure reason had come to Quito. Yet, somehow, the authorities, always backward in such manners, failed to take advantage of this splendid opportunity to give the Teatro Sucre another free airing. Never since those days in Quito have I heard the oft-repeated word Andarin, than the picture of Peronel and his curls has not come to mind. However, he had undoubtedly covered long distances on foot, and we exchanged many a practical hint of roadway information. He planned to visit all the important cities of the United States, and to reach New York within three years. His letters of introduction already included many to American officials. He carried, for instance, one to the mayor of Seattle. Being an experienced traveler, all may have gone well with him south of the Rio Grande, but beyond it lay dangers he did not suspect. For some unromantic justice of the peace, unable to distinguish between an andarin and a common vague, between the honorable profession of gathering seals and signatures and merely begging, may have the cruelty to reward him with a notorious year and a day. On October 10th there was an eclipse of the sun, total at the Ecuador-Colombia boundary and visible in all the southern hemisphere. In the days of the Sari and Incas, such a phenomenon was taken as a threat that the end of the world was at hand, a sign that an angry god was abandoning its erring people. On this occasion, many of the less educated classes remained in the streets all night, for an earthquake had been prophesied. The local observatory had assigned a scientist to note the peculiar actions of the populace and the lower animals during the eclipse. It came toward seven in the morning. Gradually the brilliant sun disappeared until only the slightest thread of crescent shape remained visible. The world grew dark as at early dusk on a heavy clouded evening, then slowly lighted up again in all its equatorial magnificence. Observers reported that a few fowls returned to roost. The curs slinking about the plaza seemed for a time undecided whether to seek their nightly lairs, but the actions of the populace were confined to the incessant smoking of cigarettes and making the most of an excuse to put off their day's task as long as possible, neither of which was unusual enough to be worthy of note. The majority, unsupplied with smoked glasses, found this no handicap, for the reflected eclipse in the plaza pool served the same purpose. World scientists had been sent to many of the larger South American cities with elaborate photographic equipment, only to find their long journeys wasted because of clouds. They would have done better to come to Quito, where two unscientific vagabonds caught excellent pictures of the phenomenon in mere Kodak snapshots. It was on the morning of November 18th, five months from the day we had sailed together from the canal zone, that Hayes and I set out along the muddy cobbled highway to the railway station, carrying in turn a bundle of the size of a suitcase. By 7.30, the former corporal of police had taken his wooden seat in the dingy little second-class car and had stowed his belongings under it, well out of sight of the collector. For extravagant as are its fees, the Guayaquil quito Railway allows a second-class passenger only 15 pounds of baggage. At 8, the tri-weekly train let pass unnoticed its scheduled hour of departure. Several stocky Americans of the type easily recognized as railroad men 
and as many English-speaking Negroes, could be seen shouldering their way in and out of the motley throng. The engineers were leathery-skinned Americans, the conductors fat, burly Americans, the collectors gaunt, stringy, dense-looking young Englishmen, and the brakemen West Indian Negroes, who spoke a more fluent Spanish than their superiors and were better mixers among the native passengers. After a time they decided to repair the last coach, and lay for some time under it, tinkering at a brake shoe. Rumor had it that this was only a ruse, that the engineer assigned to the run had been arrested the evening before, and that the train could not leave until his trial was over. Whatever the cause for delay, it ended at last with a great snorting and straining and blowing of steam, the little old Baldwin began to drag its four wagones out of the station compound. First came a boxcar, crowded inside and on top, with gente del pueblo. Then, behind the baggage and mail car, the densely packed second class. And finally, the coach deluxe, with a dozen passengers, most of whom would hasten to take their lawful place in the car ahead as soon as they could escape the eyes of their fellow townsmen thronging the station platform. The Indian of Ecuador still commonly walks, a fact easily explained by a glance at the exorbitant rate sheet. It was only by dint of much struggle that the railroad, reaching Quito four years before, had finally settled the point that even prominent persons shall pay fare. Now it has taken the offensive and collects cartage even on the bundles and fruit the passengers are accustomed to stack in the car about them. The engine panted asthmatically to surmount a two-foot rise, scores of Indians and cholos running alongside, screaming farewells to their outward-bound friends, some visibly weeping, for the quiteno of the masses considers death itself little less dreadful than departure. Then at length the train swung round the sand bank, cutting and catching a downgrade, was off in earnest, and reluctantly I saw Senor Leo Ice disappear from my South American adventures. The attack of Roditis had seized him the day before. With no task to hold him in Quito, he had been, for a time, content to spend his days at his favorite occupation of sitting on a plaza bench. He had even paid his rent well in advance, that he might have an anchor to windward. But it had proved a rope of sand when the roadler came upon him, and he had feverishly tossed together his indispensable junk and turned his face toward other climes. From Guayaquil, unless Yellow Jack or Bubonic Plague beat him to it, he planned to push on to Cajamarca and Lima, chiefly by sea, then to strike overland to Cusco. Beyond South America lay various nebulous projects, a year around the Mediterranean, a journey through Spain, or perhaps a return to the zone to earn another stake, with which to journey to the far east, there to adopt the yellow robe and settle down to the tranquil life of the studious inactivity he loved so well. Thus life moved on, even in Quito. Chispa of the Bullring had taken the same train, feigning a first-class wealth until out of sight of his Quiteño admirers. Perunel, the Andarin, too, was gone, dog, gun, hair, metal, spurs, and ledgers, to carry back to Bogota the map that had piloted us southward. Only one lone gringo descended to the city in the folds of Pinchincha to renew the task that still forbade him to listen to the siren that beckoned him on over the encircling horizon. To pass over in silence its uncleanliness would be to give a false picture of Quito. Only its altitude saves the city from sudden death. Its personal habits are indescribable. I do not use the adjective to avoid the labor of finding one less trite, but because no other could be more exact. If I described in detail one-fourth of its daily insults to the senses, no reputable publisher would print, 
and no self-respecting reader would read it. The city is surrounded by an iron ring of smells with which the susceptible stranger, accustomed to moderate decencies of life, can pass only in haste and trepidation. The condition of the best kitchen in Quito would arouse a vigorous protest from an American hobo. However foppish a continual family may be outwardly, anybody is considered fitted to the task of washing its dishes or waiting on its tables. Among all the tramps of the United States, I have never seen one so filthy as the human creatures that hang around hotel dining rooms, or, in the one or two higher-priced establishments, are at least to be found just behind the scenes, kicking about the earth, rolls which the waiter a moment later religiously lays before the guest with silver-plated pinchers. Yet clients in frock coats and outwardly immaculate garb are never known to raise a voice in protest. There is exactly one way to escape these conditions in Ecuador, and that is to keep out of the country. A modern Croesus would be forced to endure the same, for though he brought his own servants and even his own food supplies with him, the Ecuadorian would find some means of reducing him to an equality of condition, if only by opening the supplies and customs and running his unwashed hands through them. Among our table companions were lawyers, university professors, newspaper editors, commonly with several rings on their fingers, yet rare was the man whose fingernails were not in deepest mourning, or whose manners were not befitting a trough. On the streets, the passing of the women was usually marked by an all but overwhelming scent of the cheap and pungent perfumes which all the decente class, male or female, is addicted and though their faces were daubed a rosy alabaster, it was rare to see one with clean hands or without a distinct deadline showing at the neck. The city is gashed by several deep gullies with trickling streams at their bottom which serve as general dumping grounds. Not even the carrion crow mounts to these heights, and the city is denied the doubtful service of this tropical scavenger. Though the world hears little of it, the death rate from typhoid alone in the capital rivals that of Yellow Jacket in Guayaquil, and no precautions whatsoever are taken against it. When he has noted these customs and worse, the visitor will be startled into shrieks of sardonic laughter when he runs across a large two-story building bearing an elaborately painted shield announcing it the Oficina de San Edad. Yet the Quiteno is extremely jealous of any offer of other races to do for him that which he gives no evidence of being able to do for himself. Out of Colombia we had hoped for relief from the perpetual growling at Americans, chiefly in fiery and ill-reasoned newspaper editorials. Barely had we crossed the frontier, however, than we found Ecuador raging with a new grievance. The government had recently invited the doctor in charge of the sanitation of Panama to inspect Guayaquil and bring his recommendations to the capital. A strict censorship on cable messages keeps the outside world largely in ignorance of the real conditions in the pearl of the Pacific. Inside the country, however, the real state of affairs is more nearly common knowledge. One could pick Almost at random, from the local newspapers, such items as Guayaquil, 22nd. Yesterday, 40 cases of bubonic plague broke out in public school, number 5. There are seven survivors. The resident, too, soon learns the real motives that hamper the sanitation of that pest hole. Once it is cleaned up, argue its short-sighted merchants, foreign competitors will flock in upon them. As to themselves, they are, with rare exception, immune to the two plagues for which the port is famous, having recovered from them at some earlier period of life. Those who have not recovered have no voice in the matter. There are even foreign residents who bend their energies to upholding this barrier to competition. These interests, now abetted by unseen European elements fostering the discontent, and the eagerness of the opposing party 
to make political capital out of any cloth, whole or otherwise, had stirred the noisy little native papers into a furor, genuine or financed, against the government. The people in their turn had worked themselves into the conviction that the invitation was only an opening wedge of the Colossus of the North to gain a hand in the rule of the country, which it is always the part of the opposition papers to paint as imminent. We had not been long in Quito when the attitude of the populace grew so serious that a joint meeting of both houses of Congress was called to explain the government view of the transaction. The diplomatic corps was present in force, and as much of the public as could find standing room after the two houses had been seated in the largest chamber available in the government palace. The diminutive old minister of foreign affairs, who had lived abroad long enough to acquire a point of view, explained the exact truth of the situation as clearly as a disinterested foreigner might have done. But neither Congress nor the populace would hear his reasoning. The latter hooted him vociferously, calling him Yankee, and accusing him of being in the pay of the United States. The congressmen rose, one after another, to charge him with fostering a conspiracy to surrender Ecuador to the Yankees, with many references to the big steak, and the meeting ended with the roar of a bull-necked senator. Undoubtedly, senor, we want Guayaquil sanitated, but we want it sanitated by Latin Americans. The pesuña and other evidences of sanitary notions of the crowd that hemmed us in gave the speech a ludicrousness that none but an enraged partisan could have missed. But that night the little minister of foreign affairs resigned, and when the morning broke, he had disappeared. For all the handicap of the complete absence of factories and streetcars, Quito might easily lay claim to the world's championship in noise. The din from its church towers alone would bring it one of the first prizes. It is pleasant to sit out on a sunny hillside, listening to the music of ringing church bells, as it is borne on by Sunday morning breeze. But in Quito they are neither bells, nor are they rung. In tone they suggest suspended masses of scrap iron, and there is not a bell rope, as we understand the word, in the length and breadth of the Andes. Barely has midnight passed when Indians, hired for the nefarious purpose, and mobs of street urchins, eager for the opportunity, climb into the church towers, and catching the enormous clappers by a rope end, beat and pound as if each were vying with the others in an attempt to reproduce the primeval chaos of sound, ceasing only when they drop from exhaustion. No corner of the city is free from the metallic uproar. Santa Catalina Tower was a bare hundred yards above my pillow, and I know scarcely a block of the town over which does not rise at least one such source of torture, hung with at least half a dozen bells, to use that word loosely, of varying sizes and degrees of discordance. Once awakened, the city is never permitted to fall asleep again. By the time it has begun to doze off once more, the ringers have recovered, and, taking up their joyful task with renewed vigor, repeat the performance at five-minute intervals until sunrise, and often far into the day. This has disturbances of its own. The gamecocks, which no self-respecting cholo would be without, challenge one another shrilly from their respective patios. That moment is rare when a child is not squalling at the top of its voice, the mother, after the passive way of the quiteños, making no effort to silence it, cholos whistle all day long at their labors or pastimes. Men and boys habitually call one another by ear-splitting finger whistles. Ox carts, mule trains, or laden donkeys refuse to move unless several arrieros trot behind them incessantly screaming and whistling. Droves of cattle are led through the streets by an Indian blowing a bocina, a horn-like six-foot length of bamboo. Unoccupied youths like nothing better than to kick an empty tin can up or down the cobbled streets. Every schoolboy on his way home or to school twice a day. 
takes a big copper coin, or in lieu thereof an iron washer, and throws it at every cobblestone of his route in a local game of hit it. The barking of dogs never ends. Every Indian who loses a distant relative or who can concoct some other fancied cause for grief sits on the sidewalk just out of reach of the contents of one slop bucket, rocking back and forth and burdening the air with a mournful wail that rises and falls in cadenced volume for unbroken hours. Iron tired coaches clatter over the uneven cobbles. Every native on horseback must show off to his admiring friends and the fair sex in general by forcing his animal to canter and capriole up and down the line of flagstones in the middle of the narrow street. Three blind newsboys, brothers indistinguishable one from another, appear in succession, pausing every few yards to bellow in deepest bass a complete summary of the day's news, as if they were reading all the headlines of the papers they carry for sale. And to it all the church bells add their never-broken clanging. Apparently there is no law against disturbing the peace. Without the power to silence the church towers it would be useless at best. In those rare moments around midnight, when the city threatens to fall silent, it is the police themselves that tide it over. An officer's whistle screeches at a corner to be answered down, block after block, until it all but dies out in the distance. Then back it comes and continues unbrokenly until the church bells drown it out. Not only that, but he is a rare policeman who does not while away the night and keep up his courage by playing discordant tunes on his whistle whenever it is not in official use. To add to its discordance, Quito's voices, due perhaps to some climactic condition, are often distressing, particularly the shrill, raspy ones of the women of the masses, who have somewhere picked up the habit of shrieking whenever they have anything to say, which is often. Unlike Bogota, Quito has a very faulty pronunciation. The sound sh, for example, is frequent in the Quichua dialect of the region, and though not all Quiteños speak the aboriginal tongue, the sound has crept into their Spanish, and they tack it on at every opportunity. A bush, nakantosh, le boy, a yamarsh. As in all South America, the town has the unpleasant habit of hissing at anyone whose attention is desired, and the word pues has been cut down to a mere ps to be hooked on whenever possible. Si, ps, va venir, sh, manana, ps. The double L has become a French J, as in Central America and Panama, so that a street is not a calle but a caje. A key is a jave, and the newcomer will have difficulty in recognizing the place mentioned as Beja Coja, however familiar he may be with Beja Coja. Many localisms and Quichua words have found place in the general speech. A baby is a huawa, frequently corrupted with the Spanish diminutive to guajuita. A boy is more often a Wambra than a muchacho, and the traveler who does not know the aboriginal term wasi kama would have difficulty in referring to the Indian house guard and general servant of the lower patio. When its noise grows overwhelming and its picturesqueness pales to mere uncleanliness, the stout-legged visitor has only to climb over the outer crust of Quito in almost any direction to revel in the stillness and feast his eyes on vistas of rolling valleys and mountains, fresh spring green to the very snow line. A path, for instance, zigzags up the falda of Pichincha, steeper than any Gothic roof, through the scattering of red-tiled Indian huts called Porico, and climbs until all Quito, in his Andean pocket, sinks to a toy city far beneath. Another road mounts doggedly round and round mountain spurs and headlands until it is lost in the clouds, and only the immediate world underfoot remains visible. The air grows almost wintry, 
oxen and Indian women, and now and then a man of some downcast race come hobbling down out of the mist above with bundles of cut brush on their backs. Far up the road swings around on the brink of things, pauses a moment as if to gather courage, then pitches headlong down, out of sight, into a light gray void. As through a curtain shutting off the Oriente, the hot lands and unbroken forest of eastern Ecuador, a totally different world where the Amazon begins to weave its network and wild Indians roam untrammeled. End of chapter 6 Part 2 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 7 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 7 Down Volcano Avenue. On the morning of February 8th, Meech called me at five. I had already been some time awake. Such was the excitement of so unusual an event as going on a journey. The morning mists had only begun to clothe the flanks of Pinchincha when I broke the clinch of Don Panchito's last abrazo and creaked away down the cobbles of Calle Flores and across the Plaza Santa Domingo in the hobnailed mining boots suited to the long stony trail and the rainy season ahead. The remnant of my letter of credit I had turned into gold sovereigns and sewed them in the band of my trousers. On my back were my worldly, or at least my South American, possessions, including the awkward bulk of the developing tank packed with film and chemicals. That day had passed when I dreamed of driving an Indian carrier before me, and experience had taught me not to risk the assistance of the males. Thus the world roamer must leave behind, in turn, each dwelling place, after growing somewhat attached to it for all its faults, to go its way alone again, as in the past, glad or merely sorry, when, once in a while, the cable brings him a whisper of it, as from some former half-forgotten existence. It was a familiar route for the first few miles. Now and again I overtook Indians carrying enormous loads of tenajas, dull, red earthen jars and pots of all sizes enclosed in a kind of fish net often topped by a great roll of esteras mats of lake reeds which serve the carriers as beds men and women alike raised their hats to me and mumbled some obsequious greeting they were bound for latacunga market several days distant from their villages yet even on so long a journey rare was the woman from whose load did not peer the head of a baby. Lower down inhabited haycocks and huts of swamp grass, centered in beautiful potato fields, red or purple, with blossoms. A cherry tree, here called by the Quichua term capoli, producing a fruit larger but not unlike our choke cherry, alternated with what looked like a Canadian thistle. Three hours later, near the eucalyptus grove of the Flores estate, that marks Quito's southern skyline, I topped the ridge that marks my hitherto furthest south. The long pile of Pinchincha, its three peaks now standing sharply forth, still lay close beside me, the rolling green lower ridges subsiding into the mountain lap where Quito, like a tiny ant's city, still lay visible. The Pancielo, that bulks so large from the central plaza sunk to an insignificant molehill. Beyond, far across it, hovered the hazy blue ranges of the north. Cayambe, resolutely astride the equator, pointed Cochache, streaked near the top with new-fallen snow, piercing the transparent highland sky. For a long time thereafter, as often as I topped a land billow, I kept getting little broken glimpses of the town from the ever-rising world, until at last, toward noon, as a mighty mountain wave tossed me high on its crest, the view of the city of the equator flashed forth a moment more, then Quito, 
and all its surroundings sank away into the irretrievable past. Before me lay a new world, with the leisurely dignity of its builder, Garcia Moreno. The highway descended into a great distance blue hoya, one of those saucer-shaped valleys that abound all down Ecuador's avenue of volcanoes. Occasionally a horseman in shaggy goatskin trousers stared curiously at me. Now and then there passed a file of donkeys under sheet-iron roofs, a cargo of corrugated iron, the importer of which still prefers this primitive transportation to the more hasty railroad with its startling freight charges. Dandelions and white clover flecked the evergreen fields. Frogs sang their bass chorus in many a brook and pantano. Here the way followed, more or less, the route of the great military highway of the Incas. There were two of these, one of the llanos or lowland of the coast, and this more famous one along the crest of the cordillera, built during several reigns and finished under Huayna Capac. Near the village of Macachi, twenty-one miles from the capital, I turned aside to the hacienda of a Quiteno acquaintance. He was a boy of eighteen, scion of one of the old best families of Ecuador, who have kept their Spanish blood free from mixture, to whom had recently fallen the ownership and management of an enormous tract of his little country. Educated in our own land, he spoke a slow, pedantic English. Among his equals, he was soft-spoken almost to the point of diffidence, but his voice was commanding enough when he gave orders to his mayordomo or escribante, or to any of the hundred Indians who lived clustered about the central hacienda house, all of whom addressed him as su merced, your grace, and kowtowed as often as he looked at them, as their ancestors might have done to the imperial siuri. Before the sun set, we had time to ride across a part of the estate. It lay somewhat too high for wheat, distinctly so for corn, except for the cattle that flecked the upland fields far and wide. The potato was most at home. Fourteen distinct varieties of this native tuber of the Andes, several of them unknown in the north, grew on the hacienda. In one field, women were digging potatoes, large as small muskmelons though nearby were other patches still red or purple with blossoms. The average wage of the Indian peons was five cents a day, with huasipongo, space for their miserable chosas, in which the only furniture consisted of a few odds and ends of homemade pottery and some sheepskins, which spread on the earth floor by night, served the family, its guinea pigs and mangy curs, as bed. The women and children worked for nothing, wages being reckoned by the family rather than individually, except that the women who milked the cows were each paid a dollar a month. In reality, the Indians were serfs of the estate. When first hired, they are ecanchados, hooked by a labor agent, and having spent their advance in a prolonged chicha debauch, must often be arrested and forced to carry out their part of the contract, usually remaining for years, if not a lifetime, in debt to the haciendado. It would be an error, however, to look upon their condition from our northern point of view. Any custom taken out of its native environment has a far more serious aspect than the reality warrants. The Indian trained during many generations of Inca rule to avoid all personal initiative or responsibility, accepts by choice this patriarchal arrangement. The majority had been attached to the hacienda since birth, giving the community the aspect of one immense family. Each household had its little plot of ground for its own garden, and the privilege of pasturing a small flock or herd. Yet the owners have the best of the bargain. Nearer the capital were estates where Enganchados Indians made adobe bricks at ten cents a day, with huasipongo and food, making daily some three hundred each, which the owner sold at seventy-five cents a hundred. The snow peaks of Sincholagua and the rugged ice-capped ridge of the Ruminawi faced the hacienda. Though little higher, the place was infinitely colder than Quito in its mountain pocket. 
for here we caught the full sweep of the wind off the ice fields. By dark, we were both huddled in the hacienda dining room, bleak and comfortless, in spite of its extravagant trinkets from the outer world. The peons, for all their awe of their youthful lord, could not deny themselves the pleasure of grouping noiselessly before the door as we ate, listening to the strange tongue, not Quichua, stranger still, not even Spanish, which their erudite master spoke with his traveler from unknown parts, who came on foot, carrying his own load like any Indian. The crack of the door grew ever wider, the broad, expressionless faces ever more numerous, until a draft of the bitter mountain night air caused his grace to glance up in annoyance. Both crack and faces disappeared silently and suddenly, but came again many times before we each crawled early under four heavy blankets. Next morning the highway, no longer cobbled, but wide and smooth without wheeled traffic, soon brought snow-clad Elinza into full sight before me. So skillfully did it bear me upward that by noon I was crossing the great paramo of the Nudo de Tiopuyo without the consciousness of having climbed at all. The Andean paramo, for which we have no exact English word, is not the sharp mountain peak my imagination had pictured, but is used of any broad plain so lofty that not even the hardy Indians will live upon it, where Kinua, most cold-blooded of domestic plants, refuses to grow, a drear, treeless upland covered only with the tough brown bunch grass that gives it somewhat the aspect of our virgin prairies. To a northerner in motion it was not uncomfortable by sunshiny day, but no one passes these lofty plains at night by choice. Only the rare shepherd's shelter of stones and ichu dots the cold brown immensity. The shivering highway hurried due south across it, bringing to view another sea-blue hoyo and barely pausing for a last glance back at the faint peak of Cotacache and the long bulk of Pichincha, grown mere parts of a broad, hazy, tilted horizon, racing downward into the softer valley. Some seventy-five miles south of Quito begins a veritable desert. From a distance, the ranges to right and left seem green, yet the ascending valley grows so dry and arid that even the scanty scrub trees die of thirst. At the top of the barren divide I met head-on, panting harder than I, and moving no faster, the little tri-weekly train from the coast crowded with dust-laden weary passengers. Almost sheer above me stood forth the beautiful cone of snow-clad Cotopaxi equaled in symmetry on all the earth's surface only by Fuchiyama. To the left, the hoary head of Tungaragua, far away in the blue haze of the hot tropical oriente it looks down upon, rose gradually higher into the sky. Then the highway descended and went ever more swiftly downward into a half-arid hole in the ground, and by three I was tramping the cobbled streets of Ambato, the winter resort of wealthy quiteños, a mere eight thousand feet above sea level. To one accustomed to loftier Quito, it had a tranquil, half-languid air. Its people were more friendly, lacking that suggestion of belligerency common to quiteños. There was indeed something pleasing about it that I had never seen yet in Ecuador. It reminded one mildly of Egypt in air and odor, and the dust sweeping across the barren, arid hills that wall it in. The market of this town, hung midway between the tropics and the temperate zone, offers the fruit of both, aguacates and mangoes, side by side with apples, pears, peaches, and cherries, the native capuli at five cents a peck, besides raspberries, blackberries, and the perennial frutillas, strawberries, that are sing-sung daily through the streets of Quito. It was from the marketplace of Ambato that I caught my first glimpse of Chimborazo, the giant of the Andes, just the crown of its long saw-like glacier ridge, brilliant white against the steely highland sky as it stood on tiptoe peering over the barren ridges of Carhuazo, 
Barely had I entered the hotel when its disheveled boy servants crowded around me to ask if I were an andarin. Pevernel, it proved, had once favored the establishment with his distinguished, if financially disadvantageous, presence. I pleaded two colorless garments to merit the title. To these Andean village youths, the arrival of so romantic a being was what that of the yearly circus is to our towns of the far interior. Yet when I offered any of them double his present wage to accompany me and carry a few pounds of my pack, they shook their heads and shrunk fearfully away. It is not, as I gradually learned to my growing astonishment, merely because they know no better that the people of the Andes sleep on wooden beds. In Quito, I had found many who refused to use imported springs, and I know of at least two doctors who prescribed wooden beds for kidney trouble. Here in Ambato, a perfectly respectable spring bed had been completely floored over, and the unsuspecting gringo, instead of landing on a soft and yielding mattress, found himself on such a couch as a thinly carpeted floor might be. Nor was this by any means the last bed out of which I pulled the lumber and spread the woven reed estera above the barrel hoop springs. Ambato claims the title of Athens of Ecuador, and indeed four of the country's principal writers lived and died here, which is more than can be said of the capital. The place of honor in the main plaza, gorgeous with geraniums of every shade of red, is occupied by the statue of Juan Montalvo, commonly rated the country's chief literary light. In Ambato, Juan Leon Mera wrote his Comanda, the accepted classic among Ecuador's novels, and one may still visit the family of Luis Martinez, whose A la Costa is worthy a place in South American literature, if only for its magnificent descriptions of tropical scenery. I left Ambato on a morning so cold that gloves would have been welcome. One of those mornings, frequent in Ecuador, where the sun rises like a beauty of a harem pushing aside the soft white curtains of her alcove, when the mountains at the bases of which dense masses of clouds and mist have gathered seem gigantic altars on pedestals of marble. Soon the sun grew ardent and imperious, capriciously burning away the mist curtains of the night, blazing down unrestrained on the rolling plains of Huachi, so arid and monotonous. The road lay deep in sand across a half-desert, with no other adornment than the fences of Cabuya, of the cactus family, that replaced the dividing ditches or mud field walls further north, to mark the limits of the poor heritages of the Indians. The chief industry here is the weaving of a coarse cloth from the fibers of the Cabuya Blanca. Here and there a capuli tree persisted, and impenetrable bushy clumps of the thorny sigse bristled aggressively. The few planted fields were sparse and drear, though near the town, where the thirsty arenales had been transformed by irrigation ditches into patches of green on which the desert-weary eyes rested gratefully, grew the strawberry, large and fragrant. Higher and higher rose the world, though so imperceptibly that the ascent was noted only because the landscape opened out to ever greater vistas. It was a day of climax in volcanoes. Around the circle of the spreading horizon, the white crest of no fewer than eight of the great vent holes of the earth grew up about me until I paused on a high ridge to study. To the right, for a time looking like a single mass of rock and snow, stretched long sawtooth Carhuanrazo with Chimborazo rising behind it. Then gradually the great glacier blue dome of this Everest of America detached itself and stood forth in all its immensity. Far behind, yet perfectly clear, in spite of the blue haze of some forty miles distance, cone-shaped Cotopaxi, once so savage in its destruction, reared itself into the skyline like an occidental twin sister of Fujiyama. To the left, in military precision, three snow-clads stood shoulder to shoulder, Sincholahua, Antisana, and one above which rose a column of smoke that marked it as Sangay, 
most active of the western world, but a few days before in destructive eruption. Then came the glacier-clad rounded cone of Tungarahua, keeping its eternal watch over the tropical Oriente, and to the south, noblest of all, peering forth first in early mists and growing in grandeur all the morning, stood dreaded El Altar, its beauty now completely unveiled, a fantastic mass of peaks and pinnacles, like some phantom city of ice. For hours the snow-peaked horizon continued. Across the sands of Huachi travelers had been few. Toward noon they grew plentiful. Around every turn appeared Indians and their four-footed competitors with such monotonous persistency that I needed a cudgel to drive out of my way the asses which, expressionless and impassive as their masters, were inclined to march serenely on, irrespective of human obstacles. The rare chagras, or tawny countrymen, who live in their chozas along the way, were interesting only as evidence of how clod-like man may become. At Mocha, where I halted in the early afternoon, the deep blue ice fields of Chimborazo lay piled into the sky overhead, a mountain still, though the town stands more than two miles above sea. All the following morning its arctic dome towered close on my right as I plodded along its gentle slope not far below the snow line, often waist deep in the ruts which generations of pack animals and Indians had worn in the brown, uninhabited paramo dreary with long, slightly rolling stretches of bunch grass, across which I only now and then overtook a mule train, the drivers wrapped to their ears in their heavy ponchos. Behind, across a hazy valley, now more than forty miles away, the symmetrical cone of Cotopaxi gleamed faintly forth in a new dress of snow that had fallen during the night. A cobbled highway ran to the bottom of a slight hollow some distance off, but travelers had scorned it so long in favor of the rutted paramo that grass was grown high between its cobbles, and at length, as if it resented the abandonment, it swung off in the direction of Cajabamba and was gone. The dozen ruts across the paramo finally joined forces to form a kind of road that, turning its back on Chimborazo, around whose white head a storm was brewing, struck off toward a long, undulating, hazy valley backed by blue heaps of ranges. Gradually I descended to almost a desert again by a road deep in sand, rising and falling over countless sand knolls, the peaked grass-covered huts of Indians, tossed like abandoned old straw hats far up the flanks of the drear mountainside on either hand. At one of these I found the first use for my new revolver. An enormous dog, plainly bent on destruction, bounded out upon me without a sound, halted abruptly with a faint yelp as I pressed the trigger, turned a complete somersault, and fell feet upward like a captive turtle not two yards from me. Ordinarily there is little to be feared from the sneaking curs of all colors that swarm about every hut throughout the length of the Andes. Before the conquest, tradition has it, the Indians had only the mute Aeku now exterminated, at least it is certain that none of those that remain are mute. These degenerate descendants of the animals brought over by the Spaniards rival the original chaos of sound as they rush out in cowardly packs upon any stranger, especially a non-Indian. For as the white man's dog abhors an Indian, so do these white men, while their masters gaze stolidly on without so much as attempting to call them off. The Indian of the Andes does not raise dogs. He has them merely because he is too passive to get rid of them. The curs are never treated as pets. The only caress they ever receive is a kick or a prod from which they retreat sluggishly with a cowardly yelp, even if the weapon misses its aim. They are never fed, but exist on such offal as the Indians themselves disdain. A mountaineer to whom I put the question once briefly expressed the viewpoint of his race. How can we help having many dogs, Patron? They breed so often. From the village of San Andres, picturesquely backed by the ice palace of El Altar, architecturally as diffuse as the castle of Schwerin, a spreading highway 
bordered by endless cactus hedges, led toward a great sandy plain far ahead. A small forest of eucalypti that marked the site of Riobamba, giving it its center. Further on, for all the aridity, was plenty of half-grown corn, with numberless peaked thatched huts peering above the vegetation on either hand. At the entrance to Riobamba, I saw the first llamas of my South American journey. Once an Indian passed driving a llama and an ass hitched together. Further on, several of these absurd Peruvian sheep, pasturing beyond the cactus hedge, craned their long necks to gaze curiously after me. Time without number, I had been assured that not only was the llama never a draft or milch animal, but that it could never be ridden, that it would carry exactly a hundred pounds and would irrevocably lie down if another ounce were added, and that it would under no circumstances be urged beyond a slow, dignified walk. Imagine my surprise, then, when suddenly I beheld a llama, bestridden by a full-grown Indian, come down the road at a brisk trot and watch them fade away into the eucalyptus line distance beyond. In the town beyond there was one llama for every two donkeys. Riobamba, chief city between Quito and the coast, is commonly described as lying at the foot of Chimborazo. The description must not be taken too literally. I had imagined a cold, haughty little town snuggled together in a lap of the high Andes. But if Riobamba lies at the foot of Chimborazo, so, in only somewhat lesser degree, does Guayaquil. The traveler turns his back on the glacier-clad giant of the Andes and tramps a long half-day before he comes to what, in situation and general appearance, might be a town on the sandy prairies of western Nebraska. Its monotonously right-angled streets are unusually wide, painfully cobbled, and swirling with sand. Its architecture is drearily like that of any other Andean city. It has been several times destroyed by earthquake, were it not, like Quito, more than two miles aloft, it would be even more often destroyed by its personal habits. At sunrise, thrice a week, most of the town turns out to watch the trains that have overnighted here leave for Quito and Guayaquil respectively whence its suggestion of some frontier village of railroad hotels in our western states. Unlike Quito, Riobamba has a streetcar. It is a platform on wheels with a flat roof supported by gas pipes, under which are some crosswise boards that are called seats, with the same Latin American tolerance with which a place to lie on the floor is called a bed and a place the traveler may possibly be able to make his way through is called a road. Like some Andean newspapers, it appears every now and then when a pair of blasé world-weary mules drag it across town to the station and back, usually only on train days. Many ride, and the more poorly dressed seem to pay for the privilege, but the Indians take good care not to be caught on any such risky, newfangled contraption. There is commonly not a sight to be seen in Riobamba unless it be the stern white face of Chimborazo looking down upon the city from the middle distance to the north. The traveler who chances upon the town of a Saturday or Sunday, however, will find it a place of interest. Then the Indian population of a thickly inhabited region comes from thirty or more miles around to what is rated Ecuador's greatest market. The sandy plaza, larger than an American city block, is so densely packed with stolid, thick-set men and women in gray felt hats and crude-colored blankets that only by constant struggle can a purchaser thread his way across it. From my room on the corner above, not a foot of open ground was visible. The scene was like a swarming of myriad ants of many colors, like a great oriental rug undulating in the sunshine. As one crowds along between the rows of hawkers, all the products of the region seemed to pass in procession. Here were entire families who had jogged many miles to town under the produce of their chakras. There, a man with only a half-grown chicken or a gaunt pig for sale. 
Beyond, a woman sat all day long, selling, bit by bit, at a net profit of perhaps ten cents, the bushel of native cherries which, together with her babe, she has carried at least twenty miles. Here was a place of ugly native shoes, a very limited demand. There, homespun blankets and ponchos in colors that scream audibly before they mellowed by sun and rain and the habits of their wearers. Every domestic animal and fowl known to the Andes of today was displayed. Cheap knives, tin spoons, trinkets from foreign lands, native plants and bulbs, herbs that still make up the aboriginal pharmacopoeia, as in pre-conquest days, tiny packages of dye stuffs that are doled out a pennyworth at a time, cornbread and barley bread, even a few soggy wheat biscuits, though the price of the latter is all but prohibitive, cherries, strawberries, oranges, alacates, a hard native taffy known as alfienque, pears, apricots, peaches, a hard little apple that never matures, pineapples, nearly all the grains and vegetables known in our land, and even a greater variety of corn and potatoes, and a countless confusion of other products that sell for what would seem far less than the cost of bringing them to town. Beyond was a tercena, an open-air butcher shop, where Indian women hacked into bits the cows and sheep that had succumbed to amateur butchers, at the same time fighting off the fifteen dogs which, by actual count, prowled about the stand. In one corner scores of tawny bare-legged Indians squatted beside heavy, grass-wrapped loads of snowy ice, Riobamba's only means of cooling her beverages. If one knew enough of the bastard Quichua of Ecuador to ask its origin, the stolid fellows threw an expressionless glance toward the sky dome of Chimborazo. About them hovered something akin to the glamour that surrounds the Arctic explorer. All day long was an endless motley going and coming through the adjacent streets and plazas, amid which the imagination could easily drop back for centuries and fancy what this Andean world may have been before the coming of the white man. It was so brilliant a Sunday that Chimborazo seemed to hang almost sheer above the town, and the whole bulk of snow-clad Tongarahua loomed clearly forth from its tropical home. When I set out after midday, for what I had been told was an easy half-day's tramp, within an hour, so sudden are the changes in weather zones here, an icy rain was pouring down upon my shoulders, bowed with the weight of a hundred-pound pack. At last I sprawled to a summit with an all-embracing view of the entire district of Riobamba, the city itself a mere fleck far below in an opaque blue landscape roofed by purple-black clouds through which the unseen sun cast a single faint shaft as from a weak spotlight. The rain which in Ecuador falls in zones sharply cut off from one another ceased abruptly at the top of the barrier. Here were two roads from which to choose, and for hours thereafter I could not know whether the one that descended a sharp valley beside a tiny stream led anywhere near where I wished to go. Well down the bone-dry vale were scattered hamlets of grass and mud huts of a half-wild tribe of Indians, the men in white goatskin trousers that gave them the appearance of shaggy-legged Greek satyrs. The dwellings often hung far up the steep walls that enclosed the growing stream. Many of the inhabitants ran away at my approach. The rest stared at me from safe heights as I sped on down the valley. Ugly white curs abounded. In the scanty trees, a bird sang now and then. But for the most part, only the sound of the stream leaping from rock to rock broke the mountain-walled silence. Cold darkness fell, and still the broken trail descended swiftly. At rare intervals, a corner of the moon peered through the clouds. Then, in the blackest of nights, the road forked again giving me another random choice. A wild, windy, uninhabited hour beyond, the path fell suddenly away under my feet, and I found myself involved in a labyrinth of quebradas, 
holes and chasms large as two-story houses, as if the region had been wrecked by a long series of earthquakes. A score of times I climbed down hand over hand into immense ruts, with walls high above my head, certain I had lost my way, yet with no other choice than to press on. Two hours at least, this riot of the earth's surface continued before there appeared suddenly the lights of a considerable town, dimly seen through the night across a wet, blurred valley, backed by an all but invisible mountainside. A trail picked itself together again under my feet, pitched headlong down to a roaring little river straddled by an aged stone bridge, ghostly white in the pallid moonlight, and led me stumbling into the railroad village of Guamote, still blooming with the tom-toms of Sunday fiesta that had left its scattered debris of drunken Indians through all the length of the town. From Guamote, I followed the silent but well-kept quito Guayaquil Railway through a landscape like that of southern Texas, winding in and out between dreary hills peopled only by a rare, weather-worn shepherd in goatskin trousers, then across broad stretches of scarred brown, slightly rolling desert, scantily covered with bunch grass, the sand sweeping over it in clouds. From Palmyra, two dismal little station buildings at some eleven thousand feet elevation, the railroad dropped steadily for all the more than a hundred miles to the coast. Some way down the descending valley the land turned almost suddenly from dreary brown to the green of another rain belt that gradually climbed the ever higher mountain walls that shut me in. Beyond Alausi, next morning I made a swift descent even swifter by sliding down the face of the notorious devil's nose where the track mounts in three sections one above the other and reached the little town of huigra in time for breakfast here in a green valley between high hills falling abruptly into a prattling stream are the main offices and hospitals of the railroad and an american atmosphere tempered with whiffs of england and ecuador to which the fever and bubonic of Guayaquil do not mount, nor the ills of Quito descend. At Huigra, my route was to turn southward over the enclosing mountain wall, but I had no objection to coasting down into the tropics on a side trip to Guayaquil, except Guayaquil itself, and when the chief engineer promised a screened refuge from sun to sun, I accepted the invitation gladly, all that is necessary to travel from Huigra to sea level is to get something on wheels of the right gauge and let her slide, or rather let her slide within very definite limits, lest one reach the bottom far sooner and in poorer condition than was planned. With a native employee behind, two of us sat on the sheer front edge of the track automobile, the experienced hand of the chief on the brake and roared in and out and over and ever down the mountain canyon, the towering walls on either side rising higher above us with every yard forward. A foaming river kept us not much slower company. Huigra is at kilometer 117. At 110 we suddenly reach the tree line. Forests, in striking contrast to the bare upland plateau of Ecuador, grew up about us as if by magic. Foaming mountain brooks dashed down from either towering wall to join the river and to save the company the expense of building water tanks. Swiftly the trees changed in species from hardy highland shrubs to voluptuous tropical growths till the airy bamboo, noblest of the ferns, bowed to us in graceful dignity from the crowded forest as we screamed past. Before noon, we swung out of the gorge I had followed from Palmyra and halted at Bucay. It had been like dropping in two hours from May to a dense and heavy July, from a northern scene to one like that of Panama, with the same sticky atmosphere, negroes, and outdoor life. Here we took possession of the empty pay car on the rear of the day's passenger train and sat with our feet on the back railing, 
watching the dead flat tropical world run away and shrink up to nothingness behind us. The track lay straight as a cannonball's course through the tunnel of forest and jungle. Indians and their gay garments had disappeared. Here were only the colors of nature. Along the way, thatched houses of split bamboo slouched in languid attitudes, half black and slightly dressed families peering from their sort of hole-in-the-wall verandas behind partly raised blinds hinged at the top. For all the lazy languor of the scene, jungle products succeeded each other swiftly. Cacao, then palm trees gladdened the eyes. The air grew heavier. Now and then a great field of sugar cane broke briefly the endless tunnel of forest. Beautiful bamboo groves alternated with immense tropical trees cutting into the skyline. The natives, afoot or a horse, used the track as a trail, for all else was impenetrable wilderness. Here and there the jungle crowded so close that it sideswiped the car, though along the way were many section gangs fighting it back with machetes, the favorite tool and weapon of the costeño, who saluted us, or, more exactly, my companion, as we sped past. Pineapple fields grew numerous. At stations the fruit lay in piles at the feet of indifferent, chocolate-colored vendors. The brown castor bean on its small green trees appeared. Splendid coconut palms, heavy with nuts, heralded the sea. Maidenly slender rubber trees, broad fields of light green rice, growing arm in arm with Indian corn. The plebeian breadfruit tree, with its broad leaves, fancily cut as with scissors in the hands of an inventive child, and always gigantic tropical trees cut fantastically into the skyline of the light gray day above. Behind, always, fixed as fate itself, the dim and clouded range of the Andes, a giant wall, blue and unbroken, shut off the world beyond. Here and there a hoary peak showed above the clouds, so high one could not believe it possible. Far off, in the heavens, like a great cloud, Chimborazo stood white and immovable. As in the forest one sees only trees, so down here, looking at the chain as a whole, one could realize the loftiness of those realms where one had been living for months, more than two miles above the sea. Naked brown babies, huts on ever longer legs, hammocks, grew numerous and languid loungers to fill them. Here and there appeared a Chinaman, some large towns, bamboo-built and all on stilts like a thin-shanked army, buzzards circling lazily overhead amid scents that whispered of plague and sudden death. Then on either hand began to appear the low, dense wooded hills of Duran, more properly deep green islands in this flood time. Fluffy white flowers in myriads smiled bravely above the black waters that would soon swallow them up. The vast mountain wall across the world behind had grown a shade bluer when we drew into Duran on the banks of the Gaius, and brushing both clear with housewifely care of any lurking mosquito, dodged through the double screen doors into the railroad quarters. Here were shower baths and phonographs, New York papers a frequent nasal twang, and only outside and seeming far off as in some distant place, the scent of Ecuador. Sudden death is reputed to fly chiefly by night along the Gaius, so only when the sun was high did we venture across to Ecuador's metropolis and far-famed death-trap Guayaquil. Outwardly, the low, heat-streaming city looked far cleaner than Quito, but here filth grants no immunity. During three hours we saw the black funeral streetcar pass nine times, and by no means all the population can afford so splendid an exit from the world. Yet here were electric tramways for the first time since Bogota, larger shops and more ambitious displays than in Quito, and signs of greater commercial activity. The houses were of wood or split bamboo, low and earthquake-fearing, all the windows with wooden blinds hinged at the top, from behind which peered half the female population. 
seldom seen on the streets. Compared to Quito, it was a town of no color at all. Among the foreign residents was a curious indifference to local dangers, always seeming greater at a distance than on the spot. Americans yawned at the mention of yellowjack and bubonic, and went about their business with as little apparent worry as a New Yorker of death by a street accident. Nothing in the attitude of the people suggested an unusually precarious hold on life, except that ever-recurrent black funeral car, electrically operated as if horses were not fast enough for its incessant labors. Long before the sun had lost its mastery of the situation, we had retreated again to Duran. The lone traveler in far-off lands runs many perils, but if I must succumb to one of them, let it be with a fighting chance, not this insidious, sneaking death that flies on all but invisible wings. Next morning the passenger train lifted us back to Huegra, where a new experience awaited me. That evening I sat writing in the railroad quarters. Two fellow countrymen were parading the broad, second-story veranda of the light wooden building. The only other sound was the muffled chatter of the stream below. Suddenly the heavy table beneath my arms began to move as at some spiritualist seance. The windows took to rattling as if in some sudden terror to escape from their frames. The wall decorations swung back and forth like a pendulum, and for what seemed like a long minute the entire building shook as with paludic fever. I opened my mouth to protest against what I took for a moment to be physical exuberance of the veranda paraders, but I closed it again as I realized that I had passed through my first earthquake, and had gone on writing for a line or more before I recognized the good fortune of being in a wooden house. Outside, the strollers had not even interrupted their chat, except to remark, Pretty good one, eh? And when the natives in town below had left off shouting, evidently in an attempt to scare off the dreaded spirit within the bowels of the earth, life returned to its customary languor, the silence broken only by the stream still prattling on through the darkness. In the morning the telegraph wire brought word that the instruments of Duran had registered seven quakes, and that several houses and a church had fallen into the adobe interior. On the morning of February 24th I crossed the little bridge over Huegra's garrulous stream, and trailing away up the mountain wall that shuts off the railroad valley on the south, disappeared from the modern world. All but twenty pounds of my luggage I had turned over to a native fletero, proprietor of a mule and jackass express company that operated as far south as Cuenca. It was in the nature of things, however, that even under a light load I should pay for my descent to Huegra by much sweating toil before rising again its paltry four thousand feet to the two miles or more of the Andean chain. In the valley a brilliant sun set me dripping, above was driving mist to chill me through if i dared to pause and out of which now and then floated the gentle exhortations of unseen arrieros to their toiling animals anda muchacho mula caramba vaya sin vergüenza an experienced gringo had assured me that i was approaching the most impassable region in ecuador a place where it rained steadily and heavily a hundred and four weeks a year, where my mules would sink to their ears in mud and be left to perish, where I myself would infallibly die of exposure if my caravan were overtaken by night out on the lofty paramo. I easily forestalled the peril to my mules, and the second I resolved to avoid, by not letting night overtake me. It was not certainly an ideal road. There were places where the writhing trail was for miles a series of earth ridges with deep ditches of mud and water between, like an endless corduroy road, and these made hard going indeed for laden animals. For as often as one of them sets foot on one of these camelones, as they are called in the Andes, it slipped off into the muddy ditch between, 
as likely backward as forward, giving a very exaggerated imitation of the gait of a camel. In fact, it is this constant slipping and sliding of passing pack trains that turns certain wet regions of the Andes into camelones. In places, the mud-reeking slope climbed steep mountain sides through narrow trails worn twenty feet deep, down or up, which horses or cargo mules stumbled and sprawled constantly, threatening to smash their packs against the side walls or underfoot. But it was a route far worse for horsemen than for a man afoot. I stepped blithely from ridge to ridge, not only dry-shod, but at my regular pace, easily leaving all four-footed competitors behind, and while there were germs of truth in the warning that a mule and his cargo slipping and falling upon me in one of the gullies might bring my journey to a halt. The very simple remedy for that possibility was not to be found loitering beneath an animal when he fell. Donkey carcasses and the rain-bleached skeletons of mules and horses were frequent along the way, and always, now broken, now for a time incessant, came out of the blind mist the raucous bowling of arrieros andamola. Caramba. The dense, heavy fog turned to pouring rain. Indeed, there were evidences to verify the assertion that this was one of the zones of Ecuador where the rainy season rains perennially. In mid-afternoon, I passed a few Indian hovels. I had been warned to stop for the night in the last of these rare habitations if I would not end my wayward career out on the Arctic paramo of the nudo de Asue. But the solid-featured native assured me that there were others a half-league on, and I had climbed twice that distance across a dismal stretch of bunch-grass without a sign of life except a scanty herd of wild, shaggy, rain-drenched cattle before I realized that the Indian had told me the old lie to be rid of an importunate guest. Within me there grew the conviction that, in spite of my best intentions, I should some day shoot a large, round, soft-nosed thirty-eight caliber hole through some Indian for sending me further up into the uninhabited night. However, there I was, exactly where, of all places in Ecuador, I had so often been warned, in several tongues, not to let night overtake me. The gray walls about me dimmed like a lamp turned out, these paramo trails being, even by day, only a struggling of interwoven paths, often effaced. It was not in the order of things that I should keep the route long in unmitigated night. For a time I stumbled along an irregular rock-littered ground, full of leg-breaking holes, picking every step ahead with my stick, like a blind man, and even at that now and then sprawling on all fours. As to direction, I could only trust to luck. Then I felt water-soaked bunch grass under my foot, and all efforts to find the trail again were wasted. Vaguely I felt that I had come out on the nose of a mountain. Through the rain-drenched night there came faintly to my ears the sound of a waterfall, and from somewhere far off the dismal howling of a dog, rode by on the raging wind. The ground under my feet took on the angle of a steep roof. It required stick, hands, and extreme vigilance to keep from pitching headlong down into the bottomless unknown. I felt my way, inch by inch, several hundred feet downward, without finding a level space as large as my hand. In the end, I could only sit down on my bundle in the mud, brace my feet, against a tuft of bunch grass, and piling my most perishable possessions in my lap, button my yama hair poncho over my head, sup on a three-inch butt of bread, and settle down to keep my precarious seat until daylight. He who fancies an Ecuadorian mountainside a pleasant night's lodging place, merely because it is near the equator, has still something of geography to learn. Strangely enough, it might have been worse. The poncho was almost impervious to cold, entirely so to rain. As the Scottish chieftain of earlier days, 
soaked his tartan before lying down for a night in the highland heather, so the wetness of all about me seemed to add warmth. The rain redoubled, yet I should scarcely have known it but for its pelting above my head. I dozed now and then into a nap. After one of them I peered out into the wintry night to find the mist alive with hardy fireflies so large that those which started up near me seemed to my dull fancy the lanterns of some prowling band. Twice some animal, perhaps a wild mountain horse, romped by me. When I looked out again a bright moon was shining, yet I felt too comfortable as I was to take advantage of it to push on and fell asleep again, not without a drowsy misgiving that some diligent hunter might try a shot at my huddled shaggy form standing out in the moonlight against the swift mountainside, until I remembered that no native ever ventures out upon an Andean paramo except in the full light of day. Dawn showed the lost trail zigzagging in three branches down the face of the mountain. The waterfall lay below me, yet so steep was the slope on which I was perched that I had to crawl back again up the trail on all fours and descend with it. Far away across a valley so deep I could not see its bottom, lay in plain sight what I knew to be the town of Cañar, a mere white speck halfway up the great mountainside beyond. It is chiefly noted for its outlook upon the world. From a distance it seemed to hang upright on the vertical mountain flank. Once arrived, I found it occupied the flat top of one of the countless hills that pile higher and higher into the sky, to culminate in a great Andean chain. Here is a land of stone, everywhere in field and valley, rocks lay more profusely and far larger in size than on any abandoned New England farm. If the tumbled-down old town of Cañar had any features at all different from hundreds of others down the crest of the Andes, it was its large proportion of stone buildings over those of sun-baked mud. It is perhaps the existence of stone, rarer to the north, that accounts for the presence near Cañar of the first ruins of unquestionably Inca origin. Their victorious march to the north, too, was so quickly followed by the arrival of the Spaniards that the children of the sun left no permanent works about Quito and beyond. The imperial highway from Cusco to what is today Ecuador, built by a race less fearful of the lofty places and mighty canyons of the Andes, was more direct than the modern haphazard route. Where it descended from the Paramo of Asue and climbed out of the gorge beyond, there was built a fortress and a tumbo for the housing of the imperial cortege that is known today as Inca Pirca, which some believe to be the same Tomebamba where Huayna Capac the Great was born and where the news of the landing on the coast of a strange tribe cut short his journey southward in his old age. He who would visit Inca Pirca must have either a guide or a working mixture of Spanish and Quichua. I lost myself a dozen times in the labyrinth of paths, each leading to an isolated Indian hovel. One might have fancied the aboriginals had surrounded the sacred Inca relics with a conspiracy of silence, for I was forced at last to drag an old man forcibly out of a cluster of cobblestone huts before he pointed out to me a path that wound away upward and disappeared over the edge of the world. Along it I came at last in sight of the Inca Pirca, the castle of the Gentiles, as it is locally known today, sits silent and grass-grown on the summit of a rock knoll from which the eye ranges in every direction over a tumbled labyrinth of valleys and ridges. They built high, the Incas, as men who preferred to see with their own eyes what was going on about them, and they seemed to have gloated over the unbroken sweep of the cold, invigorating Andean wind. The chief ruin is that of a fortress, an oval wall with a sheer rock face to the north, and symmetrical stone steps leading up to the entrance on the south. Of large cut stones 
and with ornamental blind doors or niches. It is so like the monuments of Peru as to leave no doubt of its Inca origin. Even on the curves, the stones are so nicely fitted, apparently without mortar, though Humboldt reported the discovery of a kind of cement between them, that there are few joints for which a modern contractor would be rate as workman. The walls are double, with earth between them, the inner walls less carefully constructed, and undisturbed centuries have filled the interior of the fort to a grass-grown level. Above this rise the remnants of a building, only adobe walls with some stone-cut doorways still standing, but the many wrought stones to be found in fences and in scattered heaps in which dwell the modern inhabitants of the region suggest that the adobe walls had once a complete casing of cut stone. Slight as are the remains, there is still sufficient setting for the fancy to picture Huayna Capac striding back and forth upon its lofty promenade, looking upon its four corners of the earth, and halting in his meditation to watch the imperial chasquis racing toward him across the rugged landscape with news of the landing in his imperial domains of a pale-faced tribe with hair in their faces. Hours of strenuous toil, piloted only by my pocket compass, brought me back to the main route. For a space it was a real highway, faced with stone, but soon degenerated into a writhing chaos of ruts and rocky subidas, like a road in the throes of an epileptic fit. The sun was high when I caught sight of Biblian, its famous sanctuary standing out white and clear above the dull mountainside above the town. But it was only in the thickening dusk that I finally climbed into it. A youth replied to my first inquiry with a como no, just as unexcitedly as if strangers came to Biblian every year or two. In the dingy little shop to which he led me, an old woman whose greedy face warned me to prepare for exorbitant charges, even before I learned she went to church four times a day, hunted up the enormous key to an immense room above. In the corner of it stood a bed, at least a century old, covered with a marvelous lace counterpane, but harder than macadam. While I sat at meat, or, more exactly, at vegetables, since Biblian kills its weekly beef on Sunday, and by Monday it is gone, the customary delegation of citizens came to offer their respects. The town, it proved, was oppressed with a great worry. The earthquake of a week before had not merely tumbled down several mud church towers of the region, but had given new life to a prophecy that clanged definitely at two-second intervals without break. ex biblian could not sleep of nights, and the priests were reaping a rich harvest. All night long I lay like a Hindu ascetic on his couch of nails, listening to the exquisite torture of a broken-voiced church bell that clanged deafeningly at two-second intervals without break, except for a frequent wild hellish jangling of several minutes' duration. When dawn broke, the entire population had already crowded into the church for early mass. A bun was not to be had with my morning coffee, because my hostess had locked up the shop to attend the second ceremony. I ordered breakfast for eleven, and a boy came to inform me that I must eat it at nine, since from that hour on Senora La Patrona would again be at church. Biblion is a city of pilgrimage. By morning light it proved to be surrounded on all sides by fields of corn, with countless capuli trees and masses of geraniums lending it even more color than the variegated blankets of its inhabitants. The cupped-shaped valley was scattered with scores of tiled cottages of the half-Indian peasants, the hillsides a network of paths and trails to their huts and tiny farms. The chief road climbed to the capilla on a crag well above the town. It was a costly, three-story structure, richly decorated within, though a dismal mud hut served Biblian as school. 
The Virgin of Biblian is noteworthy among a host of her sisters in not having come personally to pick out a spot and order the building of her shelter. Perhaps her history is still too recent for the successful concoction of such traditions. In 1893, the valley of Biblian was choking with drought. The local cura, alive to his opportunity, set up an image in a grotto on the mountainside and, consulting his barometer, implored rain. The drought was broken. In honor of the feat, the image was named the Virgin of the Dew, and pilgrims began to flock to Biblion. In the volume which he has prepared for their instruction, the foresighted cura bewails the fact that we cannot tell in one book the countless cures, assistances, protections, and life savings the blessed Virgen del Rocio has done for the faithful from all over Ecuador. In the face of the appalling mass of proofs before him, he confines himself to none. But he does mention the miraculous fact that the first chapel had been completed by August of the following year, and that two years later the present sumptuous, rich, divine sanctuary was sprinkled with holy water. Barely was this dry when the troops of the Liberal Party, like the barbarians at the gates of Rome, threatened the afflicted capital of Asue, bringing inevitable ruin, such, for example, as the curbing of the power of the church, when the powerful blessed Virgen del Rocio was born from Biblion to beleaguered Cuenca with fitting reverence in the midst of the most crowded and pompous procession in the annals of that Catholic history, whereupon the liberal troops faded away and redoubled the fame of the Virgen and the income of the Biblian parish. The minister plenipotentiary of the Vatican has seen fit to grant a hundred days' indulgence to whoever visits the sanctuary, which indulgence may be applied to souls in purgatory. The trip to Biblion is worth at least that. Lovers of justice will rejoice to know that the foresighted cura bids fair to enjoy for long years to come his divine knowledge of barometers. It is only a league from Biblion to Asogis, an hour's stroll along a slight river through almost a forest of capuli trees, the wild cherries hanging in bunches something like the grape, though with only a few ripe at a time. Then comes a sudden drop into summer, for the climate of Azoges is soft and bland with little rain. About the town were hundreds of tile and thatched roofed cottages, among rich green cornfields, spreading far away up one valley and down another, and beyond those were tawny mountain flanks mottled with every color from sandy brown to sun-drenched green. The town of Quicksilver is rather that of Panama hats. As in San Pablo, Colombia, men, women, and children were braiding them everywhere. Shopkeepers and their clerks made hats in the intervals between customers, and even while waiting on them, Indian and Chola women wove them as they tramped along the roads with a bundle and perhaps a child on their backs, as European peasant women knit, or those of other parts of Ecuador spin yarn on their crude spindles. I was assured that every living person in Azogues knew how to tejar sombreros. The fops themselves were so engaged somewhere out of sight. The weekly hat fair of Azogues began on the Friday evening of my arrival. As the afternoon declined, there streamed in from every point of the compass, from every hut among the surrounding cornfields, men, women, and children, each carrying a newly woven hat, bushy with its uncut straw ends. A dozen agents from Cuenca bought these as they arrived, never at the price demanded, but after a heated bargaining to which, in the end, the weaver always meekly yielded. Each buyer seemed to confine himself to some particular grade or style, this one to coarse comunes, that to large sizes, another to small, and only two or three to the finer weaves. As he bought them, each agent piled the hats 
on his own head until his face was completely hidden behind the protruding ends, from the depths of which the bargaining went on unabated. Saturday, however, is the chief market day of Azogues. As I strode out along the highway to Cuenca next morning, throngs were pouring into the city from every direction. For a full two hours I passed an endless stream of Indians, as close together as an army in column of squads, the women carrying on their backs every product known to southern Ecuador. The men, for the most part, were burdened only by a half-dozen hats, one atop the other, the untrimmed ends hiding their faces as under shaggy straw-colored beards. The scene recalled the great trunk road of India, yet was of vastly less interest and variety. He who had once seen an Ecuadorian Indian had seen all the procession. A few were weaving the last strands of their weekly hat as they hurried by. Most Panama hats are completed on Friday night or in the gray of Saturday's dawn, for the maker, frequently overcome by indolence during the week, must bestir himself to have his product ready in time for his weekly debauch. Before he sallies forth to squander his week's earnings, however, he carefully lays away enough to purchase another tuft of straw, lest he have no nest egg from which to hatch next Saturday's celebration. The procession had thinned considerably before it occurred to me to count the passers-by, and even then a hundred and thirty-two persons passed me in a minute, each and all bearing something for the market of Azogues. During most of the two hours the number had easily doubled that, and this was only one of the many roads and trails leading to this little-known town far from modern transportation. Every house of southern Ecuador has a cross in the center of its ridge pole. Here they were so elaborate, so covered with devices symbolic of the region they represent, that it was only by a stretch of the imagination that one could make out the cross itself beneath. Late in the morning I came again to the Asogis River, and a typical bridge of the Andes, opportunity to wade thigh-deep for all who travel afoot on this main highway to southern Ecuador. Not far beyond, there cantered by me several wholesale buyers from the Azogues market, the saddle-bags of each bulging with a hundred or more hats stuffed one inside the other. Mile after mile, the broad river valley of Cuenca is forested with capuli, eucalyptus, and a gothic-spired willow. Red tile roofs stand strikingly forth from deep green cornfields, and thousands of fertile cultivated acres are shut in by barren sand-faced hills, though there are no imposing peaks south of Cañar, and I had seen none snow-clad since leaving Riobamba. With no census for twenty-five years, the metropolis of southern Ecuador, third city of the Republic, and capital of the rich province of Asue, estimates its population at 45,000. Some have it that this great Cuenca, six leagues long, gouged out of the Andes, was the original Tomebamba, birthplace of Huayna Capac. Like Rio Bamba, the city is flat, its wide cobbled streets crossing at right angles, stretching their chiefly one-story length away in both directions, almost as far as the eye can see. The buildings are almost all of the sun-baked adobe mud that everywhere dominates the architecture of the Andes, though some of the best families have striven to decorate their dwellings outwardly with huge mural paintings on the canvas-protected walls of patio and veranda. End of chapter 7 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 8 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson Chapter 8 Through Southern Ecuador as susceptible Don Giovanni falls under the succeeding spell of every pretty face, each blotting out those that went before, 
so the traveler down the backbone of South America frequently concludes that he has found at last the climate copied from the Garden of Eden. Such a spot is Cuenca, dimming by comparison its latest rival Quito. And I found in my notes of the exuberant first day there the assertion of all the earth, as far as I know it, Cuenca has the most perfect climate. Always cool enough to be mildly invigorating to mind and body, yet never cold, it is unexcelled as a place for dreamy loafing. The sunshine vastly exceeds the shadow, and its situation is peerless, not in the scenery of its surrounding mountains, which are distant and low, but in the rich fertility of this great vale of Pau Carbamba, flowery plain, as the Incas called it. Cuenca has no fitting excuse for not being one of the richest agricultural cities on earth. Yet its only hotels are dirty little Indian eating houses without sleeping accommodations, and the traveler must fall back on the prehistoric system of hunting up a friend's friend. For once this roundabout method brought handsome results. At the home of the Montesinos brothers, I found my most homelike accommodations south of Quito, in a highly cultured family with no scent of the public hostelry about it. My front door opened on a vista across the patio and the long market plaza, usually shimmering with Indians and clashing colors, to the blue hills and a strip of Dresden China sky to the west and it is only fair to the Andes to mention that this extraordinary family had erected in a back patio a well-appointed lavatory, stoutly padlocked against the Indians of the household. The Montesinos brothers, sons of a former governor of the province of Asue, were lawyers, as well as professors in Cuenca's colegio, leaders in the intellectual life of the city, excellent examples of the best grade of inter-andino. One was a teacher of French and English, which did not seriously mean that he could speak either of those tongues. In 1899, this bookish, somewhat effeminate man had started a revolution against the Alfaro government in the person of General Franco, a bloodthirsty half-negro from Esmeraldas, who had been made governor of Asue. It proved unsuccessful, and the instigator had been forced to fly to the jungle Oriente and live for months among the head-hunting Jivaros Indians. I had hesitated to believe my own convictions on certain conditions in Ecuador, but this frank and outspoken native outdid anything I might have said. His attitude was in striking contrast to that belligerent pride of Latin American governments and their lead mobs and self-seeking politicians. To him, the thrice-beloved patriotism of his hot-tempered fellows was rubbish. What he wanted was an efficient government and a chance to live a free life, whether he remained the subject of the particular strip of territory known as Ecuador, or of the gigantic Yankee land. So many seemed to fancy imminent. He asserted that the police of Cuenca were its worst criminals. All thieves and ruffians who could not be openly convicted were sentenced to serve as policemen. Except in the collecting of taxes and as a place of reward for its henchmen, the central government leaves Cuenca and the south of Ecuador virtually abandoned, and that tendency so general in Latin American countries, for the more distant parts to break away and form a free or at least autonomous state is here marked. The region labors under a thousand petty annoyances. For instance, Quito has a parcel post service with the outside world, but Cuenca has none, nor any money order system, and about one piece of mail in three ever reaches an addressee in the capital of the Asue. A package mailed from abroad to a Cuencano lies in Guayaquil until the addressee appears in person or appoints a lawyer to lay claim to it, 
to pay the fees and grease the wheels of the legal and illegal formalities necessary to set it on its way to its destination. To our modern notions, Cuenca is not much of a city. Yet here, in the almost untracked wilderness, it seemed enormous. So rarely do strangers visit it. Large as it is, and in spite of my entirely conventional appearance, I could barely pause in the street without all work in the vicinity ceasing and a crowd gathering about me. Hungry to behold a new face as the crew of a windjammer that has gazed only upon themselves during long months at sea, their attitude seemed to say, We can work tomorrow. But there is no certainty that we can have the pleasure of looking at a stranger. It is hard for Americans, with their wide outlook and accustomed to the complicated existence of our large cities, to realize the narrowness of life in these placid old adobe towns hidden away in the Andes. Virtually cut off from the outside world, the Cuencanos are a peculiarly bookish people. We do not know, said Montesinos, that there are places on the globe where men live in freedom and decency except through books. Yet in spite of being rather uncertain of their dignity, like all isolated people, the educated classes were as well-meaning as simpaticos as any I met in Latin America. Two things only were necessary to join the upper caste, a white collar and visiting cards. The former, above a patched hand-me-down, was more effective than a new hundred-dollar suit worn with a flannel shirt, and the man who has his name printed on bits of cardboard to exchange with regal courtesy and profound bows with every upper-class acquaintance is instantly accepted as of gente decente origin. Indeed, visiting cards should be as fixed a part of every Andean traveler's equipment as heavy boots. One could not but pity these ineffectually ambitious mortals kept down by leaden environment and isolation. He who does not deal in Panama hats has hardly an opening in Cuenca except to study medicine, law, or theology in the local colegio. Hence there is a plethora of doctors, who can only wear their titles and live the life of enforced bookworms, forbidden by the rigid rules of caste even the privilege of turning their hands to some useful occupation. As in Bogotá, the very isolation and lack of opportunity has driven many to their studies, and Cuenca numbers many writers among her sons, producers chiefly of that languid half-melancholy, pretty poetry, full of the fine writing, the divorce from life, and unlimited leisure to polish their gems of thought gives. In all Cuenca there is only one mean little bookshop, selling religious tracts and translations of American and English penny dreadfuls. The intellectuales can only, as it were, feed upon each other and form mutual admiration societies, where admiration soon palls from too constant familiarity and lack of new blood. Few, even of the best families, have ever been out of the cuenca or basin in which the city lies, and its isolation has given the place something of the atmosphere the traveler is always seeking, commonly in vain, of a world wholly removed from outside influence. Their ineffective eagerness to learn was pathetic. The most nearly educated young men of the town had rented a second-story hall near the main plaza and decorated its facade with huge letters announcing it the English Language Club. Here, the score or so of more or less English-speaking residents of the male sex gathered together several evenings a week. For years, however, there had not been a genuine English-speaking person living permanently anywhere near Cuenca. In their eagerness to capture an authority, the club drafted me at once, 
and whole delegations were always ready to go about and show me the town and vicinity, provided it was a not too distant vicinity, for they had as great a dread as the Quiteno of getting far from the central plaza. I was received kindly and eagerly by the educated men anywhere, so long as it did not involve my intrusion on the Moorish seclusion of their family life, and became a sort of honored guest of the town, even if I was not presented with a key to it, which by comparison with the door keys would have been a burden indeed. They were not spenders. Money comes slowly and with too great a strain in these parts, but they were ever on the lookout to do me little kindnesses. Barely was I settled, therefore, when I was hurried off to an evening at the English Language Club, convoked in special session. For an hour I sat like the chief buffoon in a comic opera ensemble at the center of a horseshoe circle that included a score of doctors, Cuenca swarms with doctors, homemade and book-trained, the grandsons of presidents, sons of ministers to Washington and the court of St. James, while the whole gathering, like self-conscious schoolboys, got off a sentence or two in more or less English in regular rotation around the circle until some shining genius suggested that, as they had so illustrious a guest with them, it was merely a social evening and not a regular meeting, hence the rule demanding that only English be spoken was not in force. With a veritable explosion of relief, the entire club burst into Spanish, and Alfonso was himself again. Later experience proved that the rule was largely a dead letter even at regular meetings, and only to be enforced when the arrival of an illustrious stranger put the club on parade. The walls were hung with several mottos in English, and they had gathered together some belated American magazines and a billiard table. There the members gathered several evenings a week to play pokar, and to practice very intermittently such English as they had learned from the printed page, forming their sentences, or it was worse, their pronunciation, from the rules books had to offer, and mixing in with it a bit of similar brands of French, as if any foreign language answered, more or less, the purposes of the club. The rules forbade the use within the club room of any tongue than our own, but after the first few sets of greetings of good nicket, how do yo do, the gathering settled down to an uproar of Castilian, broken only by the few phrases of Cuenca English which custom had stereotyped. The majority came to play pokar not so much because of the opportunities that pastime offered for one of the Latin American's chief failings, for pockets were seldom bulging, but because it smacked of the United States, the stepmother of the English Language Club of Cuenca. The son of a former Ecuadorian minister to Washington, who had spent a year or two in Yankee land, shared with El Señor Dr. Montesinos, Professor de Inglés in Nuestro Colegio, the position of final authority on the tongue, except on those rare occasions when a traveler brought the real dyed-in-the-wool article with him. Even the authorities were not faultless. They said, disciples for pupils, and habitually the expression, I can to go, and clung tenaciously to similar choice bits of their own convictions and, what was worse, drilled them into their fellow members with that dogmatism strongest in those who are wrong. But the minister's son had made the most of his American residence in learning pokar, so thoroughly that he was as real an authority on that art as he fancied himself in English. Unfortunately, the combined efforts of the club had not unearthed among all the dog-eared classics that had drifted together in generations of Cuenca's flirting with English the mention in print of that fascinating pastime. 
Once they had been forced to adopt their own spelling and homemade phrases. On the wall appeared a warning placard. Those which play pokar are speaking English, and each game was sprinkled with a rapid fire of Spanish punctuated by fixed phrases of near English. Thus the expression, you bid or you open, had been concocted by the simple means of literal translation from the Castilian used in similar pastimes, and became, you speak, amid the crack of billiard balls and the rattling of homemade chips, the conversation ran on much as follows. Guerrero, you are serving. Y hombre, ya le dije que la muchacha no. Five cards, all the workings, Carlos. Lindísima, hombre, pero su mama, Enriquito, you speak. No, señor, equivocado, I am speaking. Caramba, es verdad. It is true. And for how much are you speaking? No, it is mistake. The doctor is speaking, because he is sitting by the side of Juancito, which is serving the cards. And with deep solemnity, the doctor proceeded to speak by throwing two Cuenca made chips on the table. The game rattling on until Munoz broke in upon an oratorical description of the latest event of La Vida Social of Cuenca with a And now I am naming you now, Carlitos, with the house full, the whole kettle, and throwing down a full house, he scraped the entire pile of chips to his corner of the table. There were two dentists in Cuenca at the time of my visit. One of those present was not there in person, because he had gone away on a week's journey two months before. The other had not yet arrived, though he appeared nightly at the English Language Club, because his instruments of torture and gold-plated diploma were still somewhere on the road from Guayaquil. Had they both been unqualifiedly present in the flesh, the wise man would have continued to endure any degree of toothache rather than submit to their amateurish mercies. The chief raison d'etre of the city is its commerce in Panama hats, though virtually none are made there. The agent sent to Azogues or other neighboring towns pencils in some cabalistic code on the inside of the hat the price paid the weaver, or as near that price as his conscience makes necessary, and delivers it to his employer. In the city are many factories of sombreros. From behind the downcast mud fronts, of which sound all day long the pounding of wooden mallets, and from which exudes the constant smell of sulfur, at the establishment of a club member we posed for a local photographer in acres of hats in various stages of the finishing process, which ranged from the huge Wallachisa products from the Jivaros country on the east to those of so fine a weave as to be inferior only to the famous Hipehapa of Manabi. It is just over the range from Cuenca that there are to be found the Jivaros, the widely renowned headhunters of the upper Amazon. Montesinos had lived long months among them at the time of his mishap and knew their ways well. A proud, untamed race engaged in almost constant warfare with neighboring tribes, they consider the white man an equal and treat him as a friend so long as he does not transgress their strict tribal laws. The Andean Indian, with his slinking air and his heavy clothing, they look down on as a weakling and a very inferior being. Having dispatched an enemy, the Jivaros cut off the head well below the shoulders extract the skull by a vertical cut at the back, sew up this and the lips, and by the insertion of hot stones and a process known only imperfectly by any other than the tribe itself, reduce the head 
the size of an orange, with the original features easily recognizable. In this state it is said to be of little use to its rightful owner, even if recovered. The desiccated head must, according to tribal laws, be kept until after the yearly ceremony to appease the spirit of the dead man, after which it is hung up as a trophy over the entrance to the successful hunter's house, or, what is far more usual of late years, traded to some passing white man for a rifle or a supply of cartridges. One traveler I met had been so eager to obtain one of the dried heads that he offered as Javaro chief two rifles. The chief replied sadly that, though he would do anything possible to get a rifle, unfortunately it happened that the tribe did not have a single dried head on hand. But, he cried a moment later, his countenance brightening visibly, could you wait a month or so? A few years ago a tall, lanky German arrived in Cuenca and went down among the Javaros to study their customs, and especially to find out exactly how they shrink heads. Month after month passed without a word from him, but Cuenganos knew the Teuton way of pursuing an investigation step by step in all its details and ramifications and thought nothing of the prolonged absence. Then one day, more than a year later, there was offered for sale in the market of Cuenca a splendid specimen of shrunken head with long blonde hair and beard and a scholarly cast of countenance. The investigation had been thorough but the outside world still remains in darkness on the art of shrinking heads among the Javaros. To the stranger, perhaps the feature of Cuenca that will remain longest in his memory is her street lights. Certainly, if it happens to be his lot to have to find his way home on a black night after a sad candle-lighted comedy at the local theater, the schoolroom of the Colegio, the laws of Cuenca require that every resident in the principal streets set up a candle before his house. But as the two-cent velas, which are satisfactory to the law, are short and not particularly inflammable, and the wind is given to blowing its hardest during the first hour after dusk, the city changes long before eight from long, faintly guessed lanes between unseen house walls to a medieval inky blackness. The inhabitant who stirs abroad carries a square glass box containing a flickering candle, or is accompanied by a link boy in true medieval fashion. The stranger who, being no smoker, chances not even to have matches with him, feels his way homeward for an uncertain number of blocks by counting them with his fingers at last discovering the plaza on which he lives by hugging the corner of it, shivering with uncertainty as to whether his lodging is the third or fourth door from the butcher shop with the protruding hook, here and there stumbling over a piece of sidewalk or onto a puddle, he finally coaxes his gigantic key to fit its lock with something far more potent than satisfaction. Thus life runs its placid course in this far-off city of the Andes. Those who come there after the railway from Huigra reaches Cuenca, if long-pondered plans some day mature, will no doubt find it different, more blasé and less likable, no longer one of the rewards of toiling over the world's byways. Even electric lights are threatened, and before them will flee one of its most nearly unique characteristics. The hope of securing an ass to stagger out of Huenca under my possession had melted day by day during my week there. In what I had been assured was the best donkey market in Ecuador, those animals proved both scarce and high in price. Toward the end of my stay, the baggage I had sent from Huigra had arrived, both developing tank and tray broken, in spite of the vociferous promises of the fletero, though still serviceable with elaborate manipulation. It was chiefly picture-taking that forced me to turn pack-horse. 
Had I been able to abandon everything connected with photography, I might have pranced along like a schoolboy under his knowledge. A pack of nearly fifty pounds remained, in spite of a rigid reduction and a desperate throwing away which included even my medicine case, bequeathed to the Montesinos for, ever since crossing the Rio Grande into Mexico seventeen months before, I had been burdened with it without a single excuse to swallow one of its myriad pills. If only Edison would take a day off to invent a baggage on legs that would trot dog-like after its owner, just a modest little baggage of, say, fifty pounds, it would revolutionize life. Distinguished visitors to the city of the Andes are, in all accounts, extant, met upon their arrival and sent on their way by a cavalcade of horsemen, including all the local celebrities. For the first time in my Latin American journey, I was accompanied by a guard of honor as I plodded heavily out of Cuenca on March 10th, that is, Montesinos, the master of English, strolled with me across the ancient cobbled bridge over the Montadero and a mile or so beyond until he met the sun coming up from the jungled montaña of the Jivaros and turned back with market-bound Indians to his scholastic duties. The broad highway was dry and hard as a floor. Prepared in my usual heavy boots for the usual Andean trail, I could have walked it in dancing pumps. The great Cuenca shrunk to an ever narrower fertile valley, stretching southward along a little stream called the Tarqui. A score of Indians were plowing a single field with ox-drawn plows fashioned from forest trees. So scant is his individual initiative that the Andean husbandman works well only in company with his fellows, and the experienced Mayordomo conducts his farming in a succession of bees in which all the employees join efforts, as in the days of the Inca. The Andes grow higher and more mountainous to the south. Beyond the hacienda and the hamlet of Cumbe next morning, the valley closed in and forced the highway to scale, like an escaping prisoner, his walls, the great Andean knot of Portete. Bit by bit it shrunk to a narrow road, then to a rocky trail, like a man about to begin some mighty task, with no longer time to consider his personal appearance, reducing himself to the bare essentials. Through clumps of blackberries and frost-bitten corn it climbed, then shook off even these, and split into faint diverging paths across another of those lofty wind-swept solitary paramos of the Andes, broken here and there, only scantily covered with the dreary dead-brown ichu bunch-grass of the highlands and low, bushy aquapayas. It would have been more to the point if the sympathy the old woman of the hacienda behind had taken the form of fiambre, a roadster's lunch, in which to follow up the coffee and diaphanous roll of an Ecuadorian desiono. By ten I was starving. By eleven I had eaten even the rose I wore in a buttonhole. During the next few hours I found three blackberries, hard and green, and shook dice with sudden death by eating a handful of wholly unknown and even more tasteless parmo berry. The one Indian I met during the afternoon misinformed me, before he sped on out of reach, that Nabon was a bare two leagues beyond, and all the rest of the day my imagination persisted in heaping up mighty banquets that toppled over and faded as I prepared to fall upon them. Suddenly the paramo ended, as if it had been hacked off with a dull, gigantic machete, and the way-worn, haggard trail stumbled blindly down into a labyrinthian chaos of jagged white rocks, like an arctic sea in upheaval, an earthquake section as split and smashed and broken as if the world had come into collision at this point, 
with another planet or a celestial lamp post. When at last I sighted Nabon, long after I had entered it a score of times in imagination, it was still a mere speck on a broken edge of the earth's crust, which I reached by dusk only by dint of a Herculean struggle. It was a cornfield town of thatched mud huts, of universally Indian blood. The alcalde was not at home, but the priest's word was law, and I was soon dropping my bundle from my grateful shoulders in the best room of an Indian dwelling. My unwilling host removed the bedclothes and piled them on the uneven earth floor in an adjoining room for himself, wife, and child, and left me the wood-floored bedstead. The mud walls were embellished not merely with the gaudy colored chromos of various virgins, but with scores of the advertising pages of American magazines, chiefly pictorial, for the family could not even read its own tongue. I did not succeed in discovering how these exotic reminders of home had found their way to this unknown village of the Andes. The Indian and his wife kept me awake half the night with their alternating prayers and responses before a candle-lighted lithograph in the adjoining room, each prayer beginning, Blessed Santa Maria, give us this. Blessed Santa Maria, give us that. One would have thought Maria ran a department store. It is only eighteen miles from Nabon to Oña, but no mere words can give any suggestion of the labyrinthian toil that lies between them. Down in the bottom of the mightiest chasm of this tortured section of the earth sits an isolated peak shaped like an angular haycock. From the lowest point of the day's tramp I could not see its summit. When I looked back, hours later, upon the immense stretch of gashed and tumbled world behind me, the peak had sunk to a mere dot on the landscape. Yet in a way it was an ideal tramp. A sun-flooded day in the exhilarating mountain air passed in absolute silence, without even the sight of a fellow mortal, except a very rarely a lone shepherd so far away on a bare brown mountainside as to be merely a tiny detail of the scenery. There was one drawback, also, for the spider-leg trails split and spread at random across the world, above, at every opportunity, and for several hours at a time I was not at all certain I was going to Peru. At length I rounded a lofty spur and another great valley opened out before me. An hour later, I prepared to present my notes to the cura of Oña. His two housekeepers, attractive chola girls, received me with the customary coldness of their class toward strangers, and the information that the padre had gone to the mountains. Ya no mas de venir. He should be back at any moment, murmured one of them, which might mean, of course, that he would be back in an hour or a week. There was no one else in this shelf-like hillside of mud huts around a dead plaza surrounded by cornfields who would be likely to house me, and I could only wait in hungry patience. Night was falling like a quick curtain at the end of a dismal act, when one of the stupid damsels admitted, probably he will not be back tonight, but they would serve a little something to eat, if I could wait a while. I was already accustomed to that occupation. On a work table of the earth-floored and walled corridor, among the parrot that kept calling the cholas by name, a chained monkey of homicidal tendencies, and other curl odds and ends, a meal of several courses was at length set before me as rapidly as the single tin plate could be washed and refilled. Onya does not eat bread but so large a helping of mote was served that I succeeded in filling a coat pocket with it, well knowing that no other provisions would be forthcoming for tomorrow's uninhabited trail. As a food, this mess of boiled kernels of ripe corn, chief sustenance of the Andean Indian on his travels, 
It's like those medicines that are worse than the ailment they are designed to cure. Then there was a plate of black beans, a corn tamale, and a tasteless preserved fruit, all stone cold, but red hot with aji or green peppers, with which all food in the Andes is enlivened. Hours later, a group of horsemen rode up out of the night and halted before the Casa Corral. I rose from a cramped doze on a corridor bench to find the priest dismounting. A brawny man of massive frame, more than six feet tall, with well-cut features and a powerful Roman nose, dressed in a black robe reaching to his spurs, and a huge Panama hat of exceedingly fine weave, a present, no doubt, from some fond member of this flock among the surrounding hills. He towered far above his companions. A cigarette smoldered between his lips. A week's growth of dense black beard half covered a face that bore testimony to long and deep experience in worldly matters and his voice boomed like Quito's largest church bell. Yet his manner was that syrupy courtesy, accompanied by a whining speech, peculiar to the region. He fawned upon all who approached him, addressing them with maudlin words of endearment. Ah, compadrecito! Oh, my dearest of friends! Oh, Josecito Cholito! Ito mio. With long drawn rising and falling inflection that made his speech seem even more false and insincere than it was in reality, me he greeted in the same tone, like a long lost amiguito, and assured me the Casa Cural was henceforth my personal property, expressing his deepest regret that he had just sent to Cuenca, where he was about to be transferred his two phonographs, and diez mil pesos, five thousand dollars' worth of other toys. It was a typical Cural residence of the Andes. The rough adobe walls of his cluttered study, with mud benches in the form of divans around them, were almost completely covered with large lithographs advertising various brands of whiskey and cigarettes, more than half of them showing nude female figures. Under his table was spread out to dry a six-foot square patch of tobacco, and at frequent intervals the padre reached under it for the makings of a cigarette, without taking his eyes off his visitors, nor ceasing the flow of his cadenced endearments. Two men, chiefly of Indian blood, soon joined us, one the jefe politico, and the other what might be called in English chairman of the town council. The former carried a guitar, the latter a quart bottle of aguardiente, and both a stimulated gaiety even greater than that of the priest. During an affectionate three hours, the trio toasted each other alternately in large glasses of this double voltage concoction, after suffering two or three rounds of which I was forced to allege a sore throat. The moving spirit of the feast was the priest, whose powerful frame carried his liquor well, and the evening raged on amid a riot of chatter and the savage thrumming of the guitar, little more than the flushed faces visible in the dense cloud atmosphere of cigarette smoke within the tightly closed room. The cura spoke French readily, having been in earlier years an inmate of the French monastery of Riobamba and affected it with me all the evening. The jefe politico was childishly eager to hear us speak that strange tongue. The town councillor roared with anger as often as either of us uttered a word of it, charging that we were abusing him under cover of that cursed Castilian of the gringos. The cura maliciously added fuel to his wrath, unostentatiously keeping the bottle moving, meanwhile sending a boy to replenish it as often as it was emptied. The enraged counselor ended at last by staggering out into the night and across the plaza, shouting drunkenly that he was going for a gun or a machete. The other two followed him, and for some time a maudlin bellowing, 
intermingled with the wheedling of a velvety voice of rising and falling cadence, awoke the echoes of the night, gradually subsiding, until at length silence fell. The priest at last came slowly back, without a suggestion of intoxication, which he seemed to lay aside as he might his long black robe, reached under the table, rolled a cigarette, and explained apologetically that his recent companions were the chief civil authorities. He must keep on good terms with them, whatever his own tastes and desires. Then he implored me to spend the following day in Oña, promising that we should visit on mule-back many historical spots in the vicinity, and launching into a learned dissertation on the history of the region. Oña, he asserted, was the oldest town in southern Ecuador, and the treaty of peace had been signed by Sucre in this very house after the battle of Tarqui. In spite of the impression that the invitation was mere surface courtesy, I finally promised to remain. He threw his arms about me in an affectionate abrazo, showering upon me endearing terms, all ending in the Spanish diminutive Ito, and called upon the housekeepers to spread a mattress for me on a mud divan in the study. Then the cura, who at least had the virtue of living his life frankly, retired with the two comely cholas to an adjoining room in which, it is true, there were two beds, and silence settled down over the Andes. In the morning I turned over for another nap. An hour later the priest and his unofficial family marched in upon me, and it was some time before I could get sufficient privacy and liquid mud to shave and dress. From that hour until night I had little more than silent sufferance from the cura and his household, and heard not a reference to those many points of historical importance he had painted in such enticing terms in his ardent condition of the night before. Tomas Sakempis says, A sad morning often follows a merry evening, or words to that effect, but the cura of Oña had evidently overlooked that particular quotation. An almost constant stream of Indians and half-Indians came to inquire in soft, cadenced voices for Taita Curita, who sat in his fly-swarming den smoking countless cigarettes and whining unlimited endearments and blessings on all comers, but resolutely squelching all applications for coin of the realm or the material things of this world, and reaching at frequent intervals for the replenished quart bottle. About eleven, the two of us, and a carpenter, who had been pottering about the house all morning fitting together two boards that were destined never to fit, sat down in a corner of a wide back corridor of the Casa Corral to a substantial dinner at which cat, dog, parrot, and monkey helped themselves to every dish as freely as we. The meal was adorned with a jar of pulque a drink which the cura had taught his cholas to make after reading of it in an account of Mexico. The rest of the day drowsed slothfully away amidst the screaming of parrots, the barking of dogs, the shrieks of the monkey rattling his chain in all but successful attempts to rend and tear some unwary visitor, and a swarming of flies that sounded like a distant waterfall. A typical parish priest life of rural Ecuador, punctuated by the occasional chanting of the velvety sing-song voice in the mud church next door, as my host hurried through a mass for some departed soul. Towards sunset the household was augmented by a third plump and youthful chola who had been home on a visit to a parental mud hut among the hills. It seems strange that the Casa Corral was so ill-kept and slatternly, with so generous a supply of housekeepers. At the summit, beyond the chaotic chasm into which the world falls away below Oña, the nature of the country changed. From an endless vista of barren and often soilless rocks, the entire landscape was transformed to a heavy wooded region of hardy undergrowth, 
somewhat like small bushy oaks, at times almost approaching a forest, a shaggy world rolled away as far as the eye could follow in every direction. Here and there was a larger bush completely covered with pink blossoms. Then the half-forested mountain top took gradually to rocking like a ship approaching a tempestuous sea, until all at once it spilled itself, like the cargo of an overturned freighter, into another enormous hole in the earth, hazy with the very depths of it. The trail pitched over the edge with the rest, like a bit of flotsam from a wreck, helpless at the mercy of the waves. Thousands of little green farms, chiefly of corn, with an Indian hut set in a corner of each, hung at sharp angles about the enclosing walls of the valley. I had reached the famous Vale de Socorro, the land of corn. Zara is Quichua for maize. To climb at last into the scattered grass-grown village itself. Ensconced in the great hoyo of Hubones, dividing the Azue from the province of Loja, Zarajuro is a little world of its own. The great majority of its population is Indian, but a new type of Indian, of darker skin and more independent manner than those to the north, still humble to the gente decente when facing them singly, but verging on insolence when gathered in groups with chicha at hand. Here each owns a little patch of land and refuses serfdom. His dress is somber in marked contrast to the gaudy colors of his quiteno cousins. In place of the loose white panties, he clothes his legs to the knee with a close-fitting coffee-hued woolen garment and covers all the rest of the body with a poncho of the same color. He wears an immensely thick, almost white felt hat of box-shaped crown, the brim drooping about his face, and his long jet-black hair, instead of being confined in a tape-wound braid, is commonly flung about his head and shoulders. He buys nothing from the outside world, except masses and indulgences, shears his own sheep, the wool of which, usually black, his women spin and weave into the heavy cloth that provides the somber garments of both sexes. Besides supplying its own wants, the valley of Sarajuro exports by way of Puerto Bolivar a bit of coarse cascarilla bark, basis of quinine at about five cents a pound. Sarajuro assured me that the road to Loja was todo plano, but level has strange meanings to a people accustomed from birth to the steepest of mountains. One of the best engineered highways in Ecuador looped ever higher to the realms of eternal silence of the Acaya Huara Uma, not, but from the dense forested summit where I had looked forward to the corresponding pleasure of looping as leisurely down the opposite flank, an atrocious trail stumbled headlong downward to a narrow valley of a small river. From the hamlet of San Lucas, a long day, pouring incessantly with rain, followed the streams, the trail mounting and descending rocky headlands with the monotonous regularity of a flat cartwheel. Even when the landscape opened out again at last, the plain was calf-deep in mud, and it was only by dint of a constant struggle that I dragged myself, mud-caked and drenched, on the second evening into the southernmost city of Ecuador. Loja, 380 miles from Quito, and capital of the province, least in touch with the central government, lies exactly on the fourth parallel south, in the delta of the little Samora and Malacatos rivers, insignificant bits of the Amazon system. It is a low, flat, rather featureless town, surrounded by a fertile, fruit-producing soil, and though 7,000 feet above sea level, of a humid, semi-tropical climate that is 
kindly even to bananas. Birds, among them one much like the robin, make the place reminiscent of American summers. There are only rolling hills near at hand, though not far off is that labyrinth of mountains of Prescott's fancy, blue-black now, with rainy season, high up among which, according to local assertion, are still to be found remnants of the great military highway of the Incas. Lojanos seem a dull, torpid people, laborious of mind, and the town has little of the picturesque even in costume. The pure Castilian type is well represented, but Indian blood, chiefly in the mestizo form, is still supreme, though by no means so general as to the north, and the population includes a few Negroes and more sambos, mixtures of Indian and African blood. More than eighty lawyers hover in their mud dens, ready to pick the bones of the eight thousand inhabitants, largely poverty-stricken illiterates. There is some weaving of Panama hats, and in an attempt to stimulate that industry, professores of the art have been imported from Aswe to teach it, particularly in the orphan asylums. But it remains at best a dilettante occupation, foreign to the soil. The chief industry of the region round about is the raising of mules and cattle that are shipped chiefly to Peru. Lima subsists largely on loja meat, which is no doubt the reason she gets virtually none herself, even when it is not some Catholic day sacred to starvation. Soruma and Portovelo, two mule-back days to the west, boast the chief American mines of Ecuador, but gringos are seldom seen in her streets. In one matter, the town is in advance of more populous Cuenca. It has electric lights. As long ago as 1897, Loja brought in, by way of Peru, the first dynamo known to Ecuador, a sign of progreso, of which her inhabitants never tire of boasting. Scattered in sixteen candle-power bulbs here and there along the streets, the system did not reach as high as the littered lumber room in which I spent the nights on a platform on legs, where the customary candle winked weakly through the humid darkness. I was overjoyed, however, to come upon a placard announcing that the municipal library was open to the public even at night, as it promised to open first at one in the afternoon. I was not surprised to find it still locked when I arrived at two. I waited half an hour, peering greedily through the bars of the reja at the long shelves of books and maps. Then I began inquiries. The adjoining shopkeeper expressed unbounded surprise that there were persons so ignorant as not to know. The government is so poor it cannot pay the librarian any more and that the institution has been closed for months. Loja was once the center of the commerce in Cascarilla, the bark of a tree not unlike the cherry in appearance, that abounds in the ravines of the mountains to the eastward of the city. Nearly three centuries ago, a missionary to the region found the Indians grinding the bitter bark in their stone mortars and swallowing it as a specific against intermittent fevers as they do to this day. When the wife of the Conde de Chinchon, viceroy of Peru, lay ill of a fever in Lima, the corregidor of Loja sent to her physician a parcel of the powdered bark. Upon her return to Europe, the condesa carried a quantity of the magic powder with her, whence it was for a long time known as Chinchona. Meanwhile, Jesuit missionaries of Brazil had sent parcels of it to Rome, whence it was distributed amongst the Brotherhood, nothing loath to add to their reputation for miraculous powers and to the income from their drug stores, and the name Jesuit spark became widespread. The tree, however, has always been known to the Indians by the Quechua name of Kina Kina, and in time the refined product took on its modern name of quinine. The tree in its original habitat has been ruthlessly treated, being often felled merely to avoid the labor of barking it standing. 
and today with large chinchona plantations in india southern ecuador has but a fraction of the income it might have from one of its most valuable indigenous products it is typical of latin american conditions that a capsule or more commonly an oblea like two saucers stuck together of quinine reimported from europe and paying heavy custom duties costs four times as much in the boticias of loja as in the united states in one of the quaint two-story houses with an air of decayed gentility facing the main plaza and grazing ground of loja lives augustin carrion inventor of the celefono by means of which a piano can be played by electricity and given the soft long-drawn notes of an organ he is the chief sight of the region yet held in a certain ill-concealed disdain by the mass of his fellow townsmen even while they are basking in the sunshine of his fame a striking example of those rare mortals who struggle to raise themselves above the low level of their deadening environment in these buried cities far from the moving modern world i found him in his rambling parlor of undusted efforts at grandeur its walls decorated with large maps of paris and new york both of which he had once visited in an effort to patent and place his invention interspersed with the customary inartistic family portraits draped with aged mourning crepe a member of one of loja's chief families of pure spanish blood speaking a cultured castilian with the diction of a man of books he was in appearance a ludicrous mixture of the typical inventor of the comic supplements and of the latin american stickler for formal dress scraggly gray whiskers pursued themselves about his unimpressive face a haircut months overdue emphasized his narrow shoulders and flat chest his hands thin almost to transparency suggested something weak and harmless in need of protection his once stiff white shirt was innocent of buttons and with his energetic or more exactly nervous movements frequently opened to disclose a flaccid skin and a catholic charm hanging low about his neck a collar buttoned only at one end was adorned with a cravat that was not a cravat but only a strip of black ribbon that floated here and there about his throat his frock coat sine qua non of latin american respectability was gray with dust trousers unacquainted with the pressing board were spotted with mementos of laboratory accidents and the slender aristocratic shoes possessing in common three buttons had been worn completely heelless here in the bosom of his disdainful family he wore a greasy old cap later in the day i met him promenading under the portales of the plaza in the same costume but for the added glory of a stovepipe hat of at least twenty years of harried existence his tayar or workshop overlooking the main square was a chaos of odds and ends gathered by a man who had given his life chiefly to the study of physics and who was alternately tinkering at a score of inventions in the absence of a real source of supply his apparatus was almost entirely home-made or as he himself put it loja made a collection fashioned from cigar boxes string tin cans and whatever makeshifts fell his way resembling nothing so much as the playthings of some isolated but inventive farmer's boy a shoemaker's needle on the plan of a sewing machine shuttle that was designed to revolutionize the making of footwear had been constructed from the shell of a rifle cartridge of as plebeian material he had built a little transparent box to place above the needle of a phonograph to do away with the metallic sound of that instrument but in latin america fashion his phonograph was out of order and did not function another crude apparatus he pointed out as proof that a sphere can revolve on two axes at once a ball of yarn representing the earth 
was twirled by a tiny dynamo and at the same time given a rotary motion by a string belt, and so on through all the realms of physics, which he taught here in his tallar several times a week to the boys of the local colegio. The Loja made original of his most important invention was out of order, and I was not favored with a test of the celifono on which he had tinkered intermittently more than thirty years. His inventiveness did not confine itself to merely physical matters. Before I left, he pressed upon me a pamphlet of which he was the author. It was entitled The Virgin Maria in America before its discovery by Columbus, wherein the writer proved beyond question, to use his own words, that the Blessed Virgin was not an unknown personage in America when it was discovered by the Spaniards. Beginning a visionary journey in Canada, he descended step by step through all the Western Hemisphere, proving by shaky tradition by the doctored yarns of early missionaries, and by the personal lubrications that all the Indian tribes had the tradition of Adam and Eve, of the serpent and apple, of original sin, and of a god born of a virgin. The fact that the city of Loja had published this masterpiece fully describes its mentality. I had known him three or four days before the inventor took me into his confidence and whispered that the invention of the Celefono had been merely a means to an end, that he had taken it to New York and Europe in hopes of raising funds to pursue his really important invention, which he had thought on for forty years and almost perfected in his mind, though he had not yet begun its construction. This was a flying machine that is neither balloon nor aeroplane, perfectly safe and commercially practicable. As nearly as my unmechanical faculties grasped the situation from his elaborate explanation, it was a close replica of that Darius Green, whose fame has never reached this corner of the Andes. Fortunately, there is no building in Loja high enough to bring the inventor to serious grief, should he ever succeed in collecting the materials essential to the actual construction of this perfected child of his imagination. But his hope was still youthful, and he besought my advice as to how a poor inventor could get his masterpiece before the world without being despoiled of the fruits of his labors, as in the case of the Celefono by the practical businessmen of that great universe beyond his mountain-bounded horizon. I regretted my ignorance of any panacea for that condition. Carrion is but a type of those closet geniuses who live, toil, and fade away unknown in the dim recesses of the Andes, men, in some cases, who might have ranked high among modern inventors, writers, or artists, had their lot been cast in happier climes than in this leaden environment of impracticability, burdened by enervating superstitions, denied the simplest materials for their purposes in a land where even twine and wrapping paper are commonly unobtainable, and so lacking in that grasping self-assertiveness so necessary to front modern society successfully that even the scant fruits of their labors go to swell the ordinary swollen pockets of more practical men of the world, while they dream on, like this gray-haired boy, pottering among his home-made toys. End of chapter 8 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 9, Part 1 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 9, Part 1 The Wilds of Northern Peru. I had been a full half year in Ecuador when I turned my attention to the problem of getting out of it. 
that disintegration that tendency for neighboring countries to hold no communication between each other at which the american cannot but marvel in south america was here in full evidence ecuador seemed as completely cut off from the country just over her southern boundary as from europe the cura of Oña had assured me that the one way to reach peru from loja would be to walk to puerto bolivar on the coast take a costero to guayaquil then a big steamer to paita or pacasmayo only he who knows south american geography well can appreciate the unconscious humor of such advice even the rare lojanos who admitted it might be possible to go to peru by land asserted that i must walk to piura which would have been to cross a burning tropical desert far out of my way to that well-traveled coast i was purposely avoiding the government map of the province of loja was as faulty and scanty of information as the american one i carried it showed a road leading south from the provincial capital into that blue-black labyrinth of mountains through the villages of Villa Cabamba and Valladolid, all the town was agreed that no one could travel in these modern days along the remnants of the great military highway of the Incas, crawling along the crest of the Cordillera Oriental, through the regions for days utterly uninhabited. As well I knew that Prescott's hanging with bridges over awful chasms, were sure to be out of repair in these effeminate Latin American times, even when they ever existed. At length a few bold lajanos admitted that I might be able to push on to the frontier by way of Gonzanama, though they persisted in calling it a terrible undertaking, even for a man who claimed to have walked from Quito that route led far west of a line drawn through Huancabamba to Cajamarca, and there was nothing to show that it would connect with any trail beyond the frontier. The best I could do was hope that I might be able to struggle across to Ayavaca in Peru, where I could perhaps get Peruvian information. Then there came a complete division of opinion as to the road to Consanama and Loja split into two irreconcilable factions, the one contending that I should take the road due south from the west side of the Fossa, the other insisting that due west from the south side. In the end, they all washed their hands of the matter. The rainy season was nearing its height. Sure death lurked along a bandit-infested frontier. None but amphibious animals and crack-brained gringos would stir forth from the cozy little city. On the morning of April 20th, I finally took the south road. It climbed leisurely over the low interandean noodle, shutting in Loja's concave valley, and falling in where the hurried mountain stream raced with it all day, crossing its branches sometimes by one log bridges, more often by knee-deep fords. The few arrieros I met carried rusty old flintlocks, suggesting the dangers of the frontier. The huts along the way grew more and more rare, and degenerated from thick adobe walls to upright reeds carelessly slopped with mud. Beyond Malagatos, among its banana groves, where I spent the night on a plank bench in the casa cural of a young French priest who had already lost the habit of speaking anything but Spanish, the trail climbed relentlessly up through the scrub-wooded region as uninhabited as an undiscovered sphere. The afternoon was middle-aged before the world opened out again and gave a brief glimpse through the trees of Gonzanama, set out in three rows on a tiny plain untold depths below. Raging rains had torn and gullied the further slope until the five miles downward was like descending the ruins of a giant stairway. Gonzanama was in fiesta. Hundreds of near Indians and mestizos, with very little color in their garments, 
squatted about the church in Casa Cural. They were a people as simple and unsophisticated as children. It was Viernes Santo, Good Friday, and all the town gathered around to see me eat the meat a pious old woman served me with a shrug of her shoulders when I scorned her warning not to anger the saints and dispersed prophesying an early calamity to me on the road ahead when I arose apparently uninjured. The son of the Teniente Politico, in whose house I was the honored guest, in so far as their means made honoring possible, proved to be an old acquaintance, a second-year medical student of Quito, home on his vacation. He was already the chief practicing physician of the region. On his journey from the capital, he had performed a score of operations, among them one with a butcher knife for abscess of the liver. The room I occupied, which was also his place of consultation, the family parlor, the municipal offices, and his own sleeping quarters, was invaded by a constant stream of uncomplaining infirmities. Outside, the entire population marched in procession until midnight, attending a two-hour service in the adobe church, and wandered the three streets with throbbing tom-toms and the gaiety imbibed from bottles until the eastern horizon paled to gray. The practicing medical student did not take to his bed until four. An hour later he arose to set me on my way, forcing upon me with regal eloquence a can of salmon from Europe, your own land, to be opened only on Easter Sunday. Only those rare mortals who have jaunted cross country in the Andes can have any conception of the stone quarry heights I scaled, the dense, jungled, bottomless quebradas through which I tore my way, the brush tangled streams I forded, and the paths that faded out under my feet during the day. One of these last had dragged me remorselessly over every manner of ruggedness when, well on in the afternoon, it disappeared at the door of a mud-plastered hut. The trails of the Andes do not run merely from town to town, but from hobble to hobble, like foraging soldiers, giving the traveler a zigzag course that at least trebles the distance. I was prowling about this apparently unoccupied human kennel, striving to pick up the scent again, when I was set upon by three unusually large, aggressive curs, I did my best to drive them off with sticks and stones, but when there remained no other alternative, I drew my weapon and sent the largest to his happy hunting ground. Instantly a crashing of the brushes sounded high up in the jungled patch above, and the angry voice of an unseen countryman screamed in the dialect of the region, Scoundrel, you will pay me for my dog, Caramba! Crime is frequently immune, so near an international boundary, and I rounded the hillside cautiously, my cocked revolver in hand, but the bellowing of the invisible native was soon swallowed up behind me, and only the oppressive silence of the mountain solitude surrounded me once more. It was evident that I should not reach the frontier, perhaps not even shelter before dark, when at some distance off, in a setting of primeval forest solitude, I was astonished to catch sight of a large hacienda house, a gaunt, rambling building that suggested some starving creature lost in the wilderness. Almost as I reached it, a thunderstorm broke with a crash and set a hundred brooks tearing their way down the swift mountainside on which the building clung. The house was locked and unoccupied. Two Indian boys of eight and twelve were huddled under the protecting eaves of a half-ruined outbuilding across the cobbled yard. For a full hour they answered my every question with, El Padre no está, uttered in the dull, monotonous voice of some mechanical instrument. I could hold them at last to start a faggot fire on the earth floor of the outbuilding and to heat a pot of water, into which I dropped three eggs, 
they were prevailed upon to produce from a hiding place in the thatch and beat the mess up with the stick into a caldo de huevos. The smaller boy finally accepted a bribe to crawl out through a hole in the wall into the drenching downpour and snatch a half dozen cholos, ears of green corn, which I roasted or, more exactly, burned here and there over the scanty fire. Prowling about the hacienda house when the storm slackened, I found in one end a room that was locked with a piece of string. According to the now less speechless boys, it was the hacienda school, and in which, at certain seasons, an employee of the patron taught the male children of those peons who paid two dollars a year tuition. Like an old lumber room or garret in appearance, the place was furnished with an ancient desk and massive chair, as crude as if they had been carved out of tree trunks with dull machetes, and a dozen faded copy books and medieval inkwells hung about the wall. The schoolmaster evidently made his home here during the school season, for in the far end of the room stood a log-hewn bedstead with rough board flooring. Dusk was thickening into wet night when the Indian boys crept up to where I sat on the broad veranda, overlooking a far-reaching yet indistinct vista of wooded mountains and valleys, to assure me that I should be killed and robbed during the night. We are all so poor here that when a rich man like your grace passes, everyone tries to rob him, asserted the older, with unusual eloquence of his race. Here all people are robbers, as a book of this. It is only a few days since a traveler was killed down the valley there last month. I glanced over my travel-worn and bespattered form in vain for evidences of wealth so patent to other eyes. Yet I could not but recall the carcass of a dog a few miles back, and the golden weight of the band of my trousers reminded me that several evil-eyed fellows had halted a while under the hacienda eaves during the height of the storm and slipped away sometime during the night. Moreover, the prophesied destruction of all Ecuador by earthquake was at hand, for tomorrow would be, if it ever came, Easter Sunday. Plainly, all the sights pointed to an exciting night. My small faith in prophecy did not, however, hinder me from making sure that my revolver was well-oiled and hung on a bedpost. The window of the schoolroom, high above the ground, but only a few feet from the roof of an old ruin, was heavily barred with bars of wood. The massive double-leaf plank doors had no lock. The log-like pupil's bench, topped by the old colonial teacher's chair, piled against it, however, promised racket enough to wake me in case of attempted intrusion. I found several old sacks to serve as mattresses, and stripping off my sweat-heavy day garb, slipped into the woolen union suit and socks that made my sleeping costume. However much I might reduce my load in my indifference to outward appearance, I would not have been without this complete change for the night if I had had to make two trips to fetch them. I had no matches, and the boys had been unable to produce a candle. The rain had died down, and everywhere utter stillness reigned. I rolled up in my poncho and fell asleep. A suspicious noise woke me in what was probably a few minutes. Scores of mice were scampering over the uneven floor, squeaking hilariously. By the time I had grown accustomed to the sound, I had dozed off again. From a chaotic dream of crowded and varied incidents, I came gradually to the consciousness of a rattling at the wooden window bars. I sprang across the floor and peered out into the unfathomable mountain night, but I have never been certain whether the sound I heard was the hurrying of bare feet in soft mud and the tail of a whisper, or the creature of a startled imagination. With thirty half-perpendicular miles in my legs, I was in no mood 
to sit up waiting for trouble, and making sure once more that my revolver was within easy reach, I set the bed floor creaking again. My next consciousness was of a dawn bright with the promise of an unclouded day peering in upon me through the window bars, and of the Indian boys whispering through the barricaded door to know whether I was still alive and ready for the two raw eggs they had collected. An erratic mountain path that it was not easy to distinguish from the beds of mountain brooks and generally deep in mud, clambered without apparent direction into dripping wet wooden mountain ranges, sometimes plunging headlong down through bottomless valleys, sometimes flanking them in enormous horseshoe curves. How I pushed on all the morning without getting lost, I do not know, for certainly there were a score of times when there was no plausible excuse for picking the right one of a half dozen paths. I sighted several miserable huts, and once a village, but these were never near the trail. And when I decided to apply for food at the next one, another of those sudden changes of climate left the dripping forested mountains behind me, and underfoot was desert dry, a world which even the hardy dwellers of two decrepit, knock-kneed huts had long since abandoned. In southern Ecuador and northern Peru, the Andes break up and all but disintegrate. There are still plenty of mountains, but, true to their Latin American environment, they lack teamwork and do not stick together sufficiently to give the traveler footing upon them. Directly before me, Ecuador fell unfathomably away to the Macará, like auburn hair across a painted landscape, while beyond, to appearances unattainable, Peru lay piled pell-mell into the southern sky. It was as if the carpenter of the universe had said, Let here be the dividing line between two distrusting nations, and had smote the earth with his mightiest tool. Over all the scene was a sun-baked, utterly uninhabited silence, as of some valley of desolation from which all life had forever fled. The trail down which I jolted had exploded into a score of barely visible paths that spread in every direction over the drear furnace-hot hills. It seemed as if, once near the frontier, every traveler either dashed blindly forward to get quickly across it unseen, or lost his courage and fled back to the interior. I set a due course for the thread-like river almost directly below. At high noon, my every joint jarred loose, I stood at last on the extreme edge of Ecuador, the red dish-brown waters of the Macará lapping at my blistered feet, and on every hand a blazing, utterly unpeopled desert with nowhere the vestige of track or trail. The river, nearly a quarter mile wide, swollen with rains from above, raged swiftly by, a barrier of unknown possibilities, its surface covered everywhere with ripples, suggested that it was less deep than broad. I piled my baggage on the shore and, stripping to the waist, waded in. The powerful current all but swept me off my feet, and the water quickly reached my upper garments. I returned to strip entirely, strapped my revolver around my chest, and, picking a stout stick from the undergrowth, fought my way inch by inch to the opposite shore but I had to go back to Ecuador for my possessions. It required five crossings, trusting only a few of them at a time to the treacherous current, and more than an hour of unremitting vigilance before I had landed my bedraggled belongings at last on the shores of Peru, more forlorn than at the landing of Pizarro and his fellow adventurers. By careful calculation, checked by native record, I was 466 miles south of Quito and 630 from the Colombian border. Under some barbed bushes, I picked a sand burr spot 
as nearly shaded as could be found along the desert bank, and having shaved that I might enter the new Republican disguise, dipped up a can of coffee-colored macara and fell upon the lead-heavy rapadura the Indian boys had sold me, and the can of salmon which I had preserved for Easter Sunday only by the exercise of sternest will-power. It was three-fourths full of a pale, watery, soup-like liquid in which floated dejectedly a few small lumps of what had once long ago been carp or dogfish. Luckily, there was a difference in the size of the cans so that I could generally tell whether I was drinking salmon or the macara. Then, when I had written up my notes, I proceeded to turn the meal into a banquet in comparison by reading that chapter of Prescott recounting what Pizarro and his fellow tramps did not find to eat on their first landing. Being far from mortal ken in an uncharted crack of the earth, it may be fancied that I should have been eager to hurry on. Somehow, now that I had reached Peru, there came over me a languorous indifference to further advance. The sun was low before I rose, and turning my attention to the task of discovering my whereabouts, I found myself gazing along a dreary, sheer mountain wall, grown only with sparse, bristling cactus shrubs that refused a handhold, seeking a place to insert my toes and start southward. Leisurely, but decidedly, I grasped the first possibility, and for an hour or more might have been seen, had there been eyes to see me, playing goat among the face of calcined hills that fell so abruptly into the racing macara that they came a score of times uncomfortably close to taking me with them. During that hour I advanced fully five hundred yards, in a direction I did not care to go, gathering cactus thorns at every step, and ended down at the edge of the river again, exactly as far into Peru as when I had begun the struggle upward an hour before. Here were a few yards of level shore, and when I had drunk the stream perceptibly lower, I made my way along until I came upon a labyrinth of cow paths. That one, which more nearly agreed with my compass, turned due east, and crawled off through the brushes, as if fearful of being followed and left me standing pathless in a maze of barren cactus-grown hills. Tearing my way over them by dead reckoning, now struggling to a thorn-barricaded summit from which stretched vistas of more thorny jungled hills, now crashing with lacerated skin down into another desert valley, where a few wild jackasses browsed on scanty leaves of bristling bushes, I surmounted again and again the same identical scene of dreary nothingness as far as the eye could see beyond. The region was waterless. Evidently I was doomed to suffer that hell of the desert traveler, an all-night thirst, for dusk was already thickening. The very leaves of the invariably thorny bushes were shriveled and brown. Even the air seemed wholly devoid of moisture. Then, suddenly, as I tore my way to another tangled summit, there sounded faintly, far off to the right, the sweetest music known to the tropical wanderer, the babble of running water. I plunged down through the militant vegetation to where a clear little river was hurrying down along a bed several times too large for it, to join the parent Macara. Enormous boulders and tumbled rocks bordered the stream. In the tail of the day I stumbled along up it, jealous of being separated from it, as from a being beloved. And when night called a halt, I stacked my belongings and spread my poncho on a stony bank with its prattle in my ear, 
that its sound should not escape unheard during the night. The brigands reputed to infest the frontier had faded away into the nebulous realms of fiction. I would almost have invited robbery for an opportunity to inquire my whereabouts, but the stream muffled my movements and the munching of the lump of crude sugar, and when I had listened a while to the singing of the tropical night and watched the fireflies coming with their lanterns to look me over, I fell asleep, uncovered, and but slightly dressed, so warm was this sunken chasm of the Andes. The fate of serving as banquet board to platoons of tropical insects robbed me of the sound sleep the lullaby of the stream should have afforded. Dawn found me emerging from a dip, and when I had disciplined a stomach that seemed sure to have its plaints unheeded for the rest of the day, at least, by eating bit by bit the remaining lump of rapadura, I took up the serious problem of how to get somewhere else. The ghost of a path crossed the stream not far above, but soon played the stale joke of fading to a goat trail, and then into thin air, and left me to tear my way back to the stream. This, I noted, came down more or less from the south, and I set out along it, determined to push as far up country as possible. For several hours I had explored my way more or less southward, crossing the wandering stream every few yards by goat-like jumps from rock to rock, when I was suddenly startled by the sight of human beings, a sun-scorched Indian woman in some remnants of garments, a child astride her back, a boy at her heels, appeared from nowhere in the boulder-strewn riverbed. With a laconic greeting, she led the way upstream. Once she took to the jungled plain beside it and sent the boy up a tree to knock down some half-green oranges. Down in the riverbed again, the god of the Incas poured down his perpendicular rays like molten lead. At length, the woman mumbled a few words in a monotone, pointed out a faint path up the face of the eastern sand cliff in which hundreds of screaming parakeets had their nests, grasped the coin I held out to her, and glided noiselessly away into the wilderness. The path disappeared even sooner than I had expected. I clambered up several more perpendicular miles only to descend and lose myself in a jungle-tangled quebrada. Inch by inch I tore my way through the densest wilderness of briars and brambles, struggling to release the bundle on my shoulders after I had myself escaped ever on the watch for snakes and wild animals. Without real food for days, burning with tropical thirst, my hand-to-hand -hand conflict with the jungle was near a deadlock when there appeared far above me three scattered Indian huts. A precipitous ravine armed to the teeth lay between. I dived down into it to emerge almost an hour afterward, torn, bleeding, and smeared with earth, at the edge of another and hitherto unseen jungled chasm, backed by a nearly impassable patch of uncultivated sugar cane. My legs were as ropes of sand when I approached an Indian in his hut but I set up a stern outward appearance to suggest what might happen if he refused me food and drink. Though expressionless as all his race, he proved unusually tractable, and soon brought out to where I sat in the shade against the eastern hut wall a steaming gourdful of the ordinarily despised yucca and what seemed to be very young pork. I had half emptied the dish before a bone too tiny for such an origin caused me to look up inquiringly. Qui, said the Indian laconically. Though I had often heard them squeaking about the earth floors of wayside huts, it was my first taste of guinea pig. To this day, 
the chief meat of the Andean Indian. I think it was not entirely due to my prolonged fast that I found it more palatable than pork, but small, distressingly small, even after the Indian's mate had added several choclos tandas, steaming rolls of crushed green corn wrapped in husks. The Camino Real to Ayabaca lay in plain sight across the gully, and the town, according to the Indians, but was two leagues off. But the Andean traveler must learn not to let his hopes grow buoyant and playful, and to remember that two leagues from the lips of an aboriginal is apt to mean a hard day's travel as an hour's stroll. Never once did the royal highway pause in its climb into the lofty range ahead. My spirits rose and fell with each opportunity to inquire the distance. Within two hours I had been answered, Two leagues. Six leagues. Four hours. Ya no está lejos. Todavía está redita. Ah, it is far away, patron, and more than two tambos. A tambo, from the Inca word for inn or rest house, seems to mean about half a day's travel. Sunset found me far up on a great bleak tableland, a rolling broken world, wherein was no suggestion of a town, stretching away on all sides, as far as the eye could reach, even in the transparent air of these heights. Beyond, the trail passed close to a large tiled house, where a barefooted man of Indian type, though white of skin as myself, answered my request for posada by silently spreading a small square of cloth on a log under the projecting eaves, and went on with his task of mending with an adze the crooked stick that served him as a plow. An enameled sign on the house wall announcing it as an estancia de sal was the only outward evidence that I had left Ecuador behind. In Peru, salt, like tobacco, is a government monopoly, sold only in licensed shops. Near me, several thinly attired women were bawling newly dyed yarn and children were sprawling about the ground with goats, chickens, and yellow curs. A heavy rain was falling. Uncomfortable as was my position, I could do nothing else than keep it. It was not that the family was indifferent or hard-hearted, merely that I had reached what, to their apathetic way of life, was a happy state, sitting on a log under the eaves, and it would hardly have been possible to explain to them that something else would have been needed for perfect comfort. The man was plainly of kindly temperament, with some education of a sort, yet I was left to squat on the log until black night had settled down, without even an opportunity to remove the outer evidence of the gaunt and strenuous days behind. Well after dark, a half-Indian girl set before me a little wooden box, covered it with a cloth, and served me an egg soup, followed by a hot stew of yucca and beans. Gradually the family advanced from self-conscious silence to Latin garrulousness. By this time I had been invited inside and given one of the several bare divans of reeds set into the mud walls. The conversation I had sought in vain to set going during the first hours ran on unchecked until long after I would have been asleep. A dense fog enveloping the mountainside turned to rain as I waded away in the morning. Only by waiting hours could I have gotten anything more than the aguita, a cup of hot water with a bit of rapadura melted in it, on which I set out for whatever the new day had in store. I had only half suspected the height of the world before me. For hours I strained upward into ever cooler green mountains, reeking mud underfoot. With some travel, yet always a sense of solitude 
even just over the next knoll beyond a passing group. Once I met a blind traveler picking his way quietly with a stick along the slippery descending mountain road. By noon I was far up where the rivers are born, fog and clouds hiding all but the immediate world about me. All the hunger of the past days seemed to have accumulated until I felt like some starving beast of prey ready to pounce pitilessly on whatever fell my way. Just beyond the Abra, the cold fog swept past at the summit of the climb, and I came upon a house of considerable size. Half skating, half wading, down to the door, I found an old and a young woman of much Indian blood swatting in the earth-floored kitchen near a large steaming kettle over the familiar three-stone cooking stove of the Andes. No hay absolutamente nada, they replied unfeelingly. I stepped in, swung off my load, and showing Peruvian silver, announced that I had come to stay until they had sold me some food. The women sat motionless, with that passiveness the Indian so often depends upon to drive off importunate persons. I offered any reasonable price for one of the chickens wandering about the room. The older woman mumbled that clumsy, threadbare lie, son anels, they belong to someone else. To my suggestion of roasted plantains, she answered that she was ill. When I inquired the contents of the kettle, both took refuge in the exasperating silence that is the last weapon of their race. A certain amount of patience is a virtue. Too much is an asininity. I picked the kettle off the fire, raked from the ashes one of the roast and plantains, found a tin plate and a wooden spoon stuck behind a sapling beam of the mud wall, and retired against the block of wood on which I had been seated. The pair watched me in stolid silence. When I had finished the plate, the younger one rose to carry off the kettle. I requested her, in the voice of an ill-tempered general commanding a widely scattered regiment, to leave it where it was until I had had my fill, and the pair fled precipitously from the room, flinging over their shoulders some threat of calling the man of the house. I knew the Andean Indian too well to fear trouble, but turned my face to the door and loosened my revolver in its holster. The kettle contained a boiling hot stew of beans and corn, sufficient to have fed a dozen men. Six of them, might still have feasted on what was left when I tossed a soul, easily four times what the whole kettle was worth, into the empty plate and marched on down the reeking mountainside. Had I but known it, however, I might have avoided resorting to force. Barely a mile beyond appeared Ayavaca, a dismal and orderless collection of gloomy adobe tiled houses sprawled on the edge of what evidently would have been a great valley on a clear day, and literally running with red mud. I skated down into the plaza, and marching into the open office of the sub-prefect, sent the bedraggled soldier on guard to announce my arrival. A gaping group of awkward, mud-bespattered mountaineers quickly surrounded me, but with them arrived several white men in modern garb, one of whom announced himself sub-prefect of the province of Ayavaca, entirely at my service. I displayed my American and Ecuadorian documents, requesting him to take official cognizance of my entry into Peru, and expressed my august desire to rent for a day or two a room with a bed, table, chair, and water supply, Experience teaches the Andean traveler to specify in detail and to be handed the menu card. Here you are in your own house, replied the sub-prefect, assuming the attitude of a sovereign receiving credentials 
from an ambassador. You have only to ask. The cloth was soon spread on the official government desk, and less than an hour after requisitioning rations in the mountain hut, I was sitting with the provincial commander and his assistants before an abundance of native viands that included even the luxury of wheat bread. For I had chanced to arrive just in time for the banquet offered by the town to its new ruler in honor of his inauguration. But alas, I gained nothing in comfort by coming to Peru. The available chamber in my own house proved to be a den adjoining the sub-prefect's quarters, the provincial harness and lamp room. It was only by much cajolery that I finally got it furnished with a narrow five-foot plank bench and a pair of ragged horse blankets, but at least I could read by night such literature as I chanced to have with me by depriving the town of one of its few street lamps when a soldier came to distribute them in the evening. Life was dismal at best in Ayavaca. The cold and clammy downpour continued unabated. While I developed my exposed films in water supplied through an eaves trough, the population blocked the doorway of my room, making every exit and entry like boarding a subway train in rush hour. There were no real shops in the dreary mountain town, but only gloomy mud huts where a few products were unofficially sold. The one sidewalk was taken up by drenched and downcast asses, forcing pedestrians to splash through the unpaved street. The products of the soil were not high-priced. A guinea pig, next to children the most plentiful product of the town, cost five cents, a live chicken fifteen, but it was always easier to pay the price than to find the chicken for sale. Commerce was on the friend-to-friend -friend basis, and he who would purchase must be well acquainted with the seller or a protege of the all-powerful sub-prefect. Only liquor was to be had in abundance. The provincial officials, from my host down to the village schoolmaster, were more or less intoxicated from mid-morning to midnight. In that state, frankness protruded through their racial courtesy and they were divided in their assertions between the opinion that I was a spy sent out by my government and the conviction that I had been offered some colossal prize for covering the world on foot. It was with difficulty that I avoided sinking into the general intoxication. Whenever two or three are gathered together in Peru, it is the custom for one of the group to fill a glass from the inevitable bottle and Peruvian arguarente is no harmless nectar. Then ask permission to drink to the health of Tal Fulano on his right. Muchas gracias, says Tal Fulano, and proceeds to drink next, from the same glass, the health of his nearest companion. And so on round and round the circle to infinity and complete insobriety. The inexperienced gringo who fails in the etiquette of this custom, whatever the number of rounds, is looked upon with much the same contempt as the American who lets his saloon companions set him up repeatedly without offering to do so himself, and runs the risk of having an incensed sub-prefect too far gone in frankness turn upon him and invite him to make his home elsewhere. Every minute of the day, following my arrival, it rained, slackening somewhat at rare intervals, only to begin again with a roar that sounded like an avalanche down a nearby mountainside. Twenty-four hours later, my films were as wet as when first hung up. Water and mud invaded even our minds. Rivers of liquid raced down every street across the broad, half-cobbled plaza. Not once. During the day did the eye catch a hint of the great valley on the edge of which Ayavaca is perched. 
The few residents forced to go out of doors wore suecos, wooden clog overshoes, something like the rainy day footwear of the Japanese that increased the wearer's height by a half foot or more. The majority huddled in their dreary mud houses, crowding into the low doorways to stare at me when I passed, commenting aloud on my raison d'etre. The postmaster of Ayavaca was a comely young woman of considerable English blood. Her office scattered promiscuously about the baked mud dwelling of her parents. I had concluded to mail the films and notebooks on hand rather than risk their loss of destruction in what promised to be difficult going ahead and having ransacked the town for the necessary wrapping paper and tied the package with government tape i presented it for registry it seemed better to make a clear breast of the matter than to risk the pandoric curiosity of the ayavaca postal system and i explained that while the content was of vast value to me and the future history of Peru. It was of none whatever to anyone else. Stamps were at length found in the right-hand drawer of the hand sewing machine on the earth floor. A native ink was brewed over the faggot fire in the kitchen where the imprinting of the official seal dug out from a chest of stockings and feminine small clothes. And after a social call of more than an hour's duration, I shook hands with the entire family, twice with the postmistress herself, and left with her repeated reassurance ringing in my ears. No tengo cuidado. Lose no sleep over it, senor. It will go safely to Europe and the United States without being lost. Some time after dark, the rain, having at last left off with sullen grace, I was limbering up my legs for an early start in the morning when I chanced to pass the Correro. The door was closed, but this was one of the few houses of Ayavaca boasting a window, though without glass, unknown to most towns of the Andes, barricaded with wooden bars. Inside, gathered about an apathetic candle, sat the postmistress and her entire family, the open package in her lap, passing my films from hand to hand and puzzling in vain over my notebooks with a leisureliness that showed they had settled down to make the most of a long evening's entertainment. My first impulse to snatch open the door was succeeded by a reflection. Knowing the extreme sensibility of these Andean townsmen, I suspected that, were my discovery known to her, the postmistress would be more apt, out of pique, to lose or destroy the cause of her undoing before I could recover them from government possession. I swallowed the impulse and splashed on through the night. Months afterward, I had word that the package reached the addressee in perfect condition, though in disorder. With little more information than that the next town I must hunt out of the wilderness was Huancabamba. I slid down the red slopes from Ayavaca, now and then glancing back to wonder what excuse even Spaniards could have considered sufficient to found a town in such a location. The sub-prefect, far from providing the Indian guide and carrier he had so often promised in his cups, had bade me adios from his bed with the cheering assurance that i was bound soon to lose my way and perish my load was several pounds heavier than on my arrival for i had added to it not only blocks of rapadura and seventeen loaves of bread ayavaca size but a chunk of fresh beef even my money had become a burden again for instead of the bills of ecuador my road change must now be carried in silver. The semi-monthly daily of Ayavaca had appeared the evening before with an astonishing history of the town's distinguished guest, honoring me with the title of that intrepid explorer, a designation which the sub-prefect made use of 
in his official orders to his subordinates along the way, and which, copied from one document to another, was destined to cling to me all the length of Peru. My eye never fell upon it that I did not recall the native dishes I was so often forced to delve into during the journey. Gibbon asserts that the civilization of a country may best be gauged by the number and condition of its roads. If so, Peru is sunk in the depths of barbarism. The Incas swung bridges of widths along the great military highways. The Spaniards built some of stone. The modern inhabitants of this region merely let their roads grow up of themselves like brambles in an uncultivated field. At a mountain summit beyond a raging mountain current, in which I all but lost my possessions, immensely gray curtains of fog left me only instinct and my compass by which to choose between the faint sandy paths that split and forked at every opportunity. The trail I happened to take zigzagged quickly down into a bed of snarling mountain streams between sheer rock walls choked with tough, thorny undergrowth, along which it sprang back and forth from rock to rock, dragging me in pursuit through an endless tangle of vegetation, often by vaulted tunnels, through which I could only tear my way by creeping on all fours. By dusk it had widened sufficiently to give the path foothold along one bank, and when darkness brought me to a halt I found space under a scraggly tree to spread my poncho. In my pack the seventeen loaves of bread had amalgamated with the crude sugar and formed a coating about the boiled beef. I stowed away in my hat for safe keeping the few more or less whole loaves and fell upon the pulp that remained. It was a dry meal for all that rain. Though the stream close below sounded tantalizingly in my ears all night through, an impenetrable jungle cut me off from it, and only the few wild lemons I had picked along the way ministered to the afterthirst of a long day's tramp. The pleasure of dressing at dawn in garments still dripping wet was enhanced by the discovery that a colony of red ants appointing a night shift had formed a breadline from my hat to their neighboring village and reduced me to a breakfast of river water where the trail again touched the stream a mile beyond. Three solitary hours later I came upon a miserable little shack of open work reeds and upright poles topped by thatch. On the ground beside it, a slatternly female was cooking for several horsemen. Two rivers ahead were reported greatly swollen, and I accepted an invitation to wait and accompany a youth bound for his employer's hacienda. Wait I did, a full three hours amid the usual fauna of an Andean hut, while the travelers took final leave of each other a score of times in as many rounds of aguardiente de caña, a native concoction of distilled sugar cane, each swallow of which is, to an ordinary mortal, not unlike a sudden blow on the head with a spiked war club. In the end, a calabash of yucca stew rewarded my patience. The youth staggered aboard his shaggy horse at last, and we descended quickly into a dense, damp, hot valley with a broad, swift river. I mounted the horse's rump to cross two arms of the stream and a stretch of swamp between, in constant peril of tobogganing down the animal's tail, my load dragging heavily from my shoulders. The moment I slipped off on dry land, the youth, still distinctly under the influence of concentrated sugar cane, demanded a peseta for his services. Long, hot hours we marched along thick jungled riverbeds in narrow, fertile valleys enclosed by sterile, though green-tinted mountainsides bristling with cactus. The trail 
panted frequently over a steep desert hillock, the crupper of the animal saving me much time in disrobing at a dozen smaller brooks, between which my companion rode at my heels in gloomy silence. At a larger stream he collected a real and announced that the fee for crossing a river ahead would be another peseta. As the effects of permitting the unbridled drinking of his health wore off, he recalled the fiambre in his saddlebags and paused to offer me, with a patronizing air befitting a horseman toward a man afoot, a handful of parched corn and a rag of sun-dried beef. Gradually he became less taciturn and then garrulous and gay. He was by no means a peon, being assistant mayordomo of the estate towards which we were headed, and even wore shoes. Yet when I photographed him, it required considerable explanation to give him any clear conception of what the result would be of pointing the foolish little machine at him. Is su aposento donde esta? Where is your lodging? In other words, native land, he inquired. When I had answered, he rode fully ten minutes in puzzled silence. Then he called out over his shoulder, Ese país suyo, uh, ese Estados Unidos, uh, es pueblo o hacienda? That country of yours, is it a village or a plantation? The world as he knew it, and his knowledge was on a par with that of thousands of dwellers of the Andes, was made up of those two divisions. We left a curving river, labored over a divide, and descended to the Aranza, a furlong wide, roaring angrily. At sight of it, the youth regretted the bargain he'd made, fearing his horse could not breast the swift current under the weight of both of us, and suggested that I strip and swim, letting him carry my clothing and bundle. There seemed to be no way to avoid risking the wealth in my trousers. But these simple countrymen of the Andes are commonly more reliable in matters of trust than appearances suggest, and a well-directed bullet would avert any tendency to decamp. I strapped my revolver about my head and plunged in for a ten-minute struggle with the current, but it was not without relief that I landed beside the exhausted horse and regained my possessions. We were already within the territory of the Hacienda San Pablo, though still miles from the dwelling. On all sides, as far as the eye could strain, the river valley and the mountains above, were unbroken wildernesses, utterly uninhabited. Yet the region was rich in produce. The cherimoya, that vegetable ice cream of the tropics, hung in carloads from the trees. Small but compact and juicy wild lemons carpeted the trail. Parrots and screaming bands of parakeets flitted in and out of guayaba and sapote trees. Here and there the dense green dome of a mango tree shouldered its way up through its punier fellows of the forest. It was nearing dusk, and I was nearing exhaustion under my load and the pitiless tropical sun of seven unbroken hours of swift, rough tramping, when my companion pointed out far ahead where the wall of the central cordillera shut off the horizon, a red dot in the green immensity, the Hacienda House. Black night had fallen when we reached the half-constructed building, and we stumbled on for some time more before we came upon the rambling thatched ruin in which the owner still lived. He was Eduardo Mendina, once a law student in the University of San Marcos of Lima a sane, well-read, earnest man, contrasting strangely with the uncouth countrymen about him. His wife, a handsome Limeña, was the first woman of education I had so far seen in rural South America. This extraordinary Latin American couple, noting swarms of lawyers that vegetate 
in provincial capitals, had renounced the uninspiring flesh pots of the cities and purchasing for a song some twenty-five square leagues of semi-tropical solitude, had come to start life anew in this wilderness with the shaggy world piled up on all sides and set their race a much-needed example. Here was such a welcome as the wilderness traveler often dreams, but seldom attains. Not merely did they offer the accommodation Andean custom requires of all haciendados to furnish travelers, each according to his caste, but their hospitality was genuine and active. The adobe lean-to into which I was led for the astonishing Andean purpose of washing up before a supper, had not only a real bed, mattress, and all, on springs of split bamboo, but the first sheets and pillows and suggestion of civilized comfort I had seen in Peru. It did not require the remainder that the morrow was Sunday and Medina's assertion that they were famished for civilized conversation to make me accept his invitation to prolong my stay. My companion of the day never recovered from his astonishment at seeing the patron seat at his own table and treat me as an equal, a man who traveled on foot, and as often as I caught his eye among the group that hovered about the door all evening, he gazed at me in a manner that seemed to implore me not to mention the reals he had collected under the impression that I was a mere man and not a caballero. End of chapter 9, part 1 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 9, part 2 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 9, Part 2 The Wilds of Northern Peru. Fertile tracts of valleys and mountains twenty five miles square can be bought in this section of Peru for two hundred and fifty dollars. Yet this does not mean that wealth awaits the purchaser. Faltan brazos, as the Peruvian puts it, arms are lacking. The scanty population has no stimulus to exertion in a region where nature supplies their simple wants almost without labor, and to Medina life was a constant struggle for employees. In days of fiesta when money was needed to pay the priest or celebrate a festival, many came to contract their services and accept an advance, but with no representative of government at hand there was no means of forcing them to do the work for which they had been prepaid. Some labored languidly and intermittently a few weeks a year, none more than half the days that were not sacred to some festival and general drunkenness. On the hacienda were scattered scores of arrendatarios, native families who rent a patch of ground on which to build a hut and plant a bit of yucca and corn, with the right to pasture a few cattle on the estate, all for a yearly rental of two dollars, which was commonly as hard to collect as labor. The almost total lack of transportation gave no market for any excess of produce, and here was the extraordinary case of a university-educated man and wife owning what would be with us an entire county living a hand-to-mouth existence, very little above abject poverty. Oranges, which the owner asserted he would be only too happy to sell at five cents a hundred, rotted under the trees faster than the hogs could eat them. Mangoes lay where they fell, and the splendid churamoya was a mere worthless wild fruit no one took the trouble to gather, except as, perhaps, personal appetite prompted. The sugar cane they succeeded in raising they were glad to get any price for. After it had been squeezed in trapiches, crude presses run by hand, and the huarapo boiled down into blocks of rapadura and wrapped in the banana leaves. 
most of it was turned into aguardiente that could occasionally be sent to town my postal experience in ayavaca recalled to medina one of his own before they left lima to take up their newly acquired residence the couple had found there were two post offices at ayavaca and pacapampa about equal distance from it two days on muleback it chanced that senora medina had ordered her modas feminas sent to ayavaca while her husband gave pacapampa as his address to the subscription department of the daily el comercio after the first few numbers only one or two copies of the newspaper adorned the weekly mail bag of the hacienda la senora also noted that she was not receiving her fashion journal regularly the hacendado started an investigation he found that the comely postmistress of ayavaca had recently acquired a considerable reputation as an authority on up-to-date fashions in pacapampa he discovered that the government mail services was in the hands of an old man unusually well versed in the politics of the day husband and wife wrote to lima ordering el comercio sent to ayavaca and the moras feminas by way of pacapampa since then both had received their respective journals as regularly as transportation conditions in these primitive regions made reasonable you have no inconvenience in writing asked my host as we set out on horseback to visit the estate on sunday not at all senor then i shall furnish you a mount to juan cabamba he announced i declined it seemed foolish to besmirch my long unbroken record afoot but he insisted on at least sending a peon to carry my baggage and serve as guide and actually kept his promise it dawned raining as they say in the andes but the peon assigned the task because his rent was in arrears was already astride a good saddle horse when i stepped out into the storm another debtor had been ordered to furnish a boiled chicken the cook a bag of rice with few respites we zigzagged all day up into the cordillera central ever vaster views of the valleys about san pablo opening out although advancing little except upward relieved of my load i seemed to have wings and in the steeper places had often to wait for the horsemen barely a hut and not a traveler did we pass during the day which ended with a perpendicular climb to a miserable mud hovel on a high and wintry pampa alone accommodation might have been refused me but my companion was distantly related to the two crabbed females who with their tawny flock of half-naked children existed in this cheerless spot and i was passively suffered to remain in their mud den where the usual faggot fire was blazing under an ancient and enormous kettle set on three stones i sat down on a sort of short trough with six-inch legs one of the chairs of this region when any exist and some time later we were served in bowls made of gourds a boiling hot mixture of potatoes habas and some mountain mystery still unsatisfied i drew out my bag of rice valgame dios if the lazy cook of the hacienda san pablo had not delivered it to me uncooked i followed the custom of the place and circumstances by presenting the woman with enough of the grain to feed her entire family for a day or two and then asked that a bowlful be cooked for me no hay manteca there is no lard mumbled one of the females eureka i cried then for once i can have it cooked as it should be there is no other kettle said the woman in a faint monotone projecting her lips toward that containing the stew i will wait until it is empty i replied cheerfully with no other excuse to offer she took refuge in silence 
An hour passed before I broke in again. And the rice, senora? I suggested. No hay manteca. She repeated in the same dull monotone, and the conversation went on again around the same vicious circle. For more than an hour I coaxed and cajoled for a single harsh or loud word to these unwashed mountain dwellers can undo a day's careful pleading. As constant dripping of water in time wears away even stone, so my incessant return to the subject at length became even more painful than the stirring from their customary lethargy. The younger female rose languidly and took from the wall in a dark corner a perfectly sound kettle just suited to the purpose, and after deftly stealing about half of it, set to boiling what I had kept for myself. The adjoining den had not only an earth floor, but the hillside had not been leveled before building. The peon spread a saddle blanket and one of his own ponchos for me as solicitously as a valet preparing his master's quarters, yet in as impersonal a manner as he might have herded his sheep into their corral for the night. With this protection and my own garments wrapped about my head, I passed a tolerable night, virtually on the ridge of the central range of the Andes. My peon, the two women, several children, two half-Indian youths, who had arrived long after dark, at least six dogs, and a score of guinea pigs, all slept in the same room. All, that is, except the quees, who spent most of it squeaking about in the dark and now and then running over my prostrate form. On the bleak rolling pampa of sere yellow bunch grass, dotted by a few shaggy wild cattle, across which howled wintry winds, I was not uncomfortable afoot. But the peon from the Tierra Caliente of his native valley was blue-lipped and chattering with cold, even with his head through several heavy blankets and a scarf about his face. I was passing back over the Cordillera Central for the first time since Hayes and I had traversed it by the Quindío Pass. Not far below the Arctic summit we sighted the Huancabamba River. Born a few leagues to the north, its broad, swift, sloping valley walls spotted with little green chakras and gradually dropping into summer again. Trees grew up about us. Birds began once more to sing. Cultivated fields, shut in by cactus hedges, bordered the trail. When at last we sighted the town of Huancabamba from far off, the peon halted and asked to be allowed to turn back. He seemed to fancy his services had been chiefly those of guide instead of baggage carrier. I refused to take up my burden again, merely for what I took to be a whim to be back lolling in the shade of his own mango tree. It was not until later that I realized that, like most country youths of his class in Peru, he dreaded entering the provincial capital, lest he be held and forced to serve in the army. The swift Huancabamba River we crossed astride the peon's horse, though not both at a time. When I had dismounted on the further bank, my companion called the animal back by a peculiar sound, half whistle, half cluck, and not long afterward we clattered into the famous city of Huancabamba. Once dismissed, the peon left town at once, though darkness was already at hand. Medina had insisted that I pay him nothing, as he owed the hacienda more than two years' rent, namely, nearly four dollars. On the map, Huancabamba seemed of about the size and importance of Philadelphia. On the ground, it is a moribund mud village in a half-sterile hollow between barren, towering mountains. Historically, it is famous. Prescott assures us that Huancabamba was large, populous, and well-built, many of its houses of solid stone. A river which passed through the town had a bridge 
over which ran a fine Inca highroad. How times do change! Officially, to be sure, it is still a city, but a city in this region is a place where bread is made, as those who wear shoes are white and those who wear baita are cholos or Indians. Picturesqueness of costume there was none, this having disappeared near Cuenca along with the Quichua tongue. Indians of pure race and distinctive garb had been rare south of Sarajuro. Here was still plenty of Indian blood, only in the veins of civilized mestizos. It is not far from the watershed of the Andes. The town of Guaramaca, just up on the ridge of the cordillera above, has a church, one side of the roof of which sends its waters to the Pacific and the other to the Atlantic. There was no suggestion of hotel. The subprefect studied my papers in great curiosity, with half the town looking over his shoulder, before he answered my most important query with, Ah, it is impossible today, on such short notice, but tomorrow. I need it today, I protested, knowing it was only a question of insisting to overcome the racial apathy. And then I will give you my bed and sleep on the floor, cried the subprefect. In that pompous moment, with a large delegation of Huanca Bambinos looking on, no doubt he would, but such Andean self-sacrifice quickly fades away once the limelight is switched off. I prefer to rent a room of my own, I persisted. Ah, now that is impossible, but tomorrow... I bowed my way out, throwing over my shoulder the information that I would go down to the bank of a river and sleep in the ground. It would be softer, and there were bathing facilities. Horror spread over all the faces. A man, an estranero, who came with the recommendations of the great governments. Impossible! The city of Huancabamba could not permit it. When word of it reached the outside world, soldiers were sent scurrying in all directions, and two minutes later one of them found a room for rent in the home of one of the best families, exactly across the street from the sub-prefecture. It can hardly be that I was the first stranger to enter Huancabamba since Hernando de Soto was sent by Pissarro to reconnoiter the region after the capture of the Inca. Yet one might have fancied so. Whether it was due to some canine sense of smell we of less favored lands lacked, I never succeeded in getting within ten yards of a Huanca Bambino before he was staring at me with bulging eyes and hanging jaw, all work, movement, and even conversation ceasing as I drew near. If I passed behind a group on a street corner, their necks went round with one accord, like those of owls, and they stared after me in unbroken silence as long as I remained in sight. Men and women, well-dressed and outwardly intelligent, dodged back into their house or shop as I appeared, to call wife or children, as they might, for a passing surface parade, sidewalks were really house verandas, sometimes roof, and on all ordinary occasions pedestrians strolled along the center of the street. Now there was a stranger in town. Virtually all took pains to cross to my side of the way, and though it required distinct exertion to climb up to and down from this few yards of raised sidewalk, every inhabitant seemed to find some excuse every few minutes to wander by my door at a snail's pace in his noiseless bare feet. If I began any species of activity, to write, to load my Kodak, read, or even wash my hands, the human stream was clogged like a loft raft against a snag, and the population stacked up about my door until a well-aimed anything broke the keystone log and gave me again for a moment, light and air. 
It was the hospitable Huancabambino custom to give me greeting, even when I was busy well inside the room, and to repeat the phrase in a louder and louder voice until I acknowledged it. Those few who passed on the further side of the street never failed to shout, Buenos dias, across at me, although they might have looked upon me a bare two minutes before. Now and then, a more friendly member of society wandered complacently into the room to peer over my shoulder or handle with the innocence of a three-year-old child such of my possessions as took his fancy. Some drifted in, even if not long after I had retired, for there being no other opening to have closed the door would have been to smother. In the far recesses of the Andes the simplest matter may become complex. My flannel road shirt had at last succumbed to its varied hardships. Now, buying a shirt may seem too trivial an experience to be worthy of mention. In the wilds of Peru, it is a transaction of deep importance. Huancabamba is overstocked with cloth shops, but what Latin American shopkeepers honestly believe a very heavy shirt would fall to pieces in three days under the exertions of a society darling. One garment promised moderate endurance, I did find, but the combined jangling of all the bells of Quito was as nothing compared to its color scheme. Beside it, the good old American flag would have looked dull and colorless. I set out to find a woman willing to make a new shirt on the old pattern. Most of them did not wish to do so. Most of the others were too tired. Two or three had less commonplace reasons, such as being in mourning, or having a pan to wash before Sunday, or a son to be married next week, or not having gone to confession recently. Toward noon, I caught a shoemaker's wife unawares, and had her promise to undertake the task before she could think of a plausible excuse. She thought a just price, I, to furnish the cloth, would be twenty cents. I canvassed the shops for heavy khaki. The stoutest on sale was flimsy as a chorus girl's bodice, color plainly as evanescent as her complexion. I chose at last from a bolt of cloth designed for an afternoon trouser, added a spool of the strongest thread to be had, Experience had long since taught me that the tailors of Latin America use a thread so fine that a deep breath is almost sure to burst a seam or two. I delivered the materials and retired for a belated almuerzo in the mud hut, where the daily cow sacrificed to Huancabamba's appetite is sold in half-real nibbles. Now and then an urchin entered, clutching a nickel in one besmeared fist, to say in the uninflected monotone of a piece learned in school, media carne, media vuelta, two cents worth of meat, two cents change, to which the answer was almost sure to be, no hay vuelta, there is no change. Whereupon the emissary wandered homeward, still clutching the coin, and the family evidently passed another meatless day. Barely had I returned to my room, when a fever fell upon me. At the height of the attack, when every movement was a mighty effort and every motionless moment an hour of deep enjoyment, an urchin appeared with the spool of thread I had provided, saying it was heavier than Huancabamba was accustomed to use. And I must supply a spool of number sixty. I reached for the brick that held back one of the leaves of the door and he disappeared from my field of vision. An hour later he came back to report that the seamstress had broken a needle and refused to risk another. I suspended him by as much of a garment as he wore long enough to promise to cut off his ears and to have the sub-prefect put the seamstress in prison and to bring down another earthquake upon Huancabamba unless the contract solemnly entered into was fulfilled before sundown and I was not sharp-eyed enough to distinguish his little brown legs one from the other as he sped back 
to the zapateria. At dusk the shirt was delivered, an exact copy of the original, which was bequeathed to the miniature messenger. A diet chiefly of quinine soon had me ready for the road again. My load was more burdensome than ever. A long stretch of wilderness ahead required the carrying of many pounds of food, and on down the valley of the Huancabamba I wobbled like an octogenarian. Most of the day lay across a desert of mighty broken chasms, leprous dry under the blazing sun, scarred, gashed, and split with scores of lines, almost any of which might have been mistaken for a trail. Somehow I chanced to pick the right one, and brought up at dusk at the hut of Alessandro Bovio, far up the chasm of a small tributary. Bovio was a wiry man of fifty, son of an Italian, though officially a Peruvian, speaking only Spanish, but well read, and of infinitely more industry and initiative than the natives. Unlike our own immigrants, those to South America retain for generations a distinct evidence of their origin. To the society about them, they are still known as hijos de italiano, alemán, inglés, and the like, and the traveler is almost certain to find the man thus designated of far more worth than his neighbors, though commonly inferior to the race of his fathers. Bavio was a government employee stationed here in his thatched hut to check the cargoes of leaf tobacco that sell in Vafuera or pass out of Jaen province in large quantities for Huancabamba and the coast in leather-wrapped bundles on horses, mules, and cattle. Like several of Europe, the Peruvian government retains the monopoly of tobacco. For an official load of 69 kilograms, it pays $10, and in some remote districts, only $8.50. Each kilo produces 20 packages of cigarettes, selling for 30 centavos each. In other words, the 69 kilos brings the government $208 gold. This system is directly inherited from Spain in colonial days. Stevenson found that the king purchased tobacco at three reals, three-eighths of a dollar, and sold it at two dollars, though much was spent on fiscales. It remained for Republican Peru to open a truly enormous gulf between producer and consumer. I wish I could buy a burrow, even a half-sized one, I sighed, half to myself, as I was straightening up under my burden next morning. Had he been an unalloyed Latin American, Bobbio would have shrugged his shoulders and murmured something about life being a sad matter at best. Instead, he cried, why didn't you say so? And stepping out into the sunshine, flooding the arid world like a shower of gold, waving his arms in some local coat of wigwagging at a hut hung high up on the desert hillside across the river. Not long after, there drifted up before the corridor where we sat in the shade a sun-scorched mestizo youth leading a small donkey, shaggy as a bear, just emerging from his winter den. It proved to be a female of the species, about sweet sixteen as donkeys go, and due in years to come to double in size. Moreover, she was chicaro, in other words, had never yet contributed to the labor of the world, and appeared to the youth to be worth twelve soles. There ensued the usual verbal skirmish before we compromised at ten. Clipping an effigy of the King of England from my waistband, I held it out to the mestizo. He shied at it like a colt at a flying newspaper. The Incas, we are told, forbade the common people to possess gold. Whether it is due to that prohibition passed down by tradition to the present day, or to mere contrariness, the countrymen of the Andes still insist on doing their transactions in silver. Indeed, plata 
is the most common word for money in all the region. Bavio had no prejudice against gold, however, and taking ten silver cartwheels from a hairy cowhide chest in a far corner of his hut, he dropped them into the youth's outspread hands, and the latter sped away up the sun-flooded hillside to his hovel, leaving me in possession of a number four-sized donkey and the ancient hauser which it was moored to a post of Bobbio's dwelling. The first necessity was a name for the animal. Her startling beauty against the background of the Egyptian landscape made Cleopatra obvious. Then came the problem of the furniture without which no Andean donkey will carry even a man's load. Bavio donated an old grain sack. Over this went my poncho. Thirty centavos seemed a just price for a corona, a donkey saddle of wood of sawbuck shape. For another soul, I became the legal possessor of a large and stout if rather aged pair of alforjas, or cloth saddle-bags, in which my forty pounds could be evenly balanced. Around these, donkey and all, Bavio wound with the intricacy of long experience several yards of rope, and at blazing ten I was off at last to have my entire worldly possessions immediately dash away up the hillside into a jungle. When they had been recovered, a nephew of Bavio volunteered to pilot my new ship out of harbor. With a tow rope and a cudgel in hand, he got the craft under way. Then gradually the cudgel sufficed as both rudder and throttle. A mile from home, he returned command over to me, and away we went alone up the narrowing valley into the Huascareg range. Cleopatra waltzed ahead of me up the slope like a schoolgirl on a holiday. It seemed ridiculous that any traveler with a donkey should ever have had difficulties, unless he expected a bag filled even in the middle to lie contentedly on the animal's back. With only a slight shift to one side or the other, every hour or two the alforjas rode like a cavalryman. We zigzagged high over a range, coming out above what was evidently an immense valley, heaped full of white clouds as the basket of a plantation picker with cotton, and began to go swiftly down through reddish mud ruts, deeper than Cleopatra was high. Then we picked up the Tamborapo River near its source and descended along a grassy valley walled by bushy hillsides. In this region of northern Peru, the Andes break down into great sweltering gorges and tropical wildernesses. Instead of the unbroken high pampas, the range seems to promise. The traveler so foolish as to journey through it catches the valley of a river as it tears its way across the jungled mountain wilderness, follows it as far as possible, then fights his way across a divide to descend or ascend another stream. Neither waterway is likely to run in anything like the direction he would go, but by tacking like a ship against a headwind, he advances bit by bit with an exertion out of all proportion to the actual progress toward the nebulous goal he has set himself. The distance between two hamlets a hundred miles apart is often three hundred miles in this labyrinthian province of Jaén, officially a province of Peru, but still disputed by Ecuador, as the boundary was between Atahualpa and Huascar at the coming of the Spaniards. So low is the region that the local expression for entering La Provincia, as Jaén is known locally, is Va adentro to go down inside, as might be designated the entrance into the realms of the unrighteous departed. Perfection, alas, is not of this world. Now that I might have added a plentiful supply of foodstuffs to my pack without increasing my burdens, for Cleopatra 
had been sold under a guarantee to carry a hundred pounds, I had reached a section of the world where food is under no circumstances for sale. Furthermore, with a thousand miles of road just suited to donkeys behind me, it must be my fortune the morning after at last acquiring one to strike the worst possible road for them. Strictly speaking, there was no road, but for certain spaces trees enough had been felled to make passage through the forest possible, and the rainy season and tobacco trains had combined to turn these clearings into unbroken miles of camelones, those corduroy-like ridges of hard earth with a coating of slippery mud alternating with ditches of liquid mud from two to three feet deep. A pedestrian, even with forty pounds on his back, may trip along the tops of these as blithely as a youthful opera company counting the ties from Red Cloud to Chicago. But to attempt to drive a half-grown jackass, laden with all the driver's earthly possessions, in far from waterproof cloth sacks, through mile after monotonous mile of them, under an endless tropical downpour, is an experience to stir the most blasé and world-weary soul. Those steps at which the uncomplaining little brute did not slip off into the ditch behind the ridge on which she had set her feet were those in which she fell with a still more far-reaching splash into the ditch ahead. Usually each pair of feet was divided in its allegiance and reduced the animal to that artistic performance properly known in pseudo-histrionic circles as splitting the splits. More times than I could have counted, Cleopatra fell down lengthwise, crosswise, frontwise, and hindwise, on her head, on the side of her neck, on her bedraggled tail, on every part of a donkey known to anatomy, showering me with mud from the crown of my hat to my inundated boots, soaking my possession in seas of mud, now and then, frankly, lying down in despair, as often attempting to shirk her portion of this world's troubles by dashing into the impenetrable dripping jungle and smashing my maltreated belongings against the trees. From time to time, she became hopelessly entangled with a train of pack animals going outside, forcing me to wade in and lift her bodily, pack and all, out of some slough above which little more than her drooping ears were visible. In short, when this royal highway waded across the barnyard of the Hacienda Charapé, it did not require a particularly sincere invitation to cause me to spend the rest of the day there. The hacendados of this region, owning whole ranges of mountains and valleys, live scarcely better than the Indians in their hovels. Both father and son in this case wore shoes and read the Lima newspapers from a month to six weeks old. Yet their earth-floored and walled dining rooms swarmed with unspeakably dirty peon children and pigs all but uprooted the table as we ate. The slatternly female cooking over three stones in an adjoining sty served as boiled rice mixed with cubes of pork in a single bowl from which we all helped ourselves indifferently with spoon or fingers. Father and son slept on a sort of homemade table covered with a pair of ragged blankets in a mud den overrun by domestic animals and littered with all the noisome odds and ends of a South American harness room. Yet their speech was as redundant with formalities as that of a Spanish cavalier in the king's court. Though I knew there was a long, foodless, and uninhabited region ahead, I could add but little to Cleopatra's nominal load in preparation for it, for to offer to buy supplies would have been considered an insult to my hosts, equal to an attempt to pay for my accommodation. Costumbre, inbred for long generations, forces these rural hacendados of Peru 
to consider it beneath their dignity to sell anything except the rapadura and homemade fire water they look upon as their legitimate source of income, yet they are too miserly to give much. The best I could do was accept with signs of deep gratitude two small cotton sackfuls of chifles and charol, the former bone-hard slices of plantains warranted to keep forever in any climate and taste like oak chips to any appetite, the latter hard squares of fried fat pork of the size of small dice. Then, of course, there was the inevitable slab of crude sugar wrapped in banana leaves. The road was worse than that of the day before. Times without number, I concluded the end of the journey had come for one of us, yet somehow the maltreated little brute sprawled forward through the pouring rain. Dense, dripping, unbroken forest, abounding with red berries of wild coffee, crowded close on either hand. Below the swollen tamborapo roared incessantly close alongside, adding to the constant fear of losing all my possessions, the continual dread of reaching some impassable stream. Toward the end of a day during which we had forded a dozen difficult tributaries, we were halted by a raging branch plainly foolhardy to attempt. I chased Cleopatra up through the jungle alongside it until darkness came on and forced us to camp in a tiny open space. My perishable possessions hung in the trees against destruction by ants and the donkey tied to the trunk that formed my bedpost. All night long the animal walked round and round over me, though without once stepping on my prostrate form with the heaped-up baggage. In the morning we tore our way far on up the tributary before we came in sight of a bridge, that is, two poles tied with vines to a tree on either bank. I had piled my garments on top of the load and was just dragging my reluctant baggage car into the stream when a half-naked youth appeared on the opposite bank making wild signs to me across the uproar of the waters. By the time I had regained the shore, he arrived in an abbreviated shirt by way of the bridge, carrying a stout staff and a rope. With these he dragged the donkey, stripped stark naked, into the stream, and fervently crossing himself twice, fought his way with it into the torrent, while I made three trips monkey fashion along the tree-lashed poles with the baggage that would infallibly have been washed away but for this experienced jungle dweller. His particular saint did not fail him, and having delivered the drenched and disgusted animal to me on the further bank, he accepted a real with gratitude that suggested he considered himself well paid for risking his life. Slowly, monotonously, day after day, we pushed on through the Amazonian jungle. Amazonian not only in appearance, but because the Tamborapo soon joined the Marañón forms part of the great network of the Father of Waters. The unpeopled forest, draped with vines that here and there, like broken cables, dipped their ends into the stream, seemed to have no end. The absolute solitude of the region, ever shut by impenetrable jungle, with never a view of the horizon, with no sign of the existence of humanity, and no other sounds than the occasional scream of a bird and the constant roar of the stream, had a peculiar effect on the moods. One felt abandoned by the world and came to look upon all nature as a cruel prison warden, determined that his prisoner should never again be permitted to pick up the threads of his existence nor even communicate with the world that had abandoned him. The very silence added to the gloom until I felt like screaming. Well, speak, Burrow. It was a relief not to sweat under my own load, but it was distinctly more laborious to drive it for me. Day after day I beat up Cleopatra's rear from dawn till dusk, without pause, yet covered scarcely half the distance I might have plodded alone. 
Even where the trail was level and dry, the docile yet headstrong brute could not exceed two miles an hour. Wherever a bit of slope or stones and mud intervened, she picked her way with the cautious deliberation of an old lady entering a streetcar. Insects swarmed. My unshaven face and all the expanse of skin from crown to toes were blotched and swollen with their visitations. The chifles and charro gave out and left only the lead-heavy rapadura and river water as hunger antidotes. On the third day, even the last chunk of crude sugar disappeared, and still the two of us plodded on, equally gaunt and lacking in ambition and energy. I had lived on river water for more than twenty-four hours, and lost my way several times on forking trails that climbed to nowhere far above or were swallowed up in the jungle, when I guessed again at a path that climbed up out of the valley of the river. By and by it sweated up to a hut of open-work poles, where lived a vaquero in charge of the stock of a vast hacienda of the wilderness. Only a little girl of eight was at home, and she did not know that roads were meant to lead anywhere. Tying Cleopatra in the shade of the eaves, I sat down to await adult information. Starvation seemed to have danced its orgy for weeks before my weary eyes when the child came out with a fat, ripe chardamoya to lisp in a shaky voice, Le gusta es fruta? Hours later, a gaunt, tropic-scarred man appeared, and at sight of me shouted the stereotyped greeting of all his class to any visitor a horse or a foot. Apese, dismount, senor. When I declined with the customary formalities, he opened preliminary inquiries as to my biography. I broke in upon them to suggest food. Entra y descansa, senor, he replied. Siéntese. The rural Peruvian would invite one to enter and take a seat on a block of wood. If he came to put out a fire, he produced a glass made from a broken bottle and insisted on my partaking of his hospitality to the extent of drinking his health in the aguardiente, which he turned his sugar cane in a little thatched distillery down in a hollow nearby. But my every hint of a desire to buy food was diplomatically ignored, except that he accepted readily enough a real and sent the child upstairs, that is, to crawl up to and along the reed ceiling to fetch me a leaf-wrapped chunk of rapadura. The invisible trail he pointed out pitched down a leg straining an almost perpendicular bajada of loose stones to another stream, and then struggled breathlessly upward through the unbroken forest over the Barranguilla range, a jungled mountain spur. From the crest there spread out before me the vast panorama of an upper Amazon hoya the Tambarapo far below, squirming away through its steep, dense wooded valley, and all about it half barren hills of varying colors that gave the landscape the appearance of a tempestuous sea turned to jungle earth. Red cliffs, like our western buttes, flashed their faces in the sunset, and as far as the eye could reach in any direction was no sign that man had ever before entered this trackless wilderness. It was nearing dusk when the world fell away before us into a great wooded quebrada, its bottom unfathomable, but with a trail in plain sight fighting its way up the opposite slope. The path underfoot melted away, and where Cleopatra led I followed, certainly she knew the way as well as I. The ghost of a trail she had chosen turned to a perpendicular cowpath down which the animal sprawled and stumbled, bumping her load against the trees, but unable to fall far through the dripping forest 
that grew up impenetrably about us. Dense black night found us at the bottom of a V-shaped valley. I sought the corresponding path on the opposite side of its small stream by feeling with both feet and hands, but it was as intangible as the straight and narrow path of theological phraseology. To cheer things on, it began to rain in deluges. I made the most of a genuinely Peruvian situation by halting for the night where there was at least drinking water. So sharp was the valley that there was not even a flat space large enough to stretch out, and I could only curl up in the muddy path that had brought us to this sad pass tumbling my soaked baggage somewhere beside me and tying the exhausted animal to something in the dark where there was neither a leaf to eat nor a spot for the brute to lie down. By morning light I found that Cleopatra's inexperience and asinine judgment had led us to a place where wild cattle came to drink, and we were forced to struggle back to the crest of the hill and descend again by another trail that linked up with the one we had seen in the afternoon before. At its foot was a field of swamp grass, in which the starving animal spent the rest of the morning in regaining strength for the climb ahead. Above, a new style of landscape spread out before us. A vast, bushy plain was passable only by following the windings of a sandy and stony river bed and wading with monotonous frequency the stream that swung back and forth across it, like a person utterly devoid of a sense of direction or power of decision. Beyond, we tramped monotonously on, through endless chaparral, thorn-bristling, bushy woods, where reigned an utter solitude only enhanced by the mournful cry of some unseen bird. The most constantly recurring form of vegetation was the tusho, a sort of cottonwood tree with the trunk swollen as a gourmand's waistline. Endlessly this dismal wilderness stretched onward from dawn till dark until the traveler could fancy himself in solitary confinement for life and in danger of losing the mind for which he could find no employment. The region would have been more endurable had I been able to stride forward at my own pace, but Cleopatra sentenced me to a monotonous, unchanging snail's gait that gave sufficient exercise only to my right arm and the cudgel it bore. Hundreds of red centipedes littered the ground. The dead, dry silence was broken only by the rhythmic, mournful cry of a jungle bird. But here the going was smooth, and for long distances our pace was so unbroken that there ran through my unoccupied mind for hours at a time the paraphrase of an old refrain. Two jacks with but a single gait, six feet that walk as one. Next to the Tusho, the tree that most often repeated itself was the guava, producing a fruit like large brown bean pods filled with black seeds, the white pulp of which had thirst-quenching qualities and a taste mildly resembling the watermelon. I had lost a count of days entirely, but subsequent checking up proved it was Sunday afternoon when I halted at the Hacienda Shumba, and spreading out my moldy garments on the thatch roof of its only hut awaited the owner. He proved to be the Teniente Gobernador, the lieutenant governor of the region, in the sun-bleached remnant of two garments and a hat. Having turned Cleopatra into a pasture, he settled down to spell out the documents I presented. Strictly speaking, he was not the hacienda owner, but only an arrendatario. Though I had not suspected it, I had been traveling for days through estates which as beneficencias or cofardías belonged to the bishopric of Trujillo. And it's partly the heavy hand of the church that keeps this region so solitary and uninhabited. 
The so-called owners are really agents who administer them, for the tonsured landlords, collecting a rental from the few families who raise a bit of rice, cacao, and cattle. The region is far less rich than it is locally reputed. The soil of the river valleys is fertile, but the mountains are rocky and often arid, especially in this section, poorly served by the rains. A government official himself, my host complained bitterly against the government tax on tobacco, liquor, sugar, salt, and matches. The first, he asserted, was no longer worth planting. All non-Peruvians were gringos to the teniente gobernador. A fellow countryman of mine, he asserted, had spent a night with him recently, hardly two years before. He was, let's see, an Italian, no, a German though he could read and write laboriously and had long been a government official on compulsion and without emoluments, the world, as he conceived it, consisted of Peru and another very much smaller country with several towns of more or less the same size and conditions as the two villages of Jaén and Tocabamba he had seen, named Germany, Italy, Estados Unidos, and so on, from which came the various types of gringos. Indeed, he wished to know, is Germany in the same country as the United States? What do you call a native of Hain? I chanced to ask him in the course of our conversation. A Hainse, to be sure, he replied, just as you call a native of Italy, an Italiano, or a man from a town named France. A Francis. But if his knowledge was slight, it was no less tenacious, and he could no more be talked out of his geographical conceptions than out of his conviction that all the world lives in reed and mud huts, with earth floors, goes habitually barefoot, considers its dwellings fit breed places for guinea pigs. When I asked him if the road beyond Hain was good, I was startled to hear the assurance. Ah, yes, indeed, there are no bad roads in Peru. A divan of reeds set into the mud wall of the single room and covered with a hairy cowhide was quite soft enough as a bed for one who had long since left effeminate civilization behind. Until long after dark, we two men and a woman squatted in homemade chairs fitted to a doll's house and fed ourselves over our knees. Yet the conventions of society are quite as fixed in these hovels of the wilderness as in any place of the aristocracy. It was quite a la mode, a sign of good breeding, in fact, to ask for a second helping of the bean and yucca stew, which is invariably served so boiling hot that even the experienced gringo's teeth suffer, but under no circumstances for a third. When they had been emptied a second time, the gourd bowls were piled up on the floor in a corner to be washed when the spirit moved, and, as if at a signal that there was no second course, the one glass in the house, tied together with a string and evidently regarded as a great treasure and heirloom, was filled with irrigating ditch water and passed around the circle, beginning with the guest. The feeble imitation of a candle soon flickered out, and by eight we were all scattered along the walls of the hut on our reed divans, quarreling pigs shaking the house as they jostled against it, and the rain that fell heavily all night long dripping upon us here and there through the thatched roof. Cleopatra was so nearly rendido, bushed next morning that even under her slight load she wabbled drunkenly and kept her footing chiefly because the heavy glue-like mud clung to our feet like pedestals to a statue. For one considerable space the way led through a swamp where I was several times forced to wade knee-deep to carry out the load and lift the bemired animal to her feet. Yet drinkable water was not to be had, and the choking tropical humidity was the more tantalizing as rain broke every few minutes 
and everything in sight was dripping wet, though the sandy soil swallowed each shower as it fell. Toward noon, the now inconsiderable trail split, marking an important parting of the way, for the branch to the left leads quickly down to Bella Vista on the Marañón, whence rafts descend to Iquitos and the rubber country, and so by the Amazon to the Atlantic, while I, bearing to the right, plodded along the highlands of the Andes. In the dead silent woods a few decrepit and weather-blackened huts grew up. Several drowsy, half-naked beings in human form gazed languidly after me from the doorways, and before I knew it I was treading the streets of the provincial capital and city of Jaén. End of chapter 9, part 2 Recorded by Elliot Swanson Chapter 10, Part 1 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10, Part 1 Approaching Inca Land Small wonder that the traveler who has splashed and waded a long week through the mournful wilderness, living chiefly on fond hopes, salted with the anticipations of an unschooled imagination, and washed down with river water, should fetch up in Hain with a decided shock. Occupying a large and distinct place on the map, this provincial capital proved to be a disordered cluster of a half-hundred wretched, time-blackened, tumbled-down, thatched huts, with the roofs full of holes, the gables often missing, scattered like abandoned junk among the weeds and bushes of a half-hearted clearing in the self-same gloomy forest and spiny jungle that had so long shut me in. The barefoot, half-clothed, fever-yellow inhabitants of mongrel breed stared curiously from their mud doorways as I stalked past, smeared with dried mud from head to foot, sunburned, shaggy with whiskers, and dragging behind me by main force an emaciated donkey trembling with excitement at the unwanted sights or with fear at the unknown dangers of so vast a metropolis. From one hut in no way different from its neighbors issued the city school, the teacher with a ragged cap on his head and a drooping cigarette smoldering between his lips, stared after me with the rest. Every building in town, the church included, consisted of a single mud room with an unleveled earth floor, windowless, and with a small reed or pole door giving entrance, exit, and such air and light as could force admittance. The government palace before which I tied Cleopatra to the official bamboo flagpole in the geographical center of the capital, was closed. With a flourish of my papers, I summoned the authorities to step forward and make themselves known. But the maneuver brought only the information that the sub-prefect was away for a few days, but he'll soon be back, next week, no mas, or the week after, at any rate. Entra, y descansa. Come in and sit down. The governador was likewise among the indefinitely missing. Whence the mantle of power descended upon the shoulders of the alcalde. That worthy was soon produced, somewhat the worse for concentrated cane juice, but remarkable for at least two features. He wore what might still, with some stretch of veracity, be called shoes, and alone of all the town could have passed for a white man had he seen fit to remove a stringy little Indian mustache. When he had read aloud to the congregated male population all my credentials in Spanish, a task not unlike that of a one-legged man walking without his crutches after spraining his ankle and suffering a stone bruise, he requested me to name my desires. They were modest. Room, bed, table, chair, water, food for myself, and pasture for the other one of us until day after tomorrow. 
slowly and bit by bit, but none the less surely, my requirements were met. A key was found that manipulated the creaking padlock of one of the thatched mud caves with sagging reed divans around its walls. A crippled table was dragged in, and a squad of soldiers sent for old newspapers to cover it. In due time, and with the assistance of the entire population, in a house-to-house -house canvas, a gourd wash basin was discovered, then a gourd with a hole in one end from which one drank, and into which the half-Indian boy thrust a finger to carry it, after filling it at the chocolate-brown stream at the edge of town. A chair was unofficially subtracted from the government palace. And, last of all, a four-inch mirror was pinned to the mud wall. I had barely removed the hirsute adornment of a week by such light as hang massed in about the door left me when a barefoot female glided noiselessly into my den and announcing herself the owner carried off the glass as too precious a possession to be long out of her sight the first stroll disclosed the hitherto unsuspected fact that several of the mud dens were shops one of them posed as a restaurant but its restorative powers were at best anemic Hain is probably the hottest and certainly the hungriest provincial capital in peru to retain its rank as a city it fulfilled nominally the test of a place where bread is made a tiny soggy bun selling for the price of an american loaf milk and fruit which might easily have been superabundant here were unknown luxuries and the customary food of the populace included nothing a well-bred dog would have touched in any but a ravenous state a dozen of us without families including the alcalde were dependent upon the restaurant and we agreed upon a fixed ration of bread and eggs the supply of which never approached even the normal demand but the alcalde quickly formed the habit of sneaking over before the hour set and by virtue of his official powers consumed most of the provender to forestall him the rest of us took to arriving earlier until it grew customary to appear for the noonday meal at about nine and to sit down to supper toward three eyeing each other ravenously and jealously watching the cook's every movement he who is accustomed to complain of the high cost of living should try the antidote of a journey down the andes where the high cost reigns supreme without the living in these languid corners of the world where life is reduced to its lowest terms food and lodging assume the first place of importance and the mind is never free from these primitive apprehensions no sooner does one eat than the worry arises as to where the next meal will come from as each day's pleasure on the road is tempered by wondering what hardship the night will have in store there were some evidences of negro blood in Hain, though that of the aboriginal indian tribe of the region was universal in the percentage of one half to a far smaller fraction in varying individuals the men wore homemade garments of the cheapest cotton patched and sun faded generally no shirt with merely a kerchief knotted about the neck above the undershirt and sombreros de junco hats woven of a species of swamp grass or reeds which a few weeks of sun and rain gave the appearance of a badly thatched roof the women wore no hats combed their raven black hair flat and smooth without adornment and let it hang down their backs in a single braid like all the cholas and half-castes of the sex in the andes they dragged their misshapen skirts constantly in the mire of the street and the floors of their huts and were habitually even less cleanly in their habits than the men the stage of education may be gauged from the fact that each government telegraph operator assured me i could not reach cerro de pasco by land but must cross the sea to lima and take the railroad from there 
Haines' chief pastime for speeding up the monotonous stretch between the cradle and the grave is the consumption of the native cafiazo, and only those who rose early were likely to find a completely sober man. A sort of harmless anarchy reigned. A man merry with cane juice might sit outside the mud schoolhouse and keep the school from functioning all day long, without interference. An amorous youth going on a drunken rampage among the huts or washerwomen on the banks of the irrigating ditch was avoided if possible, but was never forcibly restrained. As is frequent in tropical towns, there was little evidence of religion, pseudo or otherwise, which thrives best in the high cold regions of the mysterious Paramos. The mud church, with its tower melted off unevenly at the top, like a half-burned candle in a wind, had long since lost its cura, and served now as a provincial jail by the simple addition of a few poles set in adobe across the door and a few languid soldiers lolling in the general vicinity whenever they had no particular desire to be somewhere else. On the afternoon of my arrival, the rumor floated languidly over the town that the weekly cow was to be butchered next morning, but it was denied later that evening. I made the most of my day of leisure by acquiring a bar of native soap, of the appearance of a mud pie and the scent of boiling glue, and spending some two hours in the irrigating ditch, stringing across the main street from a telegraph pole to a rafter of my house all the garments that could be spared from use in an unexacting society. Nothing was more certain than that I should start again at daylight or the second morning until news arrived that the river, eighteen miles south, was impassable until the water receded. It was evident, too, that I must deny myself the companionship of Cleopatra. She hung wilted and dejected in the town pasture, and at best there was no hope that she would last many days further, even if there were any means of getting her across the swollen river. I accepted the alcalde's offer of three dollars for the animal and her furniture, and felt a glow of satisfaction tempered with regret at the loss of a good companion, for all her faults, that I should no longer have to drag my feet behind me at her snail's pace and be dependent on my right arm for advancement. On the morning I should have started, the rumor again ran riot that the town was going to pelar un reis, peel a beef. This time matters went so far as to lead the octogenarian victim out into the main street, where the population gathered in an attitude of anticipation, a dozen or more armed with homemade axes and knives, the rest with pots and gourds. For a long time the languid hubbub of some discussion rose and fell about the downcast animal. Then, gradually, the gathering disintegrated and scattered to its huts, each pausing at sight of a face to drone in that singularly indifferent monotone of the tropics. No hay carne hoy. There is no meat today. Some misanthropist, an agent of a neighboring hacienda, it turned out, had offered nine dollars for the animal, and Hain did not feel justified in squandering any such fortune for mere food. My rosy dream of again tasting fresh meat and of carrying supplies in my journey was once more rudely dissipated. The east was blushing from the first kiss of the bold tropical sun when I sallied forth on the morning I had concluded to start, river or no river, and went to wake up the restaurant keeper, sleeping on his dining table with the precious bread box under his head. The alcalde appeared almost at the same instant from the direction of the irrigation ditch, his towel about his neck. He greeted me with a forced courtesy. His solemn promise to arrange to have my baggage transported to the river, in consideration for the low price of which he had acquired Cleopatra, had gone the way of most South American promises, into thin air. 
Now I reminded him of it, he would order a soldier to accompany me at once. The earth swung a long way eastward on its axis without any other sign of activity. Then one came to say that a soldier would not be sent because Anastasio Centurion, returning to his hacienda Algarrobo forthwith, would be delighted to carry my belongings on his mule. An hour later he declined to carry them. Then he was prevailed upon by his compadre, the lieutenant governor, to renew his offer. Then he again concluded that the weight was too great, and finally sent an urchin for my saddlebags. Before they were loaded, however, a dispute broke out over the ownership of a silver spur that had been picked up in the sand of the main street, and the town followed the alcalde to the mud hut that served as a court of justice. It was also the city bakery, and the wife of the justice, who had put off baking the morning before, and was not yet mixing the dough, ceded a corner of the kitchen table to the court, which in the course of an hour settled the case in the customary Latin American way, by deciding that the disputed property should remain in the hands of justice. A soldier was at length sent to round up one of the donkeys grazing in the main plaza. Gradually the disgusted animal was fitted with my former donkey furniture, amid the contrary suggestions of the populace, and the alcalde furnished me an order to the ferryman at the river to set me across in the name of the government and to return the donkey and aparejo. A winding, narrow, stony path that wet its feet at the very outset squirmed away through the desert-like forest. Down there, said Anastasio, wrapped gloomily in his maroon poncho and viciously kicking the spur on one bare heel into the side of his heavily laden animal, is the Camino Real, Perro da Mucha Vuelta. How it could give more turns than the one we were following, it was hard to imagine. My pack animal this time was a matron of forty, comparatively speaking, and correspondingly set in her ways. Within the first mile, se me escapo, as the natives have it, that is, she suddenly bolted into the thorny wilderness at the first suggestion of an opening, and left me dripping with sweat and speckled with the blood of a dozen superficial lacerations before I again laid hands on her in an impassable clump of brambles and cactus. Anastasio tied her tow-rope to his saddle, and for an hour or so she seemed completely resigned to her fate, but evidently there is no trusting the sex at that age. No sooner was she paroled than she bolted again, and led me a skin-gashing chase of several miles through a wild and waterless solitude. Yet, after all, manipulating a donkey is a splendid apprenticeship for dealing with Latin Americans. No better training could be suggested for the prospective salesman south of the Rio Grande. The going ranged from Quebradita to Muy Quebrada, now along the stony bed of a meandering river, yesterday all but impassable, today so bone dry there was only a bit of running mud to quench the thirst, now over a sharp knoll bristling with jagged loose stones. At red-hot noon we reached the Huancabamba River, now grown to man's estate, where it swings round to join the Marañón and divides the never-to-be-forgotten province of Jaén from that of Cutervo. A laborious two hours up it brought us to the long-heralded Puerto Sauce, where the government maintains a ferry. Five small logs bound together with vines and manned by three balseros housed in two reed kennels. Here we squatted out the day, watching the coffee-colored stream race by on its long journey to the Atlantic with all the impetuosity of the rainy season. The government chasqui had been sitting here nearly a week, his mail sacks stacked and his horse tethered close at hand. Only out on the extreme edge of the bank 
where an occasional breath of tepid breeze tempered the lead-heavy heat and thinned the swarms of stinging insects, was life endurable. My skin was a patchwork of mementos of all the minute fauna of the past week, and an itching like the constant prick of myriad red-hot needles was relieved only briefly by each dip in the stream. During one of them I advanced well into the river, and it seemed I could have crossed it that even the Peruvians might have made the passage had they male blood in their veins. But then, had they been men, they would long since have built a bridge. All through the night there kept running through my head, amid the sweep of the waters, that illuminating remark of Kim, a sahib is always tied to his baggage. And in my half-conscious condition I resolved when morning broke to cast away all but a loincloth and a hat, and travel henceforth in comfort al uso del país. But alas, the least formal of us cannot rid himself of all the adjuncts of civilization, and there was photography, to say nothing of food and covering for the highlands ahead to be considered. When dawn turned its matter-of-fact light upon the scene, the dream quickly faded, and I settled down to watch another day drag by into the past tense beside the racing brown waters of the Huancabamba. The feeling was rampant that nature had played me a scurvy trick. I had bargained on following the cool and pleasant crest of the Andes, and they had crumbled away beneath me and forced upon me this unsought experience of the tropics. Not until morning of the third day did the balseros conclude to attempt to pass over the government people, the mailman and his impatient gringo with the official order from the alcalde. The raft had been dragged well upstream, where we waded to it through bristling jungle and knee-deep mud. The chasqui's horse, long experienced in these matters from years of carrying the mail over this route, was driven in and forced to swim to a sandbar, well out into the stream. For a long time the animal stood like a prisoner at bay against the shouting and stoning and shaking of cudgels of those on the bank, but at length, seeing no other escape, it set out to attempt the main branch. Its brute instinct would have proved a better guide than the opinions of more rational beings. Struggling until its snorting echoed back from the surrounding jungle, it fought the brown racing waters gradually nearing the further bank, yet swept even more swiftly along by the inexorable stream amid foam caps from the rocky passes above, straining savagely to reach the strip of beach that served as a landing place, until, swept past it without gaining a footing, it seemed suddenly to give up in despair, and only its head swinging slowly round and round with the current, was seen a short minute more, tiny against the race of the yellower waters before it swept on and out of sight down the jungle-walled torrent. The chasqui gazed after the lost animal for a long moment, shrugged his shoulders with the resigned baya of a confirmed fatalist, and took his seat beside me on our baggage tied securely near the back of the frail craft. The three brown balseros, naked but for palm-leaf hats and a strip of rags between their legs, each crossed himself elaborately and took a deep draught at Anastasio's quart bottle of cañazo. Then they pointed the nose of the raft upstream, pushed off, snatched up their clumsy paddles with a horse implication to the virgin and fought for dear life and the sandbar this gained we disembarked and maneuvered to the further side then pushed off into the main stream it snatched at us like some greedy monster sandbar raced away upstream at express speed the further bank sped past like a blurred cinematograph ribbon the paddlers urged on by their own and the mailman's raucous shouts and imprecations 
battled as with some mortal enemy, stabbing their paddles in swift, breathless succession into the brown stream and following each dig with a savage jerk that tore the wound wide open and brought out the lean muscles between their dingy skins like steel cables under leather coverings. The rules of caste are more important than life itself in South America, and both the mailman and I had been refused paddles. Relentlessly, the further shore galloped by. The bit of clearing required for landing approached, beckoned to us tantalizingly, flashed on, and the raft sped swiftly after the lost horse. The balseros, abetted by the chasqui, increased their efforts to a screaming uproar, in which I caught here and there a fragmentary Nta Virgen, Yuda. Fortunately, they did not put all their trust in superhuman assistance, and their paddles tore the stream with a viciousness that drenched us with its aftermath. Bit by bit we strained nearer the hurrying wall of verdure. Each lunge seemed to lift the paddlers into the air. The cords on their necks stood out like creepers on a forest tree. Their yells, hoarse and savage enough to have frightened off any malignant spirit of the waters, came strained and broken now from lack of breath. Now we could all but touch the racing forest wall. I snatched in vain at a sapling, bowing its head in the stream. With a last faint gasp and spent stroke, the balseros dropped their paddles on the raft, and all five of us grasped at the vegetation that tore and lacerated us in its struggle to escape our desperate embrace. When we had each gathered an armful of it, we clung so stoutly to this last hold on earth that the raft was all but swept from under us before we swung it up into a bit of cove where the balseros, falling at once into their racial apathy, drooped like wilted rags at the bow, while one of them panted weakly, A little more, senores, and we were gone, sin noticias. As lazily as they had been energetic in the crossing, the ferryman coaxed the raft up along the edge of the forest to the little clearing where I swung my saddlebags over a shoulder, waited to dry land, and plodded on along the blazing hot bank of the Huancabamba. Slowly my shadow crawled from under my feet. In this sweltering desert valley, now staggering through hot sand in a dwarf vegetation savage with thorns, now clambering constantly over steep headlands that broke into cliffs at the river's edge, and stumbling down again through veritable quarries of loose stones, my burden augmented with chancaca, a sack of rice and a roll of sun-dried beef, as well as the lead-heavy tropical sun that seemed to lean physically on my shoulders, became unbearable. I resolved to pitch camp in the first open space and wait till doomsday, if necessary, for some pack train susceptible to the glitter of silver coins. Puerto Sauce was probably not more than seven miles behind me when I found between trail and river a narrow sand strip sloping down to the racing brown waters and backed by a barren, stony cliff face over which the road promised to bring out in relief against the turkey sky anyone who might pass my way. Grass could not find sustenance on this sun-baked spot, but centipedes, and a score of other venomous things might exist. Scattered along the bank were many sapling poles, the wreckage, evidently, of some hut that had been swept here by the raging river. I gathered an armful of these and laid their ends on two small logs, covered them with such brush and branches as were without thorns, and had a far more comfortable couch than the wealthiest hacendado of the region. Over me hung a wild lemon tree, the fruit of which made the yellow Huancabamba more nearly drinkable. About its trunk, within instant reach, I strapped my revolver and lay down almost in the royal highway, fully prepared for anything except 
a sudden burst of rain. Across the river, in dense, half-cultivated, greener jungle, were the huts of several natives, but they might as well have been in another world, for I could not have heard a whisper above the roar of the Huancabamba had they stood on the opposite bank screaming at me. I possessed a maltreated copy of Prescott, and there is great compensation for the hardships of the trail in golden moments snatched like this, for nowhere does the mind grip the printed page so firmly at the end of the day on the road, after long turning the leaves of no other page than nature's. The afternoon passed, faded to a violent sunset and blackened into night without a human sight or sound. I took another swim, careful not to lose my grasp on the shore, and turned my lounge into a bed. There had been many rumors of bears and tigers in these parts. The real peril was the incitement to suicide caused by the swarming insect life whenever the breeze failed for an instant. In my dreams the roar of the Huancabamba turned to that of New York, and I fancied I had suddenly left off my journey down the Andes to run home for a single day, at the end of which I should take up my task where I had left it all. When dawn awoke me I refused to rise. But hour after hour passed without break in the drear monotony of the arid landscape. In mid-morning patience exploded, and throwing my load over my shoulder I toiled on. When, at the end of some fifteen miles, my legs refused to push me further, I struggled through the jungle to the river bank, but there was not a cleared space sufficient to sit on, much less lie down in. By wading chest deep, I reached the breezy nose of an island in the Huancabamba and made my bed on the damp beach sand. But I had chosen poorly, if choice it might be called. Without even leaves to spread under me, the night was one of unmitigated torture. My raids of crawling, stinging, tropical life made my entire frame a pasture and a playground. At best, I got only a few half-conscious snatches of sleep, troubled with the threatening rumble of the river. For safety's sake, I had hung many of my belongings in the branches of trees, but not enough of them. Daylight showed a populous colony of enormous black ants in possession of all that lay on the ground. They had not only eaten to the last crumb, the changaka I had lugged for two blazing days, and left me barely a spoonful of rice for breakfast, but they had all but destroyed the homemade cover of my kodak, had decorated my hat with a fringe, and had bitten into a dozen pieces my autophotographic bulb, scattering all the vicinity with crumbs of red rubber. Another lone day we struggled upstream. I say we, that is, myself and I. For, a point for psychologists, since taking up my own load again, I could not rid myself of the fancy that I was two distinct persons, one of whom was forcing the other to make the journey. In the night I often started up fancying the other fellow the one who did the walking and carrying the load, had escaped. Could he know the truth beforehand, no sane man would sentence himself to tramp this route of the Andes, to suffer almost incessant hardships, the monotony of the same experiences over and over again, the dreary intercourse with a people so stupid, so low of intelligence, that long contact with their childish minds brings with it the danger of one's own faculties turning childish, like that of a lifetime of school teaching. Only the American habit of carrying out to the bitter end a plan once made could force him on. Late the next morning the most exciting event of several days happened. I met a human being. He was lolling before a slatternly hut of reeds, inside of which a half-caste woman squatted on the earth peeling camotes. On such a journey the civilized traveler unconsciously builds a certain pity for himself 
which he feels should be shared by others. But he is sure of a rude awakening among these clod-like inhabitants of the wilderness. Should a living skeleton crawl into an Andean hut announcing he had not tasted food for a fortnight, had seven species of tropical fever, and had been bitten by a baker's dozen of venomous serpents, the greeting would be the same, motionless, indifferent grunt, and drowsily mumbled, Vaya, with which this female acknowledged my presence. No offer of money would have brought her to her feet, much less have induced her to cook one of the chickens, or even yellow curs that overran the place. As I picked up my burden in disgust, however, she murmured through her half-closed lips, Señor usted, amorazano? In other words, that I might wait, if I chose, to partake of the camote stew she was lazily concocting over the stick fire in the center of the floor. On the surface, the stereotyped invitation looks like genuine hospitality. At the bottom, it is less so than a habit, tinged with superstition and fear of malignant spirits, and above all, the impossibility of an uninitiative race daring to or even thinking of varying a custom of all their known world. It was no time to stand on my dignity, however, even had the foodless days behind me left any such support, and I sat down again. A ravenous two hours dragged by before the mess of native roots and herbs met the approval of the expressionless female, who tasted a wooden spoonful of it now and then and tossed the residue back into the kettle. Several peons had drifted in, genuine human clods, apparently as devoid of intelligence as the hogs rooting about under their hooved feet, and gathered about a flat log raised a bit above the earth, with the steaming calabash of the tasteless red-hot stew before each of us, and a single bowl of mote mixed with bits of pork rind, into which, all shoveled at once, we finished the meal in utter silence. Then the first peon, wiping his horny hands across his mouth with a disgusting sucking sound, mumbled, Dios, se lo bagara a formula repeated by each as we rose to our feet. However much he may prefer to liquidate the matter himself, rather than leave it to so uncertain and unindebted a source, this God will pay you for it is the only return the traveler who sits at the tasteless repasts can force upon these mongrel people of the Andean wilderness. How far out of my course I had mounted the Huancabamba when I picked up a rock-strewn tributary along the cliff face, only a professional geographer could say. Through the hot lands of northern Peru, direction yields to the accidents of nature, and Jaén had been as far east of a line due southward as Ayabaca had been to the west. When early sunset fell in the bottom of the deep valley, I had mounted several hundred feet above the level of the Huancabamba, and with a welcome coolness came more human manners, heralding the highlands again. Both Fructoso Carrera and his far younger, though no less cheery wife, treated me more like a prodigal son than as an importunate guest who had fallen upon them out of the unknown. Amid the culinary operations suited to my case, they gave me in detail the recipe of the choclo tandas, Quichua bread, probably used before the conquest, that finally rounded off our repast late in the evening. For the benefit of housewives, permit me to pass on the information. Cut off the kernels of green corn while still small and fairly soft. Crush them to a pulp under a round stone on a broad flat one out beneath the thatched eaves if it is desired to keep the local color intact sprinkling water lightly on the mass from time to time when the whole has been reduced to a somewhat adhesive dough wrap in corn husks rolls of the stuff 
about the size and shape of an ear of corn, and tie with strips of husk. Sit down on the earth floor in a corner of the hut, driving off the persistent guinea pigs with any weapon at hand, and drop these packages one by one into a kettle of boiling water supported by three stones. Let boil for twenty minutes to a half hour, depending on the energy with which the faggots have been gathered during the day, taking care that none of the gaunt curs prowling about between the legs of the cook and through other unexpected openings thrust their noses into the kettle, as they would be sure to be burned. Those who succeeded in beginning the task while daylight still lingers should also beware any of the family chickens climbing to a convenient shoulder and springing into the pot. As this would result not in choclotanda, but in choclotanda con gallina, which is a far more expensive dish. Zest is added by a successful attempt surreptitiously to get into one's saddlebags a couple of the choclotandas for the land of starvation that is expected ahead. Several times during the night I descended to alleviate my insect-bitten skin by a plunge in the clear cold mountain stream that sounds in the Carrera family ears 365 days a year. In the morning I was forced to dress under my poncho with far less convenience than in an upper Pullman berth, for La Senora was already grinding coffee from my desayuno on the flat stone under the eaves beside me. To my diplomatically framed question as to what I owed them, Don Frutoso replied, For what should you owe us anything? All that day the trail wandered back and forth across the rock-boiling river, first by little thatched pachachacas, or earth-covered pole bridges, then, as the stream dwindled, by precarious stepping stones, climbed ever higher at times, through stretches of mud where dense overhanging forests had retained the rainfall. Mankind grew more frequent in this more habitable rising world. Thatched cottages were tucked away here and there in forty-five degree patches of bananas and coffee, and the pilfering of the tandas to weigh down my load proved an entirely gratuitous felony. The very air of the Tablabamba where I slept on dried cane pulp in an unwalled trapiche, hung well up the side of the new constricted valley, as humid and green as Hain province had been desert brown and arid, teemed with stories of robbers and assassins among the mountains ahead. The only visible danger I encountered, however, was the notorious Sal Sepueres, Climb it if you can, the terrors of which had grown daily more persistent for a fortnight past. This was one of those endless zigzags by which Andean trails climb from one river system when near its source to another, revealing its nefarious purpose only bit by bit, and subtly enticing the traveler ever upward in an undertaking he might not have the courage to face as a whole. A rut piled full of loose rocks, down which trickled enough water to suggest that the climb might have been on a rainy day, carried me into the very sky above, and taking there new foothold, scaled doggedly on into the realms of eternal silence, where even birds were no longer heard, and sturdy squat trees, sighing fitfully as if struggling for breath at length gave up in despair and abandoned the scene to huge black rocks protruding from a soil that gave sustenance only to the dead brown ichu grass of the Andean heights. Hay mucho silencio y mucho madador, my host of the night had mumbled lugubriously, but I was aware only of the music of the wind and the joyful realization that the broken mountains had gathered themselves together again under my feet and raised me once more to my accustomed temperate zone. By cold noonday a tumbled blue world lay about and below me, 
only an insignificant dent in it representing that overheated hell locally known as the province of Jaen. Like life itself, what had seemed at its base a mighty climb proved here at the top to have been only an insignificant little knoll down in the valley, and only when one had reached the real summit and could look back upon the region as a whole after all was accomplished, did each little struggle and petty suffering assume its correct proportion. Another step forward, and before my glad eye spread one of those broad green inter-Andean valleys, backed by serrated black ranges, their brows wrinkled and furrowed with age, the clouds trailing their purple shadows across a panorama of little cultivated valleys, into which I descended from the unconscionable summit by a natural stairway. The blue-gray peaks turned to lilac in the last rays of the chill highland sun, then faded away into the luminous sky of night as the mountain cold settled down like an icy poncho, and with dusk I tramped through a long adobe street into the central plaza of Cuterbo. End of chapter 10, part 1, recorded by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 10, Part 2, and of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Frank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10, Part 2, Approaching Inca Land. My legs seem to have pushed me again into the outskirts of civilization. Not only did the sub-prefect drive off of his own initiative the open-mouthed throng that gathered about his door, rather than read my papers aloud to them. But here, at last, was a Peruvian town that actually recognized the existence of strangers with appetites, and a large adobe hut publicly admitted itself a fonda. Cotervo was, in reality, monotonously like any other town of the Sierra. To one coming upon it out of the trackless wilderness, however, it seemed, at first sight, a place of mighty importance, and only gradually dwindled to its true proportions. Like a man just returned from long months in the polar ice, I had an all but irresistible desire to rush in and buy everything in sight, as I wandered past its long lines of open shop doors. The capital of a department readily cut off from the neighboring one of Chota, it was the first place in Peru where any appreciable number of the inhabitants could unreservedly be called white, and boasted the first specimens of beauty among the fair sex. Even the Lima newspapers were there to give me a skeleton sketch of the activities of a half-forgotten world. There is a reserve of strength in the human body which few suspect until they tax it in an emergency, but it is only after recovery that the traveler through the rough places of the earth realizes how weak he has gradually become from hardships and lack of real nourishment. The invigorating air of the temperate zone and the meat of Cotervo's fonda, however, had soon given me new energy, and seemed to have reduced to half the weight of my load. Hope, brutally felled to earth, ever crawls dizzily to its feet again. I could no more rid myself of the fond dream of some day ceasing to stagger under my own baggage than a leper can shake off his affliction. Yet the solemn promise of the ruler of Cotervo to furnish me a carrier resulted only in a lost day, and I struck off across the rolling mountain and valleys beyond, convinced at last, so I fancied, that I should dream no longer. So persistent had been the promise of foul play on this day's route that despite a lifetime of disappointments, I could not but peer hopefully into the many splendid lurking places of the wild rock-strewn upland I followed in utter solitude all the gorgeous day from Cotervo to Chota, the next provincial capital. Only once did I catch sight of a fellow being. A group of arreros with laden asses paused dubiously near the top of the range where they caught the first glimpse of me, then ventured forward 
and halting, asked anxiously, Are the robbers not attacking this morning? My answer they greeted with a fervent Ave Maria Purisma, and crossing themselves ostentatiously, that the saints should not by any chance overlook their devotion, pushed hurriedly on toward Cuterbo. Early in the afternoon I came out on the upper edge of an enormous widespread valley, just across which, in the lap of a rolling plain sloping toward me, and the hair-like winding river at its bottom, lay the end of the day's journey, Chota, a tiny dull red patch in a green-brown immensity of sun-flooded world, the two towers of its not too conspicuous church pin-pricking the horizon. In the transparent air of the highlands it seemed, at most, a short two hours away. In reality, I had not in that time picked my stony way to the bottom of the rock-scarred valley, and it was long after night had cast its black poncho over all the world that I stumbled at last into the elusive town. Chota, 8,000 feet, 4,000 inhabitants, 3,000 doors, and no windows, nearly as cold as Quito, is a provincial capital with well-cobbled streets and a broad expanse of plaza, all tilting to the north, by far the largest Peruvian city I had yet seen, almost the equal in size of Loja in Ecuador. The stock of its many little shops comes in by way of Pacasmayo and the railroad to Chilete, showing that I was over the divide and approaching Cajamarca. On August 30th, 1882, it was destroyed by the Chileans, Los Malditos Chilenos, as the inhabitants still call them. But Andean building material being plentiful, it soon rose up from its mud ruins. The cura was even then superintending the cholos, tramping together with their bare feet the clay and chopped ichu grass that was to be a new church. There were numerous fondas as befitted a great capital, that is, mud dens, with a reedy shanty in the barnyard behind serving as a kitchen, kept by well-meaning but unprepossessing females who wiped the inside of each plate religiously on their ample hips, those same draft horse hips on which they squatted on the earth floor to fill the receptacles similarly placed while driving off with the free hand the curs and guinea pigs and the chickens perching on the edge of the kettles. There were even oil lamps in a few of the more pretentious shops and mansions, although almost all without chimneys, not easily imported from the other side of the world by ship and mule back over breakneck trails. Haughty belligerent roosters stood tied by a leg before half the doors in town, so that each street was a long vista of pugnacious cocks frequently submitting to the anxious ministrations of their proud owners. Even without them I should not have slept unbrokenly. Official assistance had gained me lodging on the homemade counter of an empty shop hung with cobwebs and perfumed with the mustiness of several generations, the door of which Flush with the narrow sidewalk, of course, was the only source of air. There, as often as a night hawk passed on his way home from the local Villar, he paused to beat me awake with the rapping of his cane and to sing song in that dulcet voice of the Latin American, mellow with late hours, Your door is open, senor. I will close it for you. And if, instead of reaching under the counter for my revolver or a convenient adobe brick, I did not summon a patient courtesy, I do not possess an answer, Mil gracias, senor. No, thank you. Leave it open, please. And then rise up and open it again because he fancied his ears had deceived him, I should have lost the rating of simpatico and been branded a rude and discourteous gringo. Bamba Marca, an atrociously stony half-day beyond Chota and its surrounding bowl, like a mosaic of little farms where female shepherds bare their weather-brown knees 
incessantly turned the white, brown, and black fleece of their flocks into yarn on their crude, incaic spindles, reported the trail ahead the worst in Peru, which is indeed strong language. They were certain, too, that though I might, with the accent on the verb, have arrived from La Provincia alive, the marauders beyond would see to it that I did not reach Cajamarca in that condition. A cold rain fell incessantly from sullen skies during a day of unbroken plodding, first up the canyon of a small river, crossed now and then by thatched bridges, until it dwindled away and left me to splash at random over a reeking mountain top. I had been lost for hours and was dripping water at every pore when I spied toward what would have been sunset four little Indian boys huddled under the ruin of a hut and signed to them to give me information. Instead, they took to their heels as if all the evil spirits of the Inca religion had suddenly crested the water-soaked range. I set after them, but my best pace under my load being barely equal to theirs, I drew my revolver and fired twice into the air, whereupon they halted and awaited me in ashen fear. The one I chose as a guide led me over a rolling paramo, deeply gashed by rain-swollen streams, and abandoned me within sight of the imposing estate house of what turned out to be the Hacienda Yanacancha. In the corridor, just out of reach of the drenching rain, stood a white man in khaki, monarch of half the visible world, and so little like the uncouth illiterate I expected that he replied in faultless Castilian to my remark about the absence of roads, Yes, unfortunately South America fell to the Spaniards, whereas it should have been settled by Anglo-Saxons. Here, for the first time in Peru, was a hacendado which had trained his dogs and servants to some understanding of their respective spheres, and had even given the latter an inkling of that thin gray line between cleanliness and its opposite. A trivial incident will demonstrate to what lowly point of view my recent experiences had brought me. When my host showed me into a large guest room, I caught sight in the semi-obscurity of a reed mat on the floor, and through me flashed a thrill of joy that I should have this to sleep on instead of the cold, dank tiles, whereas on closer view this proved to be the foot mat before a huge colonial bedstead, regally furnished with soft mattresses and spotless woolen blankets. My host even apologized for the absence of sheets, as if I should have recognized that forgotten flora even in its native habitat. Yet my misgivings of playing the role of Hugo's maltreated hero materialized. Whether it was due to the fever within me struggling for existence or to the all-too-sudden return to luxury, I tossed sleeplessly well into the night, and it was rolled up on the mat on the floor that the cold, steel-gray dawn creeping in at the wood-barred windows found me. The road across soggy highland meadows and past those fantastic heaped-up peaks and splintered ranges of black rocks that give the hacienda yanacancha black rocks its name was largely imaginary at first within sprinting distance of the house were a few inhabited haycocks of shepherds like eskimo dwellings of weather blackened pajonal in place of snow and ice with a hole to crawl in on all fours then the visible world, straining ever higher, spread out into a rolling mountain top, a totally uninhabited region, where was heard only the mournful sighing of the wind across a boundless rolling yellow-brown sea of the dreary bunch grass of the upper Andes. Across it, the often invisible way undulated with such regularity that I was continually descending into or climbing out of hollows trodden to a mud pudding about the cold streams that wandered down from the scarcely more lofty heights. There were myriad hiding-places behind the jagged ray rocks piled erratically along the way 
from which evildoers might have picked me off. So notorious is this region for its mishaps to travelers that natives rarely cross it except in large groups. But the wholesome respect in which a gringo, especially one who carries a shooting iron prominently displayed, is held the best protection in Latin America, far more so than an escort of native soldiers, the presence of which is apt to imply to the lurking bandit an admission of inability to depend on one's gringo self. Even if the soldiers do not prove confederates of the outlaws, or run away at the sight of them. On and ever on the cold, desolate, inhospitable desplavado rose and fell in broad swells or billows, the barren, yellow, uninhabited world sighing mournfully to itself. This long day is obligatory on all who come to Cajamarca from the north, for there is no halting place in all the expanse of Puna south of Yanacancha. I should have covered the thirty-five miles before the day was done, had not a long, dormant, or newly acquired fever suddenly broken out mid-afternoon. Every setting of one leg before the other was as great an effort as jumping over a ferry boat, yet I must prod myself pitilessly on, for to be overtaken by night on this inhospitable wind-swept puna would have been worse than fever. With infinite struggle I came at last to where this broadest of paramos began to fall away toward the north. Then the slope contracted to a gully that gathered together the score or more separate but not distinct paths that make up the highway across the lofty plain, and brought me before sunset to the first of a scattered cluster of stone and mud kennels. A leather-faced old Indian, speaking the first Quechua I had heard since Cuenca, gave me a handful of ichugras to sit on outside the smaller of his two huts, and left me to the company of his prowling yellow curs. Night had fallen completely before a woman brought me a gourd of boiling potato mash, but at length the cherry old Indian, overcoming his racial indifference and distrust, opened the door of the hut against which I lay, and let me in a sort of inchaic warehouse. In it were heaps of the huge balls of yarn spun by the Indian women on their prehistoric spindles, a supply of paramo grass I might spread on the floor, and several large bolts of homespun cloth of coarse texture and cruder colors with which I might feather my arctic nest. Once it was late enough to hope the owner would not catch me at it. In the adjoining family hut a baby had been crying incessantly for an hour or more. The after chill of the fever was settling upon me when a young Indian entered, bearing the infant and a handful of twisted grass as a torch. Without preliminary, he requested me, if I understood his language, to spit in the child's face. I don't get you, I replied, in my most colloquial, if imperfect, Quechua. Do me the favor to spit in his face, he repeated, and by way of illustration spat swiftly and lightly, with the point of his tongue between his lips, a fine spray in the face of the squalling infant. But why not do it yourself, I protested. Anam Viracocha, it must be someone, the Wahuita, does not know. When it had become evident that there was no other way of being left in peace, I rose and sprayed the infant. To my astonishment, it ceased its wailing instantly, staring wide-eyed into my face until the father turned away and was not again heard during the night. Floor-walking Benedicts may adopt this bit of domestic science from the ancient civilization of the Incas, free of charge, there were but nine miles left to do in the morning, but the mere numerals give little hint of the real task. Both road and bridges continued strikingly conspicuous by their absence. For hours the atrocious trails zigzagged unevenly, at times almost perpendicularly, down what was left of the mountainside. Then it forded waist-deep 
the Cajamarca River, and joining a Sunday morning procession of market-bound Indians with a clashing of colors almost equal to those of Quito, picked its way around stony foothills along a slowly widening valley gradually checkered with the varying greens of cultivation. The cool summer air and a more passable road drew me ever more swiftly on. The sound of church bells, musically distant, floated northward on the breeze, located vaguely somewhere among the eucalyptus trees ahead, the end of the third stage of my Andean journey. Huts turned to houses, thicker and thicker along the way, until they grew together in two unbroken rows. The air grew heavy with the scent of the Australian gum. I passed under an aged, whitewashed arch straddling the street, and on April 27th, at the hour of the return from Mass, found myself creaking along the canted flagstone walks of famous old Cajamarca, the first real city, even in the South American sense, I had come upon in Peru. Armed and bedraggled with an alforja hanging heavily over one shoulder, I presented no conventional sight. Yet the Cajamarquinos gave me comparatively slight attention. No doubt they were accustomed to such apparitions. Pizarro and his fellow roughnecks could have been little less wayworn and weather-bleached when they rode in upon Cajamarca over these same hills. According to careful calculation, I had walked 1,773 miles from Bogota, 929 from Quito. Of the 79 days from the Ecuadorian capital, I had spent 30 in the towns and hamlets along the way, and the remainder in whole or part on the road. As far back as Ayavaca, I had begun to hear phrases of magnificent hotels of Cajamarca. The disappointment was proportionately bitter. The Hotel Internacional was a defunct lodging house. The Hotel Amazones, further on, merely a row of rooms opening on the second-story balcony. They were tolerable rooms with flagstone floors and wood bed springs, and had the extraordinary advantage of being in the second story out of reach of staring passers-by, but they were furnished only with the bare necessities and were covered everywhere with a half-inch, more or less, of dust. This was hardly to be wondered at. Pizarro and his band of tramps must have raised a deuce of a dust when they perpetuated the conquest of Peru and took Atahualpa into their tender keeping in the great plaza a short block away on that Saturday evening three hundred and eighty-one years before. Strangest of all, the hotel rates were posted in plain sight, where even foreigners might see, forty cents a night, or thirty if the room was occupied a month or more. Evidently, another fussy gringo had been here before me, for the printed rules contained the following by law. The senor passenger who shall desire to use two mattresses on the same bed will subject himself to the payment of ten cents above the ordinary pension. The original motive could not have been haze, for the notice was yellow with time, and the manager chambermaid, though he gave me many details of the doings of my erstwhile companion, as he gradually got my indispensable requirements together with great care not to remove the historic dust anywhere, did not mention any such gringo idiosyncrasy. Every non-resident of Cajamarca, be he a tawny, soil-encrusted Indian from up in the hills, or the representative of some ambitious European house, eats in one of two Chinese fondas, or take-your-chance restaurants, not far off the main plaza. The transient enters a celestial general store, passes through it and a dingy room, crowded with tables about which barefoot Indians, male and female, their aged felt hats on their heads, are helping themselves with spoons or fingers, and through another doorless door into a smaller chamber with a single long table 
covered by an oilcloth of long and troubled history, where he is sure to find a place because of the requirements of shoes. During the process he will pass close by the open kitchen with its iron cooking range, the first I had seen in South America, manipulated by a grizzled old Chinaman. The service is a la carte, but for the shoes and oilcloth identical in both dining rooms. Here one will find a greasy strip of paper with a printed menu, easily comprehensible to anyone with a Spanish and Quechua dictionary, a treatise on Peruvian coast slang and some smacking of Chinese in Spanish misspelling, or which, in the very likely event of the client being unable to read, the barefoot waiter will recite in Shakespearean cadence and breathless continuity. Indeed, but for the language, one might fancy oneself back on the lower bowery as the waiter bawls to the kitchen, Un churrasco! Un biste! Fogoso! Hasta cuantos esos choclos! The high cost of living, like the railroad decreed by Congress in 1864, had not yet climbed over the range into Cajamarca. The dishes are two and a half or five cents each. There are, to be sure, a few ten-cent ones. But these are what terrapin would be with us, and their consumption is not encouraged, being above the tone of Cajamarca. The first price covers a dozen delicacies such as patitas con arroz, pig's feetlets with rice, fried brains, liver or chupe, the Irish stew of the Andes. At five cents, the epicure, to whom money is no object, may have a breaded piste with onions, rice, and potatoes, a beef's de pie, roast beef de cordero, roast beef of mutton, a beefsteak of pork, and a score of even more endurable concoctions. Chocolate, which is native to the region and excellently made, is two and a half cents. A cup of coffee, which no one in Cajamarca knows how to make, costs twice that. Eggs, in any style, are two cents each. And a loaf of bread, of the size of a biscuit, one cent. For in Cajamarca, the traveler first finds the huge copper one-cent and half-cent pieces. The greatest gourmand sailing the high seas could not spend more than fifteen or possibly twenty cents for a dinner in Cajamarca, and a tip is unknown. I had been duly warned that the table manners would be on a par with those of Colombia and Ecuador. Before I left Quito, Hayes had written, In Peru, soup is eaten with brilliancy, the high notes being sustained with great verve. The same table utensils reached both the shod minority and the Indians under their hats. The table de luxe was supplied, after that democratic South American manner, with one drinking glass, the only washing of which was what it inadvertently received during its varied service. Cajamarca, as everyone whose historical education was not criminally neglected knows, was not founded, it was found, and like anything else picked up by the Spaniards of those days, was never returned. It lay already, but unprepared, spread out in the extreme northwest corner of its long fertile valley, where Pizarro and his merry men came riding down upon it across the same broad paramo, and they caught much the same view of it as I, though in those days it was not half hidden by the adorning eucalyptus trees of today, nor distantly musical with church bells. The famous town, now capital of a department, which is to Peru what a state is with us, is more or less oval in shape, some ten by twenty blocks at its widest and longest, not counting the huts that straggle out both ends along its principal highway and dot the outskirts and widening plain. It is seven degrees below the equator and somewhat warmer than Quito. It stands 2,814 meters above the sea 
with some half dozen inhabitants for every meter. In all but its history, it is tiresomely like any other city of the Andes. The streets, monotonously right-angled, are rudely cobbled with open sewers down the center, the sidewalks narrow, smooth-worn flagstones on which he who walks must jostle Indians, donkeys, and stagnant groups of less useful residents. The adobe houses, often two-story and always towing the street line, are red tile roofed and anciently whitewashed. Dingy little shops of odds and ends below, the flower-decked patios of even the best provided families are surrounded on the ground floor by the dens of servants and the ragged and more numerous population, as in Quito. It was the first place in Peru where I had seen window glass. By night its streets are lighted with faroles, miniature kerosene lamps inside square, glass-sided lanterns that are given to succumbing to the first strong puff of breeze, even if those whose duty it is to light them do not have more pressing engagements. The central plaza is enormous, square in form, but coinciding more or less with the triangular one in which Pissarro and the Inca collided on that dusty Saturday evening of an earlier century. Flower pots, tended with less monotonous formality than those of Quito, bloom chiefly with geraniums. And among them, the historically informed inhabitants point out the stone on which Atahualpa succumbed to the garrote amid the heaven-opening ministrations of good old Father Greenvale. As in Quito, there remain almost no monuments of pre-Columbian days, for the Incas seem to have built here chiefly of adobe. The most intelligent of Cajamarca's monks doubted whether there was even a temple of the sun or a house of the virgins to transform into a monastery or convent. Not far off the main plaza, however, set cornerwise in the center of a modern block, is the room that was to be filled with gold for Adhualpa's ransom, said to be of massive dressed stone, like the palaces of Cusco. Stevenson, who was in Cajamarca just a hundred years before me, found still visible around the walls the mark that was to measure the height of the treasure, and the room the residence of a cake. Today it is an orphanage where a German nun was teaching a score of female orphans to earn a livelihood on American sewing machines, and the treasure mark, as well as all evidence of stone structure, had been whitewashed out of existence as something of lost hintiles not worth preserving. The unique characteristics of Cajamarca, and almost her only stone buildings, are her half-dozen splendid old churches, soft-browned by time as those of Salamanca, and having the appearances of being half-ruined by earthquakes. The natives asserted, however, that they were left incomplete because in colonial days every finished building must pay tribute to the king of Spain. Whatever the cause, their condition gives an unusual architectural effect that could not have been equaled by any design of man, and all who find pleasure in the picturesque must hope that the Cajamarcans will never grow wealthy enough to finish them, a misfortune that is not imminent. The Chileans came in August 1882, and taking a note from Pissarro's notebook, or, more exactly, from that of his secretary, since the swine herder of Estremadura was not fitted to keep his own, stole all the gold and jewels of the churches, even the laboratory equipment of the schools, and anything else that chanced to be lying around, though they found no one worth holding for ransom. One of the principal churches bears an inscription, now all but effaced by the ubiquitous whitewash, announcing that this Santa Iglesia was erected at a cost of one million pesos and fifteen centavos the extra seven cents being the cost of bell ropes. In the great monastery of San Francisco, facing the main plaza, some forty amiable but ignorant friars loll through life, chiefly in the breezing retiring kiosks, 
carpeted like that of Quito with burnt matches and cigarette butts. They knew nothing of the tomb of Atahualpa, but the Spanish organist, who looked like a ninth-inning baseball fan on a hot day, led me to the church and played in my honor on the largest and best pipe organ in Peru. Not only our national air, but several Spanish fandangos and a recent Broadway favorite that is seldom admitted to ecclesiastical circles. The Indians and gente del pueblo of Cajamarca have nearly as much color of dress as those of Quito, and are even more ragged and abjectly poverty-ridden. Filthy maimed beggars adorn the facades of churches, and the aboriginals speak a mushy mouthful, dialect of Quichua, though all no Spanish. None of the Chinese residents have families, yet now and then one passes a child with quaintly shaped eyes that testify to the ingratiating manners of the celestials. The upper classes struggled to keep the theoretical white collars and dandified shoes that mark their caste, and dawdled through life as shopkeepers, lawyers without clients, doctors whose degrees furnish them little but title, or any makeshift occupation that will spare them from soiling their tapering fingers with vulgar labor. Opportunity is a rare visitor, yet in a century, perhaps, there has not been born in Cajamarca a boy with the initiative and energy to tramp three days over the western range and stow away for somewhere that he could make a man of himself. As to personal habits, a drug clerk graduated in Lima pours out of their bottles the pills he recommends and plays them idly back and forth from one unwashed hand to the other before returning them to the shelf. Yet it was a relief to loll away several days in civilization, even Peruvianly speaking. If the passing stranger was not entirely free from the open mouth and vacant eye, he could pass a corner group without all falling silent and craning their necks after him, and might even sit down at the fonda table without all interrupting their noisy eating to mumble over their mouthful. Where do you come from, and where are you going? But even a Peruvian department capital has not yet reached that stage which makes photography easy, or the coarsest sarcasm effective. As often as I opened my Kodak, some educated member of society was sure to crowd close to me, keeping persistently in front of the lens. And when I had at length maneuvered and tricked him, out of the view, more or less, I was seeking, he was certain to bleat with his blandest smile. Sacando una plancha, no, senor? If I made answer, no, my esteemed friend of ancient and noble blood, I am building an aeroplane on ski runners to cross the icy stretches of the Amazon. The half-baked sun of the wilderness might reflect solemnly for a moment or two before making some such inane reply as, Yes, it is a long way to the Amazon. Almost at the hour of my arrival, an enamored youth of Cajamarca committed suicide, leaving a letter in which he declared life was a farce. Had he been with me through the province of Hain, he would have found it more nearly a melodrama. Only those who have endured the hardships of a long trail can know the uncompensating pleasure of a return to even comparative comfort, like the burgeoning of a spring after a hard winter. But after all, the joys of the trail in the Andes are chiefly those of anticipation, and the sense of accomplishment, of exclusiveness in tramping where few men have tramped before. For there can be slight pleasure of intercourse in towns where the youths of the best families follow the foreigner with cries of, Good night! All right! broken by snickers of silly laughter, and where dreams of long hours in something resembling a bed are rudely dispelled by the din of church bells, the whistles of lonesome policemen, and all the thousand and one noises with which the Latin American can make life hideous. In the matter of libraries and bookshops, Peru is even less advanced 
than the countries to the north. There was, to be sure, a department library in Cajamarca, but for the present it was closed. In despair I canvassed the town for a book. A clerk, whom I asked why no printed matter was to be had, replied, No hay aficionados a la lectura en este parte, señor. Amateurs of reading, indeed, as one might say, aficionados of billiards, fans of cockfighting, merely an amusing game to pass the time. But what on earth do people do with their minds, I gasped. They go to church, senor, replied the clerk. But the best of Cajamarca is her wonderful green and checkered valley, as seen from the rocky hillock ten minutes above the main plaza, now serving as a quarry of soft whitish stone, but on which, if anywhere, must have been the fortress historians tell us overlooked the Inca city. There is, indeed, today the remnants of a cobblestone and adobe building on the summit, and Cajamarquinos, who climbed there to enjoy the widespread view, asserted that Atahualpa used to watch from this height the rising and setting of the sun. Prescott might almost have sat on the rocky hillock in person when he wrote, The valley of Cajamarca, enameled with all the beauties of cultivation, lay unrolled like a rich and variegated carpet of verdure, in strong contrast with the dark forms of the Andes that rose up everywhere about it. The veil is of oval shape, extending about five leagues in length by three in breadth, and was inhabited by a superior population to any the Spaniards had yet seen, with ten thousand houses of clay hardened in the sun and some ambitious dwellings of hewn stone. The valley stretching away south-southeast is not so extensive as the reading of Prescott lends the imagination to picture, except in one place where it spreads out like the arms of a cross, it is surely not more than a league in width. But the suave spring view across it, green with the deep green of the cactus, and clumped now by Australian eucalyptus in contrast to the treeless days of the Incas, is in certain moods and aspects the most beautiful of the Andes, though lacking the surrounding snowclads that add so much to the Vale of Quito. Here I came often to sit above the murmur of the towns, until the god of the Incas, after his daily journey around the earth, to see that all was well, sank behind the broad paramo of Yanacancha, blotting out the valley stretching away to the southward, where the trail following the old Inca highway down the backbone of the continent was already beckoning me on. End of chapter 10, part 2, recorded by Elliot Swanson. Chapter 11 of Vagabonding Down the Andes by Harry A. Franck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Drawbacks of the Trail, Part 1. Tramping down the Andes is like walking on the ridge of a steep roof. There is a constant tendency to slip off on one side or the other and slide down to the Pacific or the Amazon. The Latin American is only too prone to follow the line of least resistance, and that line is not along the crest of the Andes where the more manly Incas traveled. The villager, obliged to journey to another town of the Sierra a hundred miles north or south, will ride muleback something more than that to the nearest port, take ship to another harbor, and ride another hundred miles up into the interior to his destination. Hence, the excellent highway that might have been built down all the backbone of the continent, or at least the Inca one that might have been kept up, does not exist. Each community is confined to its own valley, and cut off from the rest by almost untrodden mountain ranges, or by trackless bare ridges where only sheep and their hardy shepherds can live. Under the beneficent rule of the Incas, 
means of intercommunication were infinitely better than today. Then, roads and bridges were kept in constant repair, and in all exposed parts, at intervals along the cold punas and among the mountain gorges, were government tambos with shelter and food for both men and llamas. To journey from Cajamarca to Lima would have been easy. I had only to hire a mule to Pacasmayo and catch a passing steamer. But to reach there by the route I had proposed to myself was another matter. Even Raimondi's famous map of Peru, in twenty-five folios, over which I spent a morning in the prefect's parlor, offered scanty information, a few faint lines representing trails leading almost anywhere except where I would go. The only route at all suited to my purpose seemed to be one through Huamachuco and Juraraz and along the valley of the Santa River. Near the source of this, it looked as if I must turn back almost due north and climb over the uninhabited snow-clad Cordillera Central, whence it might be possible to reach Cerro de Pasco. Local information was not even equal to the assertion of Prescott, who had never been nearer South America than the southern coast of Massachusetts, that the messengers of Pizarro from Cachamalca to Cusco followed the elevated regions of the Cordillera through many populous towns, of which the chief were Guamachuco, Guanuco, and Xauxa. At best, I had to leave the scene of Atahualpa's undoing with little knowledge of where I was going, except southward. Certain preparations were essential before I plunged again into the all but unknown. The trip from Loja, the longest sustained hardship I had ever undergone, had left me a sadly depleted wardrobe. Especially were my walking boots in the last stages. The shops of Cajamarca had no heavy ones among their stock, but I had hoped, with the assistance of the prefect, to buy a pair of the shoes manufactured for the use of the garrison police. The department chief, however, put off wiring the president, or laying the matter before Congress until it was too late. A friendly shoemaker advised me to apply privately to a soldier or policeman, but they have only one pair each, I protested. True, replied the zapatero, pero se roban entre ellos. They steal from each other. This hint also had been too long delayed, and I was forced to trust to native patching to carry me over the indefinite region to the next source of supply. As to socks, I had found that the best for tramping the Andes were none at all, that is, a better substitute were the Fusslappen of the German soldier, a square of cotton flannel on which to set the foot diagonally, fold over the three corners, and thrust it into the boot. The small silver pieces that came to me each time I threw down a sovereign on the Chinaman's counter, I had laid away for the road ahead, spending the heavy coppers and the cartwheel soles. This petty point is extremely important in the Andes, for even the man able and willing to toss out gold for every banana he buys often finds villages of the Sierra where the yellow metal will not be accepted, and those who might otherwise be willing to change a large coin are frequently afraid to show that they have so much money on hand. The rucksack style of carrying had proved burdensome, for the load that remained, I made a leather harness, not unlike suspenders, with half my possessions balanced against the rest. Then, having squandered twenty-one cents in the greatest banquet known to the Chinaman's back room, I climbed the fortress hill to watch for the last time the interwoven colors of the setting sun across the rich vale of Cajamarca. It was the 7th of May when I struck southward again along the valley floor. A wide highway sidestepped out of the city, but barely had the scent of this been left behind than a shallow river took possession of the entire width of the road. There is a sort of lawlessness both of man and nature in the Andes, and many is the hacendado who thus 
calmly makes use of the public highway as his irrigation ditch. When Hernando de Soto was sent with fifteen horse to visit the Inca at his baths a few miles south of the city, they followed a fine causeway across the plain and came to a small stream with a bridge, but, distrusting its strength, dashed through the water. An hour from town, I too was dashing through the water, boots in hand, not because I distrusted the bridge, but because there was not the vestige of a bridge left to distrust. Beyond the stream were the famous Baños del Inca, now owned by the city of Cajamarca. In the barnyard of a stone and adobe hacienda, a chola woman sent an Indian boy to open for me an adjoining baked mud room, in the floor of which was a rough stone swimming pool, nearly ten feet square. Into this, steaming sulfurous water was pouring. But as a group of Indians were washing themselves and their rags in the source of supply outside, I was forced to relinquish the rare pleasure of a hot bath, even in so famous a setting. Historians report the existence of an ancient stone bathtub that was used by the Incas, but the woman was certain there had been none in the vicinity during her career as caretaker. The road she pointed out emerged from the back gate of the hacienda and mounted the steaming brook. Higher up, where I thrust a hand in it, the water was just hot enough to be bearable. The valley of Cajamarca, stretching far southward, had promised level going for a day or two. But though there was plenty of space for it on the valley floor, the Camino Real, true to its Andean environment, preferred to clamber up and down over stony, barren, broken ridges. Before noon, it had raised me to a paramo where several cold blue lakes swarmed with wild ducks that were not even gun-shy. An Indian I fell in with said they were never hunted because when they fall there is no way to enter the water and get them. Evidently, like his forebears of centuries ago, he had never heard of a strange invention called a boat. Two days of stony going, now between hedges of ripe tunas, now over high ridges, gashed and tumbled, by a trail thirsty despite the frequent fording of lukewarm streams gray with decomposed rock, brought me to San Marcos in a tropical and fruitful valley withered by a long drought. On the facade of the little dry goods shop and government salt store of the absent gobernador hung a huge sign beginning, Socorro Peones, implying that the owner was also a hooker of workmen for a German-owned sugar estate down on the coast. When I presented my order from the prefect of the department, the wife of San Marcos's chief authority ordered her cholas to prepare me dinner at once. I did not come to the gobernador that he should personally furnish me accommodations, I protested. I only want him to use his authority with those who make a business of lodging strangers. There is no such place in San Marcos, replied the woman, locking up shop and leading me into her parlor, musty with disuse, but all travelers are welcome here. Behind the divan to which she motioned me stood a life-size figure of the Virgin, flanked by another of Saint Somebody. In honor of the arrival of a stranger, perhaps, the matron soon reappeared with several serving women, and, stripping the Madre de Dios to her bamboo-structured nudity, reattired her in four gowns, each of which was far more costly than those worn by any of the living beings present. Then she set a newly polished crown on the head of the image, and, falling on her knees before it, began to rock back and forth, imploring her intercession in a monotonous sing-song. With dusk, appeared the gobernador, accompanied by two traveling salesmen, and, having ordered the three mules picketed, he spent a long evening bewailing with them the rising cost of commodities, of first necessity, even our very aguardiente and pisco, senores. 
in the act of looking over my papers, his eye was caught by a typewritten document in English. Ah, los Yankees, he cried. They are so up to date they even avoid the labor of writing by having their letters printed. But how can they afford it? Una máquina para escribir, I explained. A writing machine, he gasped. Is there such a thing? I must have one at once, for I never can spell things right. The village church having lost its roof, most of the old women in town gathered with my hostess in the adjoining parlor and droned for hours before her bamboo saints. For a long time the gobernador gave no heed to the uproar, though it forced him to raise his voice almost to a shout. Then suddenly he broke off an enumeration of prices with an angry Hagame el favor! In the Andes, the expression corresponds closely to our colloquial What do you know about that? Por Dios! Those beatas would pray a man insane! And dashing into the parlor, he broke up the meeting forthwith and sent the manto-wrapped women scurrying out through the zaguan like startled crows. For all her religious duties, my hostess found time to set down in my notebook the recipe of the most potent beverage that has come down from the Inca civilization, the chicha de jora, at the making of which that served with the evening meal proved her an adept. In a laborious schoolgirl hand, and with a wealth of misspelling that suggested that she too could have used a writing machine to advantage, she wrote, Take ripe shelled corn, cover with water, and leave a week or more until the kernels have sprouted. Dry in the sun two or three days. Crush to a mass. Boil and place, when cold, in jars three-fourths full, adding sugar sufficient to cause fermentation. Despite her piety and attitude of Moorish seclusion, she entered into the conversation with a frankness peculiar to the Latin race. Not the least startling of her naive questions was, How many children have you? I am not married, I answered. Of course you are not married, she replied, being a traveler all over Peru and the outside world, but have you really no children at all? At daybreak, the gobernador sent a boy and a horse to set me across, and all but spill me into a rock-strewn river below the town, because it is very dangerous to wet the feet in the morning. Ichocan, two leagues beyond San Marcos, sits high and cold on an eminence. Behind it, the trail sloped languidly upward, then pitched headlong down through a stony, desert-dry wilderness, inhabited only by cactus and wild asses, to the Condebamba River, its lower valley of densest green, a relieving contrast to the dreary, arid mountain flanks. Across the roaring gorge, a bridge of steel cables, supported by railway rails, has taken the place of the chaca of woven willow withes of Inca days. But it still looked frail and aerial enough, swaying high above the racing stream that would quickly have swept a stumbling traveler through rock-walled hills to the Marañón and the Amazon, and the few arrieros who follow this route have no easy task in driving their donkeys across it. A Poland mud hut on the dreary slope of the further bank housed the guardian of the bridge, a fever-laden skeleton who was barely able to crawl after an unbroken year of paludismo, the intermittent fever of the Andes that lurks in all such sunken valleys as that of the Conde Bamba. I might better have spent the night on the hillside beyond than to have tossed it through on the hut floor, swarming with some species of shark-jawed insect. Luckily, I was not offered the first bowl of chicha before I found the guardian's female companion concocting the family supply, for her method was little less disillusioning than that of the yuca-chewing Hivaros Indians. 
when it had been boiled in a huge kettle that spent its days of disuse as a nesting place for the family curs the liquid was poured off into a long shallow tub like a small dugout canoe the same one that would serve another purpose on wash day squatted on the ground beside it the woman was stirring it slowly with a stick she had caught up at random bit by bit two gaunt and mangy curs slunk nearer until their noses all but touched the steaming liquid whereupon the woman left off her stirring long enough to wrap them over the head with the ladle the dogs retreated a yard or two with cowardly yelps only to repeat the advance over and over again the chola's vigilance it turned out was not due to any unwanted sense of cleanliness she was merely bent on saving the animals from burning themselves as soon as she judged the liquid cool enough she gave a sign and the curs fell upon the tub and greedily lapped up the scum thus saved the labor of skimming it the female crawled to her feet and set the stuff away in earthen jars to ferment one barren stony ridge after another in pitiless succession carried me much higher before the following noonday my course now lay well east of south for i had caught the swing of the west coast of south america one last mighty surge and the world fell away before me disclosing almost within shouting distance the provincial capital of cajabamba but it is a good rule in the andes never to sit down in the plaza until you reach the town between me and the day's goal lay hidden one of those mighty holes in the earth that mean the undoing and repetition of all the toil that has gone before the shadows were beginning to climb the eastern wall of cajabamba's valley before i reached the century polished cobbles of the street that had swallowed up the converging trails the plump young sub-prefect who was awaiting me in state upon my return from the chinese fonda to which a soldier had piloted me would have been rosy-cheeked had not some careless ancestor faintly clouded his family tree and given a quaint kink to his hair he returned my papers with a regal bow and bade me make my home in his office as long as i chose to honor cajabamba with my presence the bed was a blanket on the yielding earth-covered floor but i had twenty soldiers at my beck and call and what mattered it if each time i would make my toilet i must go to jail luckily the rust-hinged doors and chain-weighted gates creaked with as pompous humility and dignified alacrity for my exit as to admit me though there were those within who had not passed them in twenty years by the time i was city dressed the sub-prefect pomaded and befrocked within an inch of his life fluttered into my boudoir to ask in breathless oratorical periods if inasmuch as he had just been married last week or during the night and mother down on the coast was dying to know what the new acquisition looked like and there were no photographers in cajabamba and it was a pity peru was so backward would i not have the fineza to take fifteen or twenty pictures of him and his novia and deliver a few dozen finished and mounted prints for him and her and their relatives and friends and compadres and associates within an hour or two as the carelessness of my american agent had left me almost filmless this was neither the first nor the last time i was put to the unpleasant necessity of faking a picture to have refused his request even with humble apologies and laborious explanations would have been to win the ill will of cajabamba's ruler and all his dependents had it not resulted in the trumping up of some transparent excuse to turn me out and refuse me official assistance in finding other lodgings a photographer speaking some spanish could pick up much silver down the crest of the andes it would have been a kindness if he had made the trip a few days ahead of me to be sure these official requests were always useful in a way 
while the powdered and perfumed authorities were puffing themselves up to the requisite pomposity the town was sure to gather alongside and as neither the fancied nor the real subjects were well enough versed in mechanics to know whether a kodak operates endwise or sidewise i caught many a nonchalant pose of some really worthwhile bystander that i might have begged for in vain on this occasion the novia having spent a few hours in completely disguising herself as women will under the circumstances the world over appeared at last deathly pale with rice powder and the pair assumed a score of fetching poses under my direction true it was dark by that time but the sub-prefect saw no reason why a photograph should not be taken by the light of three sputtering candles he preferred it indeed to embracing his newly won treasure in the public glare of day but the night had grown aged before he feigned to understand the impossibility of immediate delivery and he accepted only sulkily my promise to send the finished portraits back from the next city if they turned out well during my morning stroll about town i was accosted in english from the zaguan of a building of dilapidated adobe splendor so often had i heard a laborious good morning sir how do yo do from some silly youth whose knowledge of foreign tongues began and ended with that phrase that i nodded and passed on i have too much affection for my mother tongue to hear it gratuitously maltreated moreover it had lain so long idle that to speak it had come to seem an affectation this time however the speaker continued with faultless fluency i hear you are an american just so i am carlos traverso at your service graduate of an american university which one michigan indeed so am i valgame dios gasped the youth betrayed by astonishment into his native tongue for a moment can't you come around to my room your own house as i should say in peru you probably haven't seen the latest copy of the alumnus nor the twenty latest ones with the greatest of pleasure in spite of myself i found my tongue translating the set castilian phrases i had so long been using instead of falling into the colloquialisms of my own land when i was ensconced in an american armchair battered with the evidence of a long journey and of the crude unloading facilities of west coast ports surrounded by walls hidden under banners and photographs that seemed to turn the adobe chamber into a college dormitory transported to the wilds of the andes the youth went on the government of peru gives four betas that is sends yearly an honor student to each of four american universities with an allowance of a hundred dollars a month that is you had forty eight hundred dollars for the course at michigan yes with traveling expenses you probably had about the same allowance fortunately not or i should long since have been gracing some home for inebriates and is this just a present from the government no on our return we must serve the government for three years at the same salary i am superintendent of schools in this and the neighboring province of huamachuco the son of a scandinavian father traverso had evidently overcome the handicap of an allowance the spending of which would have consumed the entire energies of a full-blooded latin american and had brought back a real education his shelves were filled with the latest treatises on pedagogy in several languages and a brief acquaintance was enough to show that he was earnestly striving to instill some new life into the moribund system of his native land but what's the use he concluded gloomily casting aside a carefully worked out plan of study a man's wings are clipped before he can start to fly theoretically i have full authority over school matters in my two provinces 
practically i can't alter by a hair the benighted medieval routine of studies interwoven at every turn by the lives of the saints that peru has stumbled along under for centuries i can't hire a fifteen dollar a month numskull up in one of the mountain villages even though he doesn't know whether chile is in new york or in europe the priests have their wires attached to every government leg and arm in the country and i feel like a man lying by bound hand and foot watching our children being criminally assaulted the money the government spends on us might as well be chucked into the pacific to say nothing of squandering on one student what would easily suffice for three i put in caramba it is true in ann arbor life is calm and quiet but you ought to see what some of the betados who are sent to paris and rome bring back with them valgame dios the valley of cajabamba leans decidedly to the west whence the next day was largely one of mounting but the region is so high that climbing was not laborious in the invigorating mountain air that cuts into the lungs like strong wine and even a man inclined to that frailty could not have felt lonely with so much of the world spread out in plain sight about him there were few long spaces without houses or pack trains once i fell in with a government chusky driving a horse and an ass laden with sacks of mail among which stood out one marked conspicuously u s mail foreign the correspondence he assured me was not bound for the exterior but was merely local matter between towns of the route that had been farmed out to him a statement that was confirmed at the next post office a mighty crack in the earth into and out of which the trail zigzagged like some badly wounded creature marked my exit at last from the department of cajamarca into that of libertad the ancient inca highway is said to have followed this same route over these high undulating plains but there were no certain vestiges of it in the late afternoon i burst suddenly out upon a broad view of the famous old city of huamachuco much like quito in setting though more dreary backed by a ragged black range half cut off by a nearer slope that might have been pichincha itself the two peaks streaked with the first snow i had seen since leaving central ecuador traverso had given me a note of introduction to his compadre dr alva the medico titular of huamachuco as government doctor the only physician indeed within two hard days ride in any direction he drew theoretically at least a salary of one hundred fifty dollars a month exceeding even that of the haughty sub-prefect the son of a hamlet far up in the hills he was a plain earnest little man with a heart several times larger than the average of his fellow countrymen from his lips the stereotyped here you are in your own house had real meaning his library included spanish editions of taine nietzsche emerson and roosevelt his phonograph was of high grade and his records well chosen edison was his ideal of manhood indeed a straw vote in the andes would certainly show the wizard of orange the most popular american and he was wont to boast jokingly that his own name was the same as one of those of the inventor showing that some of our ancestors were the same toward the end of my stay i discovered that the doctor having installed me in his well-furnished guest-room was himself huddling out the cold nights on a bag of straw and a wooden table in the mud den behind his office it was not until we had grown rather well acquainted that dr alva confided to me the fact that he had worked his way through the medical school of lima even acting as waiter senor in a fonda and working in the summer like any peon but don't whisper a word of this to anyone in peru he implored as if he suddenly regretted having taken me into his confidence up in my country those of us who did that are inclined to boast of it i laughed 
Ah, si, senor, I know, he answered in an undertone, glancing cautiously about him. I know. Even Tomas Alva Edison was a newsboy. But if Huamachuco ever hears of it, I shall be a social outcast, ranked with the Indians of the marketplace. Huamachuco derives its name, if local authority is trustworthy, from the Quichua words Huama, snow, and Chuco, cap, the peak behind the town having in earlier centuries been completely snow-topped. It is the Guamachuco of Prescott, to which Hernando Pizarro was sent soon after the capture of Atahualpa to investigate the rumor that an army was being raised to rescue the imperial prisoner. Even today its population is largely Indian, among whom the chewing of coca leaves is general, the first place south of Almaguer in Colombia of which this could be said. But the Huamachuco of today does not exactly coincide with that of Pizarro's time. The effete descendants of a more hardy race have crawled down into a sheltering valley, leaving uninhabited the ancient city of the Gentiles on the mountain above. A local editor, apparently for no better reason than the pleasure of basking in a gringo smile, offered to serve me as guide. A stony road flanked ever higher along a perpendicular rock wall, then rose and fell over lofty undulations, and at some six miles from the modern town, brought us to the first ruins. Far below, across a deep quebrada, lay like a relief map the great rectangle of a ruined city, in perfect squares, the roofless stone gables standing forth in fantastic array above a forest of low trees. This was Viracochapampa, or Plain of the Nobles, the resident city at the time of the conquest. Through its broad central street passed the great Inca highway from Quito to Cusco, but that was the least important part of ancient Huamachuco. Here on the barren mountain top stood in olden times Marca Huamacucho, protecting the dwelling place on the stony plain below. Above the modern town are still to be found remnants of the cuchilla, or stone trough, by which the ancient race brought water to this lofty summit by some system that has been lost in the haze of time. About us, as we advanced, rose ruin after stone ruin of what had evidently been an elaborate series of fortresses. These spread mile upon mile across the rugged, undulating tableland, some densely interwoven with brambles and impenetrable thickets, all surrounded by the utter silence of a world long since abandoned by man and brute. Indeed, the place was less remarkable for its construction than for the vast extent of the ruins. Several large edifices, square or triangular in shape, were built of huge blocks of stone, still in the same form in which they might have been found as mountain boulders, and, unlike the fortress of Ingapirca, nowhere nicely fitted together. On the contrary, Nearly every joint was filled in with chips of stone, and in the thick interior walls had been used a sort of crude concrete, now mere gravelly mud that could be picked out with the fingers. Whether Marca Huamachuco was built by an earlier people, or by a more careless tribe of the race that left behind the cut stone palaces of Cusco, their method of construction did not make for durability. The ruins were all serrated and tooth-shaped, with only here and there a jagged point suggesting the original height, the whole cutting the far-off horizon with a fantastic broken skyline. An enormous wall had evidently once surrounded the entire peak, and beyond, set close together, was a series of almost round fortresses, each of three stone walls, one inside the other. One more carefully constructed edifice gave evidence of having been the chief palace, and from it stretched an unobstructed view of all the surrounding landscape, 
in which an advancing enemy might have been sighted league upon league away in any direction. It was in Huamachuco that the first hint of what later proved to be amoebic dysentery overtook me, recalling to memory the medicine case I had abandoned in Cuenca as a useless burden. A disturbing lack of energy settled upon me. My appetite failed, a startling symptom indeed, and I felt as if I had inadvertently swallowed one of the largest ruins of Marca Huamachuco. It was with no rousing pleasure, therefore, that I set off, laden with hard-boiled eggs and a supply of the stony local bread, on the lonely twelve-league tramp that intervenes between the residence of Dr. Alva and the next town. Four leagues south, the well-marked road swung to the right, and wading the shallow Huamachuco River, I struck off for Trujillo and comparative civilization on the coast. The faint path to the left bore me even higher across an uninhabited world, dreary with its endless expanse of dead yellow ichu. Here were distinct remnants of the old Inca highway. For several miles across the undulating paramo, the way lay between two rows of stones, set upright a considerable distance apart, and enclosing a space wide enough for six or seven carriages, had they existed, to pass abreast. If, as the inhabitants of the region assert, this is a good example of that great military highway of the Incas, the descriptions of chroniclers and historians have far outdone the reality. Gomara reports it twenty-five feet wide, cut in a straight line from the living rock, or made of stone and lime, turning aside neither for mountains nor lakes. Prescott speaks of highways carefully constructed of cut slabs of freestone and porphyry, which only proves how incompetent to judge things South American is the most competent man who has not been there in person. Those who have visited Spain know how easily the title Camino is granted, and the conquistadors, like the Peruvians of today, having in many cases probably never seen a real road, had no means of comparison. Certainly this Inca highway had nothing to justify the extravagant praise of those who compared it to the old Roman roads. The most that had been done in the way of road building was to clear the plain of loose rocks, in conspicuous contrast to the modern Peruvians who look upon a road as a convenient place to toss the stones picked up in their fields. Stone heaps here and there along the Andes mark forever the routes of travel of Inca days, but they are chiefly achapetas, piles thrown up by travelers, who tossed upon them, as votary offering, a cud of coca. Of the tambos, rest houses maintained at frequent intervals by the imperial government, like the dak bungalows of India, not even the ruins of one in a hundred remain standing, and the traveler of today is far more exposed to the elements than in the times of the Incas. The Andes rise ever higher from north to south and from west to east, whence I was far above Huamachuco when I dragged myself into the Vaqueria Angasmarca, a cluster of cobblestone hovels barely four feet high, home of an Indian cow guard in one of the most dreary stony settings in South America. Unable to get even hot water, I dared not eat the heavy fiambre I carried. I had huddled for hours on a stone under the projecting roof when, after dark, the vaquero himself rode in from Huamachuco. Having been a soldier, trained to a bit less immobility of temperament than his mate, he was partly cajoled, partly deceived into ordering her to serve me a gourdful of potato soup prepared under circumstances better imagined than described. For a long time, he replied with dogged, apathetic persistence that he only gave posado in the corredor, but I succeeded at last in inducing him to furnish me a ragged blanket in a corner of his own sty, 
on the earth floor of which huddled the entire family and the customary menagerie of small animals. The traveler who crawls out, blue with cold, after a night in one of these cobble caves of the highland Indian, to squat against the eastern wall until a gourd of warm water, savored with corn, and the dung fuel over which it is slowly half-heated is thrust out at him, no longer wonders that the aboriginals of the Andes worshipped the sun. Every step of that day of excruciating climbs and stony descents, across dreary paramos on which I several times lost my way, was a bitter struggle. For all the demands of the will, my legs could not push me forward two miles an hour and ever and anon they seemed to turn to straw and dropped me suddenly to the ground. All the visible world lay high and treeless now, with touches of snow on several black, shark-tooth peaks of the Cordillera to the eastward. During the day I had passed several more remnants of the old Inca highway, two continuous lines of weather-blackened upright stones set far apart on either side of a space a full half-block wide. Toward sunset, the trail began to descend into a stony river valley, far down which I made out a tiled building among eucalyptus trees. A passing horseman carelessly answered my question, while more engrossed in my appearance, by assuring me it was the hacienda house I was seeking and I toiled a half hour up the mountainside to it, only to have the solitary Indian female who occupied it point out far below in the valley of the river the patron's house of the Hacienda Angas Marca. It was the most imposing country dwelling I had yet seen in Peru, a large village and two churches clustered about it, the entrance like that to some rough old medieval palace the swarms of dependents carrying the mind back to feudal days. Around an immense flower and shrub-grown patio, in which Indian hostlers were struggling to unload a score of mules and horses, were some thirty rooms, each with a number above the door. I did not learn whether it was the custom of the owner to collect hotel charges, but the establishment was conducted in as heartless and impersonal a manner as if he did. He was a snarly old invalid who crawled about with a cane, growling orders to his cringing Indians, and too much taken up with his own infirmities to waste sympathy on others. With a grunt, he thrust my letter of introduction into a pocket, ordering an Indian to unlock one of the numbered rooms. Stagnant with the atmosphere of a cheap hotel, it contained a bed with leather springs, a billowy mattress, and a sack of ichu as pillow, and only after a long struggle did I obtain a bowl of soup filled with tough beef and half-cooked yucca and potatoes, a dish barely endurable to a strong man in full health. It was late next morning before infinite patience won me a bowl of hot milk, and I dragged myself away almost due north. Across the world south of Angasmarca yawned a bottomless valley, beyond which a rocky mountain wall rose to the very heavens. The road which should have followed in that direction was left to sneak out like some hunted thing for a vast detour, even before it began to crawl away eastward at right angles to the way I would have gone. At the outset was a laborious stony climb, from the summit of which the Hacienda Turpo lay in plain sight, but across one of those heartbreaking gashes in the earth so frequent in the Andes. On the left stood sharp, stark snow peaks of the Cordillera, which seemed to grow mightier with each day southward. Noon had long since passed, yet there were barely eight miles behind me when I entered the general store of an hacienda building forming a hollow square around a dreary barnyard. The shopkeeper announced himself the owner of the estate, 
plainly by poetic license. There is a careful graduation of caste in the Andes that makes it easy for the experienced traveler to set any man's place in the local society. This fellow's dress, color, his familiar yet commanding manner toward the Indians who sneaked in all that Saturday afternoon to dawdle about the counter and buy bits of trash, drafts of native rutgut, anything the place afforded except what might have been of some use to them, generally on credit, thus lengthening their slavery to the estate, all gave the lie to his assertion. But for all his posing, he turned out a kindly fellow. He not only sold me a half-dozen eggs, in itself a great kindness in the Andes, but dragged down from a shelf a sort of chafing dish and light-boiled them. When I had drunk these, surrounded by a solid wall of stony-faced Indians, who seemed to consider the feat remarkable, I still could not bestir myself to push on. By and by, my eyes wandering aimlessly over the stock that covered two walls to the ceiling, caught sight of a familiar ten-cent can of American tomatoes. I bought them at sixty cents. Long after an old woman had carried off the precious empty can, the shopkeeper spent all the leisure left him by the sluggish flow of now half-intoxicated Indians in thumbing over great sheaves of foreign bills of lading, and at length handed me thirty cents, with the announcement that he had inadvertently charged me for the whole shipment of two cans. When the dreary afternoon had at last dragged its leaden way into the past tense, and chill sunset was creeping across this lofty world, I mentioned to the shopkeeper that I needed a spot on which to spend the night. The idea evidently had never occurred to him. The estate was mine, and all the wonders thereof. But for all that, two more endless hours passed before a drink-saucy Indian led me to an icy harness room, and pointed out two bare saddle pads on the earth floor. End of Drawbacks of the Trail, Part 1 Recording by Linda Johnson, 